Chapter One of the Romance of Plant Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Eliot. Chapter One The Activity of Vegetables. Plants which move. Sensitive plant a tourist from Neptune, the world's and the British harvest, working of green leaves, power of sunshine, work done by an acre of plants, coltsfoot, dandelion, pansies in sunshine and in cold, wood sorrel and crocus, foxglove, leaves and light, adventures of a carbon atom, the sap, Cabbages and oaks requiring water, Traveler's tree, The water in trees, An oasis in Greece, The associate life of its trees and flowers. When we remember either the general appearance or the way in which a cabbage or a turnip appears to exist, it does not seem possible to call them active. It is difficult to imagine anything less lively than an ordinary vegetable. They seem to us the very model of dullness, stupidity, and slowness. They cannot move even from one field to the next. They are fast-rooted in the soil. They languidly adjust their vapid vegetable loves like Tennyson's oak. In fact, one usually speaks of vegetating when anybody is living a particularly dull, unexciting kind of life in one particular place. And it even seems as if the books which are supposed to give us the best information about the study of plants, and which are not very attractive little books, quite agree with the ordinary views of the subject. For one finds in them that plants differ from animals in being incapable of motion. This, of course, just means that an animal, or rather most animals, can walk, swim, or fly about whilst plants have roots and do not move from one spot to another. But it is not true to say that plants cannot move, for most plants grow, which means that they move, and in some few cases we find that plants behave very much in the same way as animals do when they are touched or excited in any way. We shall have to speak about tendrils, roots, and insect-catching plants later on, but it is perhaps the sensitive plant which shows most distinctly that it can shrink back or shrink together when it is bruised or roughly handled. It will be described in its place, but just to show that this plant can move of its own accord, it is only necessary to hold a lighted or burning match about an inch or so below the end of a long leaf. If one does this, then all the little leaflets begin to fold up, and finally the main stalk droops. Soon afterwards, other leaves higher up the stalk begin to be affected in the same way, and fall limply down one after the other. It is supposed that this movement frightens a grazing animal, who will imagine there is something uncanny about the plant and leave it alone. There are many respects in which this reaction of the sensitive plant resembles that found in animals. It does not take place if the plant is chloroformed or treated with ether. The leaves also get fatigued if too often handled and refuse to rise up again. There are, however, only a very few plants in which an immediate, visible answer to a stimulus can be detected. But all plants are at work. They have periods of rest which correspond to our sleep, but during their ordinary working hours, they never slacken off, but continue vigorously active. The life of man is so short that it is difficult to realize all that is being done by the world of plants. It is necessary to get beyond our human ideas of time. That is most conveniently done by considering how our plant world would strike an inhabitant of the planet Neptune. Our theoretical Neptunian would be accustomed to a year of 60,127 days, 164 of our years. We will suppose that 
three of our years are a Neptunian week, and that ten of our days are about three-quarters of a Neptunian hour, whilst two earth hours would be a minute to him. If such a being were to observe our earth, he would be astonished at the rapidity of our vegetable world. The buds would seem to him to swell visibly. In the course of an hour or two, the bare boughs of the trees would clothe themselves with the luxuriant greenery of midsummer. Hops would fly round and round their poles, climbing at the rate of a foot a minute. Bare places, such as the gravel heaps near a sand pit, or the bare railroad tracks at a siding, would be perhaps in one week entirely covered by rich grass and wild flowers. In six Neptunian months, a forest of graceful larches would spring up to a height of seventy or eighty feet. So that, if one thinks Neptunially, the activity of plants can be easily realized. The truth is that we are so familiar with common annual events, such as the regular harvest every year, that we never seem to realize what it means. There are some one trillion four hundred million human beings on the earth today, and they entirely depend on the work done every year by cultivated and wild plants. Even in one of the least agricultural of all civilized countries, such as Great Britain, the cultivation of plants is still the largest national industry. In 1897, we grew enough corn to give a ration of one pound per diem to every inhabitant for 68 days, and we managed to get a large amount from every acre, 28 to 33 bushels per acre. In most other countries, the relative importance of land and of agriculture generally is very much greater than it is in Britain. Moreover, it seems at first sight as if all this harvest had been made out of nothing at all. Plants do take in a small amount of mineral matter from the earth, but these minerals form but a very little part of the bulk of a tree or any vegetable substance. A piece of wood can be burnt up in a fire, and very little indeed of it is left. A few ashes will indeed remain, which are the minerals taken in from the earth, but all the rest has vanished into the atmosphere. The water which was contained in the wood has become steam and is evaporated. The woody matter consisted chiefly of compounds of a chemical substance, carbon, which also becomes an invisible gas, carbonic acid gas, in a fire and goes back into the atmosphere. When the piece of wood was formed in a growing tree, it is easy to see where the water came from. It was taken in by the roots. Just as flowers drink up the water in a vase and wither if they do not receive enough, so all plants suck up water by their roots. The carbonic acid gas is taken into plants through their leaves and is worked up into sugar, starch, wood, and other matters inside the plant. But there is another very interesting point about the way in which wood is burnt in a fire. Heat and light are obtained from a wood fire. Where did that heat and light come from? If you walk in summer under a tree in full leaf, it is much cooler than it is in the sunshine outside. This shows what happens. The sunshine has been taken up or absorbed by the leaves of the tree. It does not pass through the foliage, but the heat and light are stopped by the leaves. The light and heat which were used up by the leaves in making wood, sugar, and starch come back again when that wood or starch is burnt. So that the burning up of a bit of wood is just the opposite to the formation of that wood in sunshine in a living tree. The important point is that it is the sunshine which is used by plants to make all these refractory bodies, such as water, carbonic acid gas, and others, unite together to form sugar, starch, and wood. As the earth revolves upon its axis, sunlight falls successively on every acre of land. Almost everywhere it is intercepted by green foliage. Each leaf of every plant receives and absorbs as much as it can, and for so long as the light lasts, its living particles are hard at work. 
water or sap is hurrying up the stem and streaming out of the leaves as water vapor carbonic acid gas also is hurrying into the leaves inside these latter first sugar and then starch is being manufactured so that the green cells become filled with starch or sugar so soon as the light fails the work begins to slacken when darkness sets in the starch changes to sugar and passes down the leaf stalk into the stem where it is used up in growth in the formation of new wood or in supplying the developing flowers or young buds next morning when the sunlight touches the plant all its little living cells set to work again and another day's task is begun it is very difficult to understand what is going on inside the leaf if you were to imagine a square yard of leaves all taking in sunshine and making starch as they do in fine weather then if you weighed all these leaves and then weighed them again one hour after they had been in the sunshine of course that square yard of leaf surface should be heavier because a certain amount of starch has been formed in it the amount actually made in one hour has been estimated by dr horace brown as one five hundredth pound so that one hundred square yards of leaves working in sunshine for five hours might make one pound of starch but one can estimate the activity of plants in another way look at the amount of work done by the grass etc on an acre of pasture land in one year this might entirely support a cow and calf during the summer all the work done by these animals as well as all the work which can be done on the beef which they put on is due to the activity of the grasses on that acre moreover it is not only these large animals that are supported but every mouse every bird every insect and every worm which lives on that piece of ground derives all its energy from the activity of the plants thereon all work which we do with our brains or muscles involves the consumption of food which has been formed by plants under the warm rays of the sun so that man's thoughts and labor as well as that of every living creature is in the first instance rendered possible by sunshine but the sunlight besides this all-important function affects plants in other ways one of the most interesting of the early spring flowers is the colt's foot on bare blackish and unsightly heaps of shale one may see quantities of its golden blossoms now if one looks at them on a fine sunny day every single blossom will be widely open and each will turn towards the sun in wet cold weather every blossom will hang its head and be tightly closed up exactly the same may be observed with the dandelion which is indeed still more sensitive than the colt's foot in cold wet weather it is so tightly closed that it is barely possible to make out the yellow color of the flower but on warm sunny days it opens wide every one of its florets drinks in as much as possible of the genial sunshine both opening and closing are produced by the warmth and light of the sun's rays it is also the same with pansies on a fine day they spread out widely but in cold wet weather the heads hang over and the whole flower shrinks together perhaps the most interesting of them all are the little wood sorrel and the crocus both are exceedingly sensitive to sunlight or rather to the cold a mere cloud passing over the sun on a fine spring morning will close up the flowers of the crocus in cold weather if you bring one of its flowers indoors and put it near a bright light it will open widely sometimes in a few minutes what produces these changes it is very difficult to say but every change helps towards the general good of the plant in warm sunny weather insects are flying about and they can enter the flower if it is open these insects help in setting the seed as we shall see in another chapter 
In cold, wet weather, the flowers are best closed, as the rain might injure the florets, and because also no insects are abroad. Both the foxglove and the blue vetch, Visia craca, are specially ingenious in their way of obtaining light. For the stalk of every separate blossom bends so that its head turns to the best lighted or sunniest side. Thus, if you have foxgloves planted against a wall, every flower will turn away from it. If you plant them in a circular bed, every one turns to the outside so that every flower can get the sunlight. Everyone who has kept plants in a window knows that the stems turn towards the light. This has the effect of placing the leaves where they can get as much sunshine as possible. The leaves themselves are also affected by sunlight. They seem to stretch out in such a way that they absorb as much of it as they can. That, of course, is what they ought to do, for they want to obtain as much as possible of the sunlight to carry on the work of forming sugar and starch inside the leaf. Not only each leaf by itself endeavors to place itself in the best light position, but all the leaves on the same spray of, for instance, elm, lime, or horse chestnut, arrange themselves so that they interfere with one another as little as possible. Very little light is lost by escaping between the leaves, and very few of the leaves are overshaded by their neighbors on the same branch. Thus all cooperate in sunlight catching. But when a number of different plants are competing together to catch the light on one square yard of ground, their leaves try to overreach and get beyond their neighbors. On such a square yard of ground, it is just the competition amongst the plants that makes it certain that every gleam of light is used by one or other of them. Every one of all those plants of itself alters the slope of its leaves and turns its stems so as to get as much light as possible. This light, as we have seen, is taken in by the plant. It is used to make the gas, carbonic acid, unite with water. When these are made to join together, they form sugar. If the sugar is burnt, the heat and light appear again. By changing the amount and arrangement of the molecules in sugar, starch or vegetable fats and many other substances can be formed. But it is the sunlight that makes all this possible. Thus, the sun not merely supplies the motive power for all animal and vegetable activity, but by its influence, flowers, leaves and stems move and turn in such ways that they are in the most convenient position to intercept its light. The sunlight, though all important in the life of most plants, kills many kinds of bacteria and bacilli which love the darkness. The well-known radium rays are also destructive to bacteria and hinder the growth of certain fungi. Becquerel's rays have a similar effect. The X-rays are not so well understood but one can close the leaflets of the sensitive plant by means of them. Carbonic acid gas forms but a small proportion of the atmosphere which surrounds a growing plant. Yet there is no lack of it, for when the leaf is at work forming sugar, the particles of gas are rushing into the leaf, and other particles come from elsewhere to take their place. Every fire and every breath given off by an animal yields up carbonic acid, so that it is constantly in circulation. This is more easily seen by tracing the probable history of an atom of carbon. We will suppose that it enters a grass leaf as carbonic acid gas and becomes starch. Next evening it will become sugar and may pass from cell to cell up the stem to where the fruit or grain is ripening. It will be stored up as starch in the grain. This grass will become hay and in due course be eaten by a bullock. The starch is changed and may be stored up in the fat of the animal's body. When this is eaten at somebody's dinner, the fat will most probably be consumed or broken up. This breaking up may be compared to a fire, for heat is given off, and the heat in this case 
will keep up the body temperature of the person. The carbon atom will again become carbonic acid gas, for it will take part of the oxygen breathed in and be returned to the atmosphere as carbonic acid gas when the person is breathing. Another atom of carbon might enter the leaves of a tree. It will be sent down as sugar into the trunk, and perhaps stored up as vegetable fat for the winter. Next spring, the vegetable fat becomes starch and then sugar. As sugar, it will go to assist in forming woody material. It may remain as wood for a very long time, possibly 150 to 200 years. Then the tree falls, and its wood begins to decay. The bark begins to break and split, because beetles and wood lice and centipedes are burrowing between the bark and the wood. Soon, a very minute spore of a fungus will somehow be carried inside the bark, very likely sticking to the legs of a beetle. This will germinate and begin to give out dissolving ferments, which, with the aid of bacteria, attack the wood. Our carbon atom is probably absorbed into the fungus. Very soon, the mushroom-like heads of this fungus begin to swell and elongate. They burst through the bark and form a clump of reddish-yellow paddock stools. A fly comes to the fungus and lays an egg in it. This egg becomes a fat, unpleasant little maggot, which eats the fungus and, amongst others, devours our carbon atom, which again becomes fat in its body. Then a tomtit or other small bird comes along and eats the maggot. That bird stays out too late one evening and is eaten by an owl. The owl, satisfied with a good meal, allows itself to be surprised and shot by a keeper. When its body is nailed to a door and decays away, the carbon atom again takes up oxygen and becomes carbonic acid gas, which escapes into the atmosphere and is ready for a fresh series of adventures. We must now consider the water, which with carbonic acid gas makes up sugar, etc. All plants contain a large percentage of water. This may be as much as 95 to 98 percent in water plants and 50 to 70 percent in ordinary tissues. It is contained in every sort of vegetable substance. But there is also a stream of water or sap which is almost always entering the roots, rising up the stem and passing into the leaves. On these leaves there are hundreds of minute openings called stomata, by which the water escapes as water vapor into the atmosphere. A single oak leaf may have two million of these stomata. It is this current of sap which keeps the leaf fresh and vigorous. It is also by this current that every living cell is supplied with water and kept in a strong, healthy condition. The amount of water used in this way is very great. In four months, an acre of cabbages will transpire or give out, through its leaves, 3,500,000 pints of water and an acre of hops from five and a half to seven millions. A single oak tree, supposed to have 700,000 leaves, must apparently have given off into the atmosphere during five months 230,000 pounds of water. Sometimes the water is so abundant in the plant that it collects as drops on the tips of the leaves and falls off as fluid water. A very young greenhouse plant, Caladium nymphaefolium, was found by Molish to give off 190 water drops a minute, and in one night it exuded one seventeenth of a pint. The water is found stored up in the stems or leaves of plants, especially those of hot or dry climates. The Madagascar traveler's tree, Ravenala, has a considerable amount of water in a hollow at the base of its leaf, and it is possible to drink this water. The usual story is to the effect that a panting traveler finds this palm in the middle of the desert and saves his life by quenching his thirst with its crystal-clear water. 
Unfortunately, the tree never grows far from marshy ground or springs, and the water which I tasted for curiosity had an unpleasant vegetable taste, with reminiscences of bygone insect life. These are, of course, exceptional cases. As a rule, the tiny root hairs search and explore the soil. The sap or ascending current passes up the stem and pours out into the atmosphere. There the vapor is hurried off by winds, and eventually condenses, and, falling as snow or rain on the earth, again sinks down into the soil. It is very difficult to understand how the sap or water rises in the trunks of tall trees. We know that along the path of the sap inside, the root hairs and other cells in the root, the various cells in the stem, and finally those of the leaf, are all kept supplied and distended or swollen out with water. All these living cells seem to have the power of absorbing or sucking in water, and eventually they are so full and distended within that the internal pressure becomes almost incredible. Weiler found in the young wood of a Scotch fir that the pressure was 16 atmospheres, or 240 pounds to the square inch. Dixon, when experimenting with leaf cells, found 10, 20, or even 30 atmospheres, 150 to 450 pounds to the square inch. No locomotive engine has cylinders strong enough to resist such internal pressures as these. It is an extraordinary fact, and one almost incredible, that the cells can stand such pressures. Yet these minute living cells not only exist, but work at this high tension, and in some cases they live to about 50 years. In this favored country of Great Britain, it is unusual to find any serious lack of water, but in Italy or Greece, every drop of it is valuable and carefully husbanded. Sometimes, in such arid dry countries, a small spring of water will form around itself a refreshing oasis of greenery, surrounded everywhere by dreary thorn scrub or monotonous sand. All the plants in such a spot have their own special work to do. The graceful trees which shade the spring, the green mosses on the stones, the fresh grass and bright flowers or waving reeds are all associated in a common work. They protect and shelter each other. Their dead leaves are used to form soil. Their roots explore and break up the ground. It is true that they are competing with one another for water and for light, but they are all forming a mutual protection and producing an annual harvest. In a climate like our own, we cannot, like the Greek, suppose a nymph in the shape of a lovely young woman watching over the spring, for she would infallibly suffer from rheumatism and ague. But every living cell in every plant in such an oasis depends upon the water of the spring. All the plants there form an association which can be quite well compared to a city or some other association of human beings. They do compete, for they struggle to do the most work for the good of the community, and they incidentally obtain their livelihood in the process. Most plant societies or associations such as those which cover Great Britain are not so obviously dependent on one particular spring, but the plants composing them are associated in a very similar way. End of chapter 1 Recording by Linda Johnson Chapter 2 of The Romance of Plant Life this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Stays. The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Elliot. Chapter 2 On Savages, Doctors, and Plants. Savages New Botany. First Lady Doctors and Botanical Excursions. True Drugs and Horrible Ornaments Hydrophobia Cures Cloves Mustard Ivy Roses and Teeth How to Keep Hair On How to Know if a Patient Will Recover Curious Properties of a Mushroom The Scythian Lamb Quinine History and Use Safflower 
Romance of Ipecacuana, Wars of the Spice Trade, Cinnamon, Dogwood, and Indigo, Romance of Pepper, Babylonian and Egyptian Botanists, Chinese Discoveries, Theophrastus, Medieval Times, The First Illustrated Book, Numbers of Plants Known, Discoveries of Painters and Poets. If we look back to the time when all men and women were mere savages, living like the Eskimo or the Australians of today, then it is certain that every person was much interested in plants. Nothing was so interesting as daily food, because no one was ever certain of even one good meal in the day. So that in those early times there was a very sound, well-grounded knowledge of roots, bulbs, and fruits. They knew all that were good to eat, all that could possibly be eaten in times of famine and starvation, and also every poisonous and unwholesome plant. Some savage genius must have discovered that certain plants were good medicine, that certain tree barks helped to check fever, and that others were worth trying when people had successfully devoured more than they could comfortably digest. The life of a savage meant tremendous meals, followed by days of starvation. Even now, when young children are fed on rice in India, a thread is tied round their waist, and, when this bursts, they are not allowed to eat any more. Very probably, some of these early physicians were lady doctors, usually of a certain age. Men were too busy with their hunting and warfare to have time to try experiments with drugs, to make concoctions of herbs, all more or less disquieting, and to find out if these were of any use. So that such medicine men or witches gradually came to understand enough about poisons or fruit to make themselves respected and even feared. They would, no doubt, make botanical excursions in the forest, accompanied by their pupils, in order to point out the poisonous and useful drugs. It is worth noting, in passing, that this habit of botanical professors going on excursions with medical students has persisted down to our own times, probably without any break in the continuity. But it was soon found advisable to make this knowledge secret and difficult to get. They did not really know so very much, in a mysterious, solemn manner, and a quantity of horrible and unusual objects placed around the hut would perhaps prevent some irate and impatient savage patient from throwing a spear at his wizard or witch doctor. Footnote. This is still the custom in huts of the wizard or medicine men in West Africa, where one finds small cushions stuck over with all sorts of poisonous plants, bits of human bones, and other loathsome accessories. End footnote. Shakespeare alludes to this in Macbeth. Scale of dragon, tooth of wolf, which is mummy, maw and gulf of the raven salt sea shark, root of hemlock digged in the dark, gall of goat and slips of yew, and so on. Most of their cures were faith cures, and they were, no doubt, much more likely to be successful when the patient believed he was being treated with some dreadful stew of all sorts of wonderful and horrible materials. This explains how it was that the knowledge of medicine became so mixed up with pure charlatanism and swindling that no man could tell which drugs were of real use and which were mere ornaments giving piquancy and flavor to the prescription. It is not possible to say that a snake's head, the brain of a toad, the gall of a crocodile, and the whiskers of a tiger were all of them absolutely useless. Within the last few years, it has been found that an antidote to snake bite can be obtained from a decoction of part of the snake itself, and it has also been discovered that small quantities of virulent poisons are amongst our most valuable and powerful remedies. Whether the savages and the successors, the doctors of feudal times, even down to the 15th and 16th centuries suspected or believed that this was the case must remain a rather doubtful hypothesis. But there is no question that the hair of the dying that bit him, theory of medicine, was very prevalent. The following was a cure for hydrophobia of a more elaborate nature. I learned of a friend who had tried it effectual to cure the biting of a mad dog. Take the leaves and roots of cowslips, of the leaves of box and penny royal, of each a like quantity, shred them small to put them into hot broth, and let it be so taken, three days together, and apply the herbs to the bitten place with soap and hog suet melted together. Parkinson. 
This prescription is not so preposterous as it sounds. Box and Pennyroyal both contain essences which would be in all probability fatal to the germs of hydrophobia, and the soap and hong suet would keep air from the wound. Other prescriptions read like our modern patent medicines. Good cloves comfort the brain and the virtue of feeling, and help also against indigestion and ache of the stomach. Bartholomew. Sanve, the old name of mustard, healeth smiting of serpents, and overcometh venom of the scorpion, and abateth toothache, and cleanseth the hair, and letteth, that is, prevents, or tending to prevent, the falling thereof. If it be drunk fasting, it make the intellect good. Even in those days, the people can scarcely have believed that drinking mustard improved the intellect. Many of the remedies and cures are obviously false. For example, the following. A man crowned with ivy cannot get drunk. Powder of dry roses comforteth wagging teeth that be in point to fall. The fact that the surgeon was also a barber and also a face specialist appears from two of the following. Leaves of chestnut burnt to powder and tempered with vinegar, and laid to a man's head plaster-wise, maketh hair increase and keepeth hair from falling. Those who hair turn gray could employ the following prescription. Leaves of mulberry sod in rainwater maketh black hair. If a doctor was not quite sure of their endurance of a patient under these heroic remedies, he could easily find out if he would recover, for it was only necessary to try the following. Solendine with the heart of a mold's warp that is, mole, Scottish moldywort, laid under the head of one that is grievously sick. If he be in danger of death, immediately he will cry out with a loud voice or sing. If not, he will weep. In Lightfoot's Flora Scotia, there is an interesting account of the fly mushroom, Agaricus muscaris, which is not very rare in Britain, and which may easily be recognized by the bright red top or cap with whitest scales, scattered over it, and a sort of ring of loose white tissue around the stalk. It has an acrid and deleterious quality. From the inhabitants of Kamshakta, prepare a liquor from an infusion of this garlic, which has taken a small quantity, exhilarates the spirits, but in a larger dose brings on a trembling of the nerves. Intoxication, delirium, and melancholy. Linnaeus informs us that flies are killed, or at least stupefied by an infusion of this fungus in milk, and that the express juice of it anointed on bedsteads than other places effectually destroys what we may describe as a certain lively and pertinacious insects with great affection for man. As a matter of fact, the fungus is said to be a deadly poison. These quotations are enough to show how the real medical knowledge of those times was encrusted with all sorts of faith-curing devices, sheer falsehoods, and superstitions. The most learned men of the Middle Ages were almost invariably monks and hermits, for there was nothing in the world of those strenuous times to attract a studious, sensitive disposition. The spirits of their learning can be judged from the wearisome disquisitions in lengthy volumes written about the barnacle goose and the Scythian lamb. In certain deserts along the Volga River in Russia, a peculiar fern may be found. It might be described as resembling a gigantic polypody. The stem is about as thick as a lamb's body and grows horizontally on the ground like that of the common fern mentioned. Thick, furry scales cover the outside of its stem, which ends at the tip in an elongated point. The blackish green leaves stalk, springing from the furry stem, end in large divided green leaves. It occurred to some medieval humorists to cut off the upper part of the leafish stalks and to make a sort of toy lamb out of the four leaf stalk stumps and part of the woolly or furry stem. This was palmed off as a wonderful curiosity of nature, as a plant that became an animal, upon the ingenuous tourist of the period. Such a subject was thoroughly congenial to the learned mind in the Middle Ages, and an enormous quantity of literature was produced in consequence. The general theory is given in the following lines. Cradled in snow and fanned by arctic air shines gentle barometes, thy golden hair rooted in earth each cloven hoof descends and round and round her flexible neck she bends crops the grey coral moss and hoary thyme or laps with rosy tongue the melting rhyme eyes with mute tenderness her distant dam or seems to bleat a vegetable lamb 
such as the old idea of a well-known fern, Subotium baromets. Yet the original researches of some African obi, wizard, or red Indian were not forgotten, and gradually came into practice. It must be remembered that these savages were true scientific experimentalists, and made discoveries which have been infinite service to mankind. We remember great men like Harvey, Lester, and Pasteur, but we never think of the Indian who discovered quinine. The quinine trees, the yellow variety of Calisea quinchona, grow in the mountains of northeastern Bolivia and southeastern Peru, in wild, inaccessible places at heights of 5,000 to 6,000 feet. The Indians probably experimented with almost every part of every wild tree before they discovered the wonderful properties of this particular species. The quinine in nature is probably intended to prevent some fungus or small insect from attacking the bark. When quinine is used in malaria, it kills the fever germ which attacks the blood corpuscles of the sick person so that it is the most utmost importance in all tropical countries. When the Jesuit fathers reached Peru and made friends and converts of the Indians, they discovered this remedy. Soon after, the Countess de Sicone, the wife of the Viceroy of Peru, fell seriously ill of fever and was cured by the use of Jesuit's park or quinine. It was introduced into Europe about 1638, but for a very long time the entire supply came from South America. The British Indian government were paying some 12,000 pounds every year for South American quinine, and, at the same time, the supply was running short, for the Indians were cutting down every tree. At last, in 1859, on the suggestion of Dr. Royal, in 1839, the adventurous journeys of Clements, Markham, Spruce, and Robert Cross resulted in the introduction of the Cincona, now flourishing in Madras, Bombay, and Ceylon. In 1897, British colonies produced about 43,415 pounds worth of quinine, and the price is now only seven and a half pennies, or eight pennies a pound. Such drugs as safflower are of very ancient date. It was commonly employed in Egypt with other dyes and spices for embalming mummies. It is now used with carbonate of soda and citric acid to give a pink dye to silks and satins, and occasionally, in the form of rouge, to ladies' cheeks. How did the ancient Egyptians discover that this particular thistle-like plant, Carthamus tinctorus, had flowers from which a red dye could be extracted by a tedious process of soaking in water? The natural color of the flower is not red, but yellow. The history of other drugs read like a romance. Ipecacuana, for instance, was discovered by some unknown Indian who lived in the damp tropical forests of Brazil and New Granada. A worthy merchant in Paris obtained a little of the drug in the way of trade. Shortly afterward, he became very ill and was attended by a certain Dr. Helvetius, who was exceedingly attentive to him. The grateful merchant gave the kind-hearted physician some Ipecacuana. In the course of time, the great king Louis the Fourteenth's son fell ill of dysentery, and Halvetius received a thousand Louis de Vore for his Ipecacuana. A very interesting and romantic history might be written about the effects of drugs, dyes, and spices in developing trade. During the time when Britain was struggling to obtain share of the foreign trade of Holland and France, such as spices of clove, cinnamon, and pepper were of the greatest importance. The Dutch especially adopted every possible method to keep the spice trade in their own hands. They cut down clove, cinnamon, and other trees in all the islands not directly under their control. They imposed the most barbarous penalties on any interloper. For instance, anyone who sold a single stick of cinnamon in Ceylon was punished with death. When the English captured the island in 1796, all such restrictions were of course repealed. Nevertheless, its cultivation remained a monopoly of the East India Company until 1832. Logwood, Hamatoxylon, Compactianum, is closely connected to the story of adventure and colonization in the West Indies. Its use was at first forbidden by Queen Elizabeth, as it did not yield fast colors. This was because the dyers did not know of any mordant to fix them. Yet this is one of the few vegetable dyes which retain their position in the market in these days of aniline colors, and it is said to be large constituent with brandy of cheap port wine. 
Indigo was known to the Romans, who imported it from India on camelback by way of the Persian and Syrian desert. In the 15th century, when the Dutch began to introduce it in large quantities, it was found to interfere with the woad, Estasis tinctoria, which was then a very important cultivated plant in Europe. In Nuremberg, an oath was administered once a year to all the manufacturers and dyers, by which they bound themselves not to use the devil's dye, as they called indigo. Its more recent history shows a very different system. In Assam and other parts of British India, enormous sums of money have been invested in indigo plantations. It has been estimated that four million pounds was invested, and that a population of something like 700 Europeans and 850 workmen to the square mile in Bihar were entirely supported by indigo plantations. Now all these planters are ruined, and the population is dispersed, because German indigo manufactured from coal tar is destroying the sale of the British-grown material. The plant has pretty blue flowers and belongs to the Ligamonious order. The dye is obtained by steeping the leaves and young branches in water, and it is finally turned out in blue powder or cakes. Perhaps the most interesting of all these drugs is pepper. The Dutch, in the days of Queen Elizabeth, had a monopoly of the East Indian trade, and they tried to cut down or burn all spice trees except those in their own control. They could thus form a corner in pepper and alter the price as they felt inclined. As one period, they doubled the price, raising it from three shillings to six shillings per pound. This annoyed the London merchants so much that they met together and formed the Society of Merchants and Adventurers Trading to the East Indies. This was, of course, the original source of our great East Indian trade, and later on resulted in the Indian Empire. At present, and for centuries, the whole world is searched and explored for drugs and spaces. A medicinal rhubarb, for instance, grows in China on the frontiers of Tibet. It is carried over the mountains of China to Kyokta in Siberia, and from thence taken across the Russian Siberia to London and New York. It is closely allied to the common and garden rhubarb, which grows wild on the banks of the Volga. It is only our duty to remember with gratitude all those long, since departed botanists who have made our lives so full of luxury and have supplied our doctors with all kinds of medicines. The first doctors were, of course, just savage botanists, but as soon as men began to write down their experiences, we find botanical treaties. The first, and for a very long time the only, botanical books were intended to teach medical students the names and how to recognize useful flowers and drugs. Medicinal herbs such as mandrake, garlic, and mint are found described on those clay cylinders which were used in Babylon instead of books, about 4,000 B.C., that's some 6,000 years ago. The Egyptians thought that kindly healing plants such as opium, almonds, figs, castor oil, dates, and olives were derived from the blood and tears of the gods. That would be about 3,000 B.C., it is not known how far back Chinese botany can be traced, but by the 12th century before Christ, some 300 plants were known, including ginger, licorice, rhubarb, and cinnamon. Theophrastus, who flourished about 300 BC, was a scientific botanist far ahead of his time. His notes about the mangroves in the Persian Gulf are still of some importance. It is said that some 2,000 botanical students attended his lectures. It is doubtful if any professor of botany has ever since that time had so large a number of pupils. Dioscorides, who lived about 64 BC, wrote a book which was copied by the Pliny, 78 AD, who perished in the eruption of Vesuvius. The botany of the Middle Ages seemed to have been mainly that of Theophrastus and Dioscorides. In the 10th century, we find an Arab, Ibn Sina, whose name has been commemorated in the name of a plant. Avicenia, publishing the first illustrated textbook, for he gave colored diagrams to his pupils. After this, there was an exceedingly little discovery until comparatively recent times, but grew in 1682, and Malpighi in 1700 began to work with the microscope, and with the work of Linnaeus in 1731, modern botany was well started and ready to develop. It is interesting to compare the numbers of plants known at various periods, so as to see how greatly our knowledge has been increased of recent years. 
Theophrastus, 300 B.C., knew about 500 plants. Pliny, 78 A.D., knew about a 1,000 species by name. Linnaeus, in 1731, raised the number to 10,000. Sicardo, in 1892, gives the number of plants then known as follows. Flowering plants, 105,231 species. Ferns, 2,819 species. Horse tails and club mosses, 565 species. Mosses, 4,609 species. Liverworts, 3,000. 41 species. Lichens, 5,600 species. Fungi, 39,663 species. Seaweeds, 12,178 species. Total, 173,706 species. But during the years that have elapsed since 1892, many new species have been described, so that we may estimate that at least 200,000 species are now known to mankind but it is in the inner meaning and general knowledge of the life of plants that modern botany has made the most extraordinary progress it is true that we are still burdened with medieval terminology there are such names as galbalus amphisarca and inferior drupaceus pseudocarps but these are probably disappearing the great idea that plants are living beings, that every detail in their structure has a meaning in their life, and that all plants are more or less distant cousins descended from a common ancestor, have had extraordinary influence in overthrowing the unintelligent pedantry so prevalent until 1875. Yet there are many, not always botanists, of much older date, who have made great discoveries in the science. Leonardo da Vinci, the great painter seems to have quite a definite idea of the growth of trees, for he found out that on the annual rings on a tree stem are thin on the northern and thick on the southern side of the trunk. Dante have also understood the effects of sunlight in ripening the vine and producing the growth of the plants. Pergoratorio, 25.77 Goethe seems to have been almost the first to understand how leaves can be changed in appearance when they are intended to act in a different way petals stamens as well as some tendrils and spines are all modified leaves there is also a passage in virgil or perhaps more distinctly in cato which is held to show that the ancients knew that groups of plants leguminoso in some way improved the soil i have also tried to show that shelley had a more or less distinct idea of the warning or conspicuous colors reds, purples, spotted, and speckled, which are characteristics of many poisonous plants. But if we begin with the unlettered savage, one can trace the very slow and gradual growth of the science of plant life, persisting all through the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, and recent times, until about fifty or sixty years ago, when a sudden great development began, which gives us, we hope, the promise of still more wonderful discoveries. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Romance of Plant Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Eliot. Chapter 3 A Tree's Perilous Life. Hemlock, spruce, and pine forests story of a pine seedling, its struggles and dangers, the gardener's boot, turpentine of pines, the giant sawfly, bark beetles, their effect on music, storm and strength of trees, tall trees and long seaweeds, eucalyptus, big trees, age of trees, venerable sequoias, oaks, chestnuts and olives, baobab and dragon tree, rabbits as woodcutters, fire as protection, sacred fires, dugout and birch bark canoes, lake dwellings, grazing animals and forest destruction, first kind of cultivation, old forests in England and Scotland, game preserving. The murmuring pines and the hemlocks stand like harpers hoar with beards that rest on their bosom. Longfellow 
Of course, the hemlock here alluded to is not the hemlock rank growing on the weedy bank, which the cow is jured not to eat in Wordsworth's well-known lines. If the animal had, however, obeyed the poet's wishes and eaten mellow cow's lips, it would probably have been seriously ill. The hemlock is the hemlock spruce, a fine, handsome tree, which is common in the forests of eastern North America. These primeval forests of pine and fir and spruce have always taken the fancy of poets. They are found covering craggy and almost inaccessible mountain valleys. Even a tourist traveling by train cannot be but impressed by their somber, gloomy monotony, by their obstinacy in growing on rocky precipices on the worst possible soil in spite of storm and snow. But to realize the romance of a pine forest, it is necessary to tramp, as in Germany one sometimes has to do, for thirty miles through one unending black forest of coniferous trees. There are no towns, scarcely a village or a forester's hut. The ground is covered with brown, dead needles, on which scarcely even green moss can manage to live. Then one realizes the irritating monotony of the branches of pines and spruces, and their somber dark green foliage produces a morose depression of spirit. The conifers are amongst trees, like those hard-set, gloomy, and determined northern races whose life is one long continuous strain of incessant endeavor to keep alive under the most difficult conditions. From its very earliest infancy, a young pine has a very hard time. The pine cones remain on the tree for two years. The seeds inside are slowly maturing all this while, and the cone scales are so welded or soldered together by resin and turpentine that no animal could possibly injure them. How thorough is the protection thus afforded to the young seeds can only be understood if one takes a one-year-old unopened cone of the Scotch fir and tries to get them out. It does not matter what is used. It may be a saw, a chisel, a hammer, or an axe. The little elastic, woody, turpentiny thing can only be split open with an infinite amount of trouble and a serious loss of calm. When these two years have elapsed, the stalk of the cone grows so that the scales are separated, and the seeds become rapidly dry and are carried away by the wind. These seeds are most beautiful and exquisitely fashioned. The seed itself is small and flattened. It contains both resin and food material and is enclosed in a tough leathery skin which is carried out beyond the seed into a long, very thin, papery wing, which has very nearly the exact shape of the screw or propeller of a steamer. This wing or screw is intended to give the seed as long a flight in the air as possible before it reaches the ground. If you watch them falling from the tree, or throw one up into the air and observe it attentively, you will see that it twirls or revolves round and round exactly like the screw of a steamship. It is difficult to explain what happens without rather advanced mathematics, but it is just the reverse of what happens in the steamer. The machinery in the steamer turns the screw, and the pressure of the water, which is thrown off, forces the boat through the water. In the case of the pine seed, the pressure of the air on the flying wings makes the seed twirl or turn round and round, and so the seed must be a much longer time in falling. They often fly to about 80 or 100 yards away from the parent tree. Once upon the ground, the seed has to germinate if it can. Its root has to pierce the soil or find a way in between crevices of rocks or sharp-edged stones. All the time it is exposed to danger from birds, beasts, and insects, which are only kept off by its resin. But it is difficult to see, for its color is just that of dead pine needles, and its shape is such that it easily slips into crevices. Then the seven or eight small green seed leaves break out of the tough seed coat, and the seedling is now a small tree two inches high. It may have to grow up through grass or bramble, or through bracken, which last is perhaps still more dangerous and difficult. 
it will probably be placed in a wood or plantation where hundreds of thousands of its cousins are all competing together. Quote, in this case, the struggle for life is intense. Each tree seeking for sunlight tries to push its leader shoots up above the general mass of foliage, but all are growing in height, whilst the lateral branches which are cramped by the neighboring trees are continually thrown off. The highest branches alone get sufficient light to remain alive, but they cannot spread out freely. They are strictly limited to a definite area. The crown is small and crowded by those of the trees next to it, and the trunk is of extraordinary length. End quote. The above quotation from Albert Franz Silviculture, Paris, 1903, refers to an artificial forest cultivated and watched over by man. But the trees in such forests have extra dangers and difficulties to fight against. Even scientific foresters admit that they are very ignorant of what they are trying to do. In fact, the more scientific they are, the more readily they will confess how little they really know. Watch a laborer in a nursery transplanting young pine trees. Each seedling tree has a long main root, which is intended to grow as straight down into the ground as it possibly can. All the other roots branch off sideways, slanting downwards, and make a most perfect, though complicated, absorbing system. With his large hand, the man grasps a tree and lifts it to a shallow groove which he has cut in the soil. Then his very large, heavy-nailed boot comes hard down on the tender root system. The main root, which ought to point down, points sideways or upwards or in any direction, and the beautifully arranged absorbing system is entirely spoilt. The wretched seedling has to make a whole new system of roots, and in some trees never recovers. All sorts of animals, insects and funguses, are ready to attack our young tree. Squirrels in play will nibble off its leading shoots. Cattle will rub against its bark. And the roe deer, a very beautiful creature, and yet a destructive little fiend from the tree's point of view, nibbles the young shoots and tears the bark with its horns. A tree's life is full of peril and danger. Yet it is most wonderfully adapted to survive them. Take a knife and cut into the bark of a pine tree and immediately a drop of resin collects and gathers on the wound. After a short time, this will harden and entirely cover the scar. Why? There are in the woods, especially in Canada and North Russia, hundreds of insects belonging to the most different kinds, which have the habit of laying their eggs in the wood of tree trunks. In those regions, the entire country is in the winter covered with snow and ice for many months. Insects must find it difficult to live, for the ground is frozen to a depth of many feet. Where are the eggs of these insects to be stored up so that they can last through the winter without injury? There is one insect at least, or rather many, of which the giant sawfly may be taken as an example, which have ingeniously solved this problem. She painfully burrows into the trunk of a tree and deposits her eggs with a store of food at the end of the burrow. A drop of resin or turpentine, which would clog her jaws, makes this a difficult task, but, as we find in many other instances, it is not impossible, but only a difficulty to conquer. If it were not for the resin, trees might be much more frequently destroyed by sawflies than they are, the larva of the sawfly is a long, fleshy maggot. Just at the end are the strong wood-cutting jaws by which it devours the wood and eats its way out as soon as it feels the genial warmth of spring penetrating through the tree bark. Many other insects hibernate or lay their eggs in tree trunks. Some are caterpillars of moths, such as the well-known goat moth. Others are beetles such as one which burrows between the bark and the wood of apple trees. The mother beetle lays a series of eggs on each side of her own track. Each egg produces a grub, 
which eats its way sideways away from the track of the mother. The track made by these grubs gets gradually wider because the maggots themselves grow larger and more fat with the distance that they have got from their birthplace. We shall find other instances of burrowing insects when we are dealing with rubber plants. This resin or turpentine is a very interesting and peculiar substance, or rather series of substances. It is valuable because tar, pitch, rosin, and colophony are obtained by distilling it. When traveling through the coast forests of pine trees in the Lombe of western France, one notices great bare gashes on the stems leading round and down the trunk to a small tin cup or spout. These trees are being tapped for resin, from which rosin is manufactured. It would be difficult to find any obvious connection between music and the giant sawfly. Yet, the rosin used by Paganini and Kubelik has probably been developed in conifers to keep away sawflies and other enemies. This very district, the Landes in France, was once practically a desert and famous as such in French history. The soil was so barren that no villages or cultivation were found over the whole length of it. Now that it is planted with trees which are able to yield firewood and rosin, it is comparatively rich and prosperous. Storms are also very dangerous for tree life. One can only realize the beauty of a tree by watching a pine or ash in a heavy gale of wind. The swing of the branches, the swaying of the trunk, the balancing support of the roots which, buttress-like, extend out into the soil, give some idea of the extraordinary balance, toughness, and strength in trees. Except in the case of the common umbrella, which is an inefficient instrument in high wind, engineers have never attempted the solution of the problem satisfactorily solved by trees. A factory chimney only 51 feet in height will have a diameter at the base of at least 3 feet. This means that the height is about 17 times its diameter. But the rye plant, with a diameter at base of 3 millimeters, may be 1,500 millimeters high. That is, the height is 500 times its diameter, and the rye plant has leaves and grain to support as well as its own stem. In pine forests on exposed mountainsides, there is almost always at least a murmuring sound, which, in a storm, rises into weird howls and shrieks. With Greek insight and imagination, the ancients supposed that spirits were imprisoned in these suffering, straining pines. That is most beautifully expressed in The Tempest, where the dainty spirit Ariel had been painfully confined in a pine tree for a dozen years, and, quote, his groans did make wolves howl and penetrate the breasts of ever-angry bears, end quote. One of the most interesting points in botany depends on the fact that evil conditions of any sort tend to bring about their own remedy. Endymion's spear was of, quote, toughest ash grown on a windy site, end quote, Keats. The prosaic chemical analyses of German botanists have, in fact, confirmed the theory there suggested, for it is found that the wood of trees grown in exposed windy places is really denser and tougher than that of others from sheltered woods. If one realizes all these dangers from insects, animals, and storms, the height to which some trees grow and the age to which they live become matters for astonishment and surprise. The tallest trees in the world are probably certain eucalyptus of Australia, which have obtained a height of 495 feet above the ground. They are by no means the longest plants, for there are certain rattans or canes, climbing plants belonging to the palm family, which may be 900 feet long, although their diameter is not more than 2 inches. There are also certain seaweeds in the southern ocean off the coast of Chile, 
which attain a prodigious length of 600 feet. Macrocystis pyriferous, or kelp. That is not so remarkable, for their weight is supported by other plants in the case of the rattans, and as regard the seaweeds, by the water in which they float. The next in order to the eucalyptus are those well-known mammoth or big trees of California, Sequoia gigantea. They grow only in certain valleys in the Sierra Nevada, at an altitude of 5,000 to 8,000 feet. Their height is usually given as from 250 to 400 feet, and the diameter sometimes exceeds 35 feet. Since they have become a center of the tourist industry in the United States, various methods have been adopted to make their size more easily realized. Thus, a coach with four horses and covered by passengers is, or used to be, driven through a gateway made in one of them. The trunk of another has been cut off some feet from the ground, and a dancing saloon has been made on the stump. It is at least doubtful if dancing would be very agreeable upon such a cross-grained sort of floor. A complete section of one of them was carried across the United States to make a dining-room table for an American millionaire. The age of one of these trees has been estimated at 3,300 years. That is to say that it was a seedling in 1400 B.C. and has been peacefully growing in a Californian valley during all the time when Greece, Rome, Spain, France, Britain, and of course the United States developed their civilizations. The specimen of the mammoth tree in the Natural History Museum in London was 1,335 years old. The possible age of many of our common trees is much greater than anyone would suppose. The Jupiter oak in the forest of Fontainebleau is supposed to be 700 years old. Another oak, which was cut down at Bordia in the Baltic provinces of Russia, was supposed to be about 1,000 years old. Other millennial trees are or were another oak and two chestnuts. The oak grew in the Ardennes. The chestnuts still flourish. One at Sancerre, France, and the other the famous specimen on Mount Etna. There are also eight olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane at Jerusalem, which are certainly 1,000 years old and were, according to tradition, in existence in the time of Jesus Christ. And yet all these trees are mere infants, compared to Adinson's Baobab and the Dragon Tree of Orotava. The celebrated traveler alluded to visited the Cape Verde Islands in 1749 and found inscriptions made by English travelers on the trunk 300 years before his time. From the growth since then, he calculated that some of these trees were about 6,000 years of age, and they were 27 feet in diameter. The record is held by the dragon tree of Orotava in the Canary Islands. When the Spaniards landed in Tenerife in 1402, its diameter was very nearly 42 feet. It was, however, greatly injured by a storm in 1827 and finally destroyed in 1851. The wood was then made into walking sticks and snuff boxes. The age has been estimated at 10,000 years, or by other authorities at 8,000 years only. The dragon's blood of the Canaries, a well-known remedy in the Middle Ages, was not, as is popularly supposed, derived from this tree, but was obtained from a totally different plant. But there is a hazy tradition to the effect that the story of the dragon, which guarded the golden fruit in the island of the Hesperides, was nothing but a garbled account of this redoubtable veteran of the plant world. There is no particular advantage in growing to these enormous heights and clinging to life in this way for hundreds and thousands of years. Nature seems to have found this out and preferred the ordinary pines, oaks, and larches, which are mature in a few hundred years. In a thousand years, ten generations of larch or pine can be produced, and, as each is probably better than its predecessor, 
a distinct improvement in the type is possible. All these long-lived giants belong, in fact, to the less highly specialized orders of plants. They are like the primeval animals, the mammoths, atlantosauri, and saber-toothed tigers. Yet, when we come to think of the many and diverse perils to which trees are exposed, the existence of even these exceptional monsters seems very wonderful. After a violent storm which had blown down many of the trees in a friend's park, I visited the scene of destruction and discovered what had apparently in almost every instance produced it. Rabbits had overthrown these trees. They had nibbled away part of the cork and part of the young wood on the projecting buttress-like roots at the base of the tree. In consequence, water, bacteria, and fungus spores had entered at the injured places, and part of the roots had become decayed and rotten. When the gale began to sway them backwards and forwards, and a severe strain came on what should have been a sound anchoring or supporting buttress, the rotten part yielded, and these fine, beautiful trees fell a prey to the rabbit. The influence of forests and timber on the daily life of mankind is a most romantic and interesting chapter in history. Every savage tribe, every race of man, however degraded or backward, is acquainted with fire. Fuel is, therefore, a necessity of existence for all savages, and not merely for cooking. There is a very interesting passage in London's The Call of the Wild, when the dog Buck, in his dreams, remembers a hairy man crouching over the fire with Buck's ancestor at his feet, whilst in the darkness all round them the firelight is reflected from eyes of wolves, bears, and even more terrible and dangerous brutes, which have now happily vanished from the world. For protection at night, fire was an absolute necessity. Even at that long-distant period, therefore, man had commenced to attack the forest. Unless one has had to tend a wood fire for twelve hours, it is difficult to realize what a quantity is required. To prepare fire was a long, laborious, and difficult operation. One piece of wood was placed on the ground and held in position by the toes. A pointed stick was taken between the two palms of the hand and twirled vigorously round and round until the heat was enough to ignite a piece of rotten wood placed as tinder. Therefore smoldering branches were kept always burning, as they are today amongst the Fuegians and some other savages. It was a sacred duty to watch this fire, and the woman, usually old, who was entrusted with the task, was very probably put to death if she failed. From this very ancient savage custom probably arose the cult of the Vestal Virgins in ancient Rome. Another very important factor in savage life was the canoe, or pirogue, necessary for fishing or to cross lakes and rivers. The first chanty of Rudyard Kipling has a probable theory, and is a beautiful account of how man first thought of using a floating log. They hollowed out the log and dug out the canoe by first lighting a fire on it and then scraping away the cinders. Then the sides were pressed out, and it was trimmed and straightened to the right shape. All this was the idea of some Paleolithic genius, far more persevering and ingenious than any marine architect of our own days. Birch bark canoes are not so common as dugouts. The tree, the white or paper birch, is found in Canada and the northern United States. Those Indians who discovered that the light, waterproof cork bark could be fashioned into a canoe made a very great discovery, and indeed it was their canoes that made travel or exploration possible in North America. When man began to long for a settled permanent home, it was absolutely necessary to find a way of living in safety. Wolves, bears, hyenas, and other animals were abundant. Neighbors of his own or other tribes were more ferocious and more dangerous than wild beasts. 
some Neolithic genius imagined an artificial island made of logs in the midst of a lake or inaccessible swamp. Such were the lake dwellings which persisted into historic times, and which are indeed still in existence in some parts of the earth. The trees were abundant. They could be felled by the help of fire and an axe, and the lake dwelling gave a secure defense. The wood of some of the piles supporting the great villages in Switzerland seems to be still sound, though it has been under water for many centuries. Some villages are said to have required hundreds of thousands of trees. The forest afforded man almost everything that he used, bows and arrows, shelter, fuel, and even part of his food. Nuts and fruits would be collected, and when possible, stored. In seasons of famine, they used even to eat the delicate inside portion of the bark of trees. But as soon as the first half-civilized men began to keep cattle, sheep and especially goats, more serious inroads still were made upon the forest. Where such animals are allowed to graze, there is no chance for wood to grow, at any rate in a temperate country. The growing trees and the branches of older ones are nibbled away whilst they are young and tender. The days of the forest were nearly over when cultivation commenced. Dr. Henry describes the process of nomadic culture in China as follows, quote, They burn down areas of the forest, gather one or two crops of millet or upland rice from the rich forest soil, and then pass on to another district where they repeat the destruction. End quote. A very similar process of agriculture existed until the 18th century in Scotland. Thus, the forest was being burnt or cleared for cultivation. It was devastated by black cattle, goats, and other animals, and it was regularly exploited for fuel and building every day by every family for centuries. It is not, therefore, surprising that the ancient forests in Britain have disappeared. Dr. Henry mentions one square mile of virgin forest on the Clonbrock estate in Ireland. The Silva Caledonica of the Romans is said to exist in Scotland at the Blackwood of Rothimurchus, at Achnacari, and in a few other places. Of the original oak forest, which covered most of England and southern Scotland, not a vestige, so far as is known to the writer, remains today. There are, in places, very ancient forests. A few miles from Retford are considerable remains of Sherwood Forest, which is forever associated with that genial bandit Robin Hood. One huge oak, called the Major, has or used to have a keeper always on guard, and paid by Lord Manvers, but there are hundreds of aged oaks all round it. Then there is the Nightwood Oak, and some other ancients in the New Forest. But it is not certain that these even date so far back as the time of Canute, for so far as the New Forest is concerned, it seems that this was formed either by Canute or by William I. The Saxons seem to have destroyed most of the English forests. In Scotland, oak forest existed as far north as the island of Lewis, in Caithness, Dornoch, Cromarty, and along Loch Ness, as well as in every county south of these. The deer forests and grouse moors, now desolate, whop-haunted mereland and peat mosses, were flourishing woods of magnificent Scots fir at no very distant period. They ascended the hills on the Cairngorms to 1,400 or 1,500 feet, and in Yorkshire to 2,400 feet. Even in remote historical times, such as those of Canute, the forests had become seriously and dangerously destroyed. This king was apparently the first to artificially protect the woods as a hunting preserve. He was followed by William the Conqueror and other sovereigns. The game preserves of the landed proprietors today are, of course, the remains of the same custom. Fortunately, however, we do not kill poachers or cut off their right hands, 
and we do not cut off the forepaws of poaching dogs as used to be done in medieval days this connection of forests with game no doubt prevented the entire disappearance of wood but when as in the case of england the comfort of pheasants is thought of more importance than the scientific cultivation of forests the result is often very unfortunate the use and value of timber is however too important a matter to take up at the end of a chapter end of chapter three recording by linda johnson chapter four of the romance of plant life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the romance of plant life by george francis scott elliot chapter four on forests the forests of the coal age monkey puzzle and ginkgo wood its uses color and smell lasting properties of wood jara and deodar teak uses of birch norwegian barks destruction of wood in america paper from wood pulp forest fires arid lands once fertile britain to be again covered by forests vanished country homes ashes at farmhouses yews in churchyards history of man versus woods in britain what was the first tree like that is a very difficult question to answer perhaps the first forests were those of the great coal period of which the remains buried for untold ages in the earth became the coal which we now burn the flames and red glowing heat of a fire are the work of the sunlight which fell in these long past ages through a steamy misty atmosphere upon these weird grotesque vegetables unlike anything which now exists upon the earth their nearest allies amongst living plants are the little club mosses which creep over the peat and through the heather in alpine districts of course no one can say exactly what these coal forests were like but although some modern authorities have questioned the general accuracy of the description of here and others yet as they have not given anything better in the way of description we shall endeavor to describe them according to our own beliefs and as they probably existed in the lanarkshire coalfield and other places in britain in that gloomy murk of the carboniferous epoch an observer if there had been any would have dimly perceived huge trunks rising to sixty or eighty feet and divided at the top into a very few branches all branches were covered over by comparatively quite small leaves not a bad idea of the sigillarias lepidodendrons etc which made the forest and can be obtained by carefully looking at a pan of selaginella such as one finds in almost every botanical garden and imagining this to be eighty feet high through the bottomless oozy slime which formed the ground horizontal runners and roots penetrated in every direction great fern-like plants might be observed here and there sluggish rivers meandered slowly through these forests carrying silt and refuse their deposits are our canal coals in the water and in pools or perhaps in the mud were curious water ferns with coiled up crozier-like leaves perhaps horsetail like plants of huge size might have formed great reed beds to which those of today are as a plantation of one-year-old firs is to a pine forest that has lasted for a century fishes and crustaceans or lobster-like creatures crawled and squattered through the slime pursued by salamander-like animals with weak limbs and a long tail some of these latter were seven to eight feet long millipedes scorpions beetles and maybugs existed and huge dragonflies preyed on them 
but there is one very ancient group of trees, the Araucarias, or monkey puzzles, which are by no means uncommon even now. The ordinary one, Araucaria imbricata, is often planted in the British Isles, and it has, if you look closely at it, a most peculiar appearance. It is like the sort of tree that a child would draw. It is a clumsy attempt at one, and very different from the exquisite irregularity of the ash or oak. Its leaves are especially curious. They cover the branches very closely, and are hard, rigid, and spiny. Its cones, though of the nature of pine cones, are yet quite unique. The seeds are edible, and used to be an important article of diet to the Indians on the slopes of the Chilean Andes, where monkey puzzle forests used to exist. This, of course, is a very out-of-the-way region. Other species of Orocaria are found scattered about the world in a most perplexing manner. One kind grows in Norfolk Island in the Pacific. Another occurs in the inner mountainous districts of Brazil. There are some in Australia and others in New Caledonia. But in the Jurassic period of geology, in the age of ammonites and gigantic lizards and crocodiles, Oricarias were the regular ordinary trees. They grew all over Europe and apparently as far north as Greenland and indeed seem to have existed everywhere. Perhaps the spiny leaves discouraged some huge lizard, perhaps Atlantosaurus himself, he was 30 feet high and 100 feet long, from browsing on its branches. Perhaps the pterodactyls, those extraordinary bird or bat-like lizards, used to feed upon the seeds of the monkey puzzle and carried them in their toothed jaws to New Caledonia, Australia, and Norfolk Island. Other improved types have driven the monkey puzzle from Europe, Asia, and Africa and taken their places. But in out-of-the-way districts of South America and Australia, they are still able to hold their own. An ally of theirs, the ginkgo or maidenhair tree, seems to have been extremely common in certain geological periods. Today it has almost entirely disappeared. A few trees were discovered in certain Chinese temples where they had been preserved as curiosities for centuries, but it is almost extinct as a wild plant. The big tree group, Sequoia, was a companion of the ginkgo in its flourishing period. So also were the sago palms or cycads. All the ordinary trees, pines, oaks, beeches, and the like, did not appear upon the Earth's surface till a much later period. The most important economic product of trees is the timber which they furnish. Wood, as we have tried to show in the last chapter, has been always of the greatest importance to mankind. It is easily worked, durable, buoyant, and light, and it is used for all sorts of purposes. Silver fir, which is accustomed when growing to be continually swayed and balanced by the wind, is preferred for the sounding board of pianos and for the flat part of violins, whilst sycamore or hard maple is employed for the back and sides of the latter. But there are enormous differences in different kinds of woods. The color of wood varies from white, beech, yellow, satin wood, lemon yellow and bluish red, sap and heartwood of Barbary, to dark and light brown mottled, olive, black, persimmon, and dark brown, walnut. Some woods have a distinct smell or perfume. Cedar wood, sandal wood, deal, and teak are all distinctly fragrant. The stink wood of South Africa and the till of Madeira have an unpleasant smell. More important in practice are the differences in the hardness and weight of wood. The ironwood of India cannot be worked, as its hardness blunts every tool. It requires a pressure of something like 16,000 pounds to force a square inch punch to a depth of one twentieth of an inch in lignum vitae. Even hickory and oak, if of good quality, 
require a pressure of 3,200 pounds to the square inch to do this. On the other hand, the cotton tree of India, Bombax malabaricum, has exceedingly soft wood. It is quite easy to drive a pin into the wood with the fingers. Some woods are far too heavy to float. Many tropical woods are especially very weighty. Perhaps the black iron wood, of which a cubic foot weighs 85 pounds, is the heaviest of all. But the same volume of poplar, willow, or spruce does not weigh more than 24 pounds. There are many ancient and modern instances of the extraordinary way in which timber lasts when at all carefully looked after. Thus the cedar which Hiram rafted down to make the Temple of Solomon, probably cedar of Lebanon, seems to have been extraordinarily durable. Pliny says that the beams of the Temple of Apollo at Utica were sound 1,200 years after they were erected. Cypress wood, Cupressus sempervirens, was often used to make chests for clothes because the clothes moth cannot penetrate it, and it also lasts a very long time. There is a chest of this wood in the South Kensington Museum, which is 600 to 700 years old. The cypress wood gates of Constantinople were 11 centuries old when they were destroyed by the Turks in 1453. The fleet of Alexander the Great and the bridge over the Euphrates built by Semiramis were made of cypress. This wood seems to have been of extraordinary value to the ancients and was used for mummy cases in Egypt, for coffins by the popes, as well as for harps and organ pipes. Perhaps the most valuable woods are box, which is used for woodcuts, and walnut, which used to be highly prized for gun stocks, as much as 600 pounds having been paid for a single tree. But the most interesting histories of trade in timber belong to the commoner and more usual woods. The great woods of Jara, Eucalyptus marginata, cover 14,000 square miles of Australia, but they are being rapidly cut down and sawn up into small blocks to be carried right across the world in order to form the pavement which London cabmen and cab horses prefer to any other. One remembers also the beautiful Deodar forests of Afghanistan and the Himalayas. Logs of Deodar were floated down the rivers to form bridges or temple pillars in Srinagar, the capital of Far Kashmir. Nowadays, great slides are made, winding down into the valleys from the recesses of the hills. When winter approaches, water is sprinkled on the logs which make the slide. This freezes and forms a slippery descending surface, down which the Deodar timber rushes till it reaches the low ground, where it is cut up into railway sleepers and takes part in the civilizing of India. The fragrant teak has an oleoresin which prevents the destructive white ants from attacking it. It is the most valuable timber for shipbuilding and grows in many places of India, Malaysia, Java, and Sumatra. It floats down the rivers of Burma, coming from the most remote hill jungles, and elephants are commonly used at the ports to gather the trunks from the water and pile them ready for shipment. The birch is carried all the way from Russia to Assam and Ceylon in order to make the chests in which tea is sent to England and Russia. Native Indian woods are also used. It is also used in the distillation of Scotch whiskey, for smoking herrings and hams, for clogs, baskets, tanning, dyeing, cordage, and even for making bread. But one of the most curious and interesting sights in any seaport is sure to be an old white Norwegian or Swedish sailing bark or brigantine. She will have a battered, storm-beaten appearance, and is yet obviously a comfortable home. The windows of the deck house may be picked out with a lurid green. The tall, slow-moving, white-bearded skipper and his wife, children and crew, not to speak of a dog and cats, have their home on this veteran windjammer. 
she carries them from some unpronounceable, never-heard-of port in Norway, all over the world. You may see her discharging a cargo of deal plank through the clumsy square holes in her stern in a forgotten Fifeshire village, in Madagascar, in China, or in the Straits of Magellan. All her life she is engaged in this work, and her life is an exceedingly long one to judge from the Viking lines on which she is built. Moreover, her work is done so economically that it used to be much cheaper to use her cargo in Cape Town than to utilize the beautiful forests of the Nysna and King Williamstown. But there are not wanting signs that the forests of Norway, of Sweden, and even those of the United States are doomed. It is said that seven acres of primeval forest are cut down to supply the wood which is used up in making the paper required for one day's issue of a certain New York journal. What a responsibility and a source of legitimate pride this must be to the journalists. Let us hope that the end justifies the means. Bulger calculates that in 1884 all the available timber from 4,131,520 acres of Californian redwood was used in making the sleepers of the railways then existing in the United States. He finds that no less than 18 million acres of forest are necessary to keep up the supply of sleepers for the old lines and to build new ones. So that, if we remember the wood required for paper, firewood, and the thousand other important requisites of civilized man, the United States must soon exhaust her supply and import wood. Then will come the opportunity of British North America. The southern forest of Canada, which extended for 2,000 miles from the Atlantic to the head of the St. Lawrence, has indeed gone or is disappearing into pulpwood and timber. But there is still the great northern forest from the Straits of Belle Isle to Alaska, 4,000 miles long and 700 miles broad. And in addition, the beautiful forests of Douglas spruce and other trees in British Columbia covering 285,000 square miles. It is the wood pulp industry which is at present destroying the Canadian forests. The penny and halfpenny papers, and indeed most books nowadays, are made of paper produced by disintegrating wood. It is cheap and can be produced in huge quantities. Nevertheless, it is disquieting to reflect that Probably 19 twentieths of the literary output of the 20th century will be dust and ashes just about the same time, some 50 years, that the writers who produced it reach the same state. Yet, considering the amount daily produced today, the future readers of 50 years hence, who are now in their cradles, may consider this a merciful dispensation of providence. One very curious use of wood may be mentioned here. Near Aswan, on the first cataract of the Nile, one discovers broken granite, or cyanite needles, which had been intended by the ancient Egyptians for monuments. Where the broken pillar lies, there are rows of wedge-shaped holes cut in the rock. They used to drive in wedges of dry wood and then wet them with water. The expansion of the wood split the rock, though this is hard granite or cyanite. Very often the process failed because the stone cracked. The same method is said to be still used in some quarries. The destruction of the forest is really necessary. Most of the corn land and rich pasture of the world has been at one time forest. It could scarcely be such fertile soil if it had not been for the many years during which leaf mold fell on it, and the roots broke up and penetrated the subsoil below. Canada, Russia, and the United States are now passing through the same experience as that of Great Britain in the time of the Romans, Saxons, and Danes. But there is terrible waste by fire. When the trees become dry and withered in the height of summer, 
in either India or the United States, some careless tramp may throw aside a lighted match. If a fire once starts, it spreads with enormous rapidity. Great clouds of smoke roll over the surrounding country, and every village sounds the alarm. Everybody rushes to help and try to stop the conflagration, or, if too late, hurriedly saves whatever he can get of his possessions. His log hut and all the accumulations of years of saving may be turned into a heap of ashes in a very few minutes. But the crackling of the leaves and the flaming twigs and scorching bark make such a volume of fire that nothing which man can do is of any avail. Of course every beast, every bird and insect, is in the greatest possible danger. This is how a fire in New Zealand has been described by Mr. William Satchel. Quote, for a while it seemed that the battle must go to the wind. The fiery monster withdrew, lay hidden, roaring angrily in the dry heart of the woods. Then insidiously he stretched forth his glittering arms, first one, then another, and locking the shuddering trees in an irresistible embrace, sprang once again erect. In an instant, the whole bush from edge to edge became a seething, rocking mass of flames. Fire! Fire! Then, insignificant no longer, transfigured rather beyond all living possibilities of loveliness, the bush stood revealed to its center. It became less a fire than an incandescence, waxing in brilliance to the point when, as it seemed, it must perforce burst into indistinguishable flame. Every leaf and twig of that fairy forest was wrought and hammered in virgin gold. Every branch and trunk was a carved miracle of burnished copper. And from the golden leaves to the golden floor, floatingly or swiftly, there fell an unceasing rain of crimson flame petals, gorgeous flame fruits. Depth after depth stood revealed, each transcending the last in loveliness. And as the eye sought to penetrate those magic interiors, there seemed to open out yet farther vistas, beyond belief beautiful, as of the streets of a city incorruptible, walled and towered, lost in the light of a golden incomparable star. Fire! Fire! In the face of that vision of glory, the cry rang out with all the ineptitude and inappropriateness of the human weakling. On one side, the titanic forces of nature, inexorable, eternal. On the other, the man, frail of body, the creature of an hour, matching himself against them. Fire! Fire! Sheltering his face from the insufferable heat, the Swede hammered madly at the solid house door. At the back, now utterly unapproachable, the kitchen, the roof, and a part of the main wall were already in flames. A few minutes, five at the most, would complete the demolition of the house. To right and left, the great trees, one after another, went off like rockets, the roar of their burning foliage shaking the very earth. A deafening crashing of falling timber came at intervals from the bush beyond. End quote. In some countries, the destruction of the forests has had a very serious effect on the climate. The rain which falls upon a forest is partly absorbed by the leaves, and but a very small part of it is carried off by burns and streams. Most sinks down into the forest soil, and is only gradually given back again after being taken in by the tree roots and evaporated by the leaves. But bare hills, denuded of wood, allow most of their rain to rush down to the sea in dangerous spates of the rivers and burns, and then the ground becomes afterwards very dry and burnt up. There are very many countries, now barren and desolate, because they have been robbed of the beautiful forests which once covered the spring heads and mountain valleys. 
Perhaps Palestine is one of the worst instances. But it is when we remember Babylon, Nineveh, and all the cities of the coast of Asia Minor, as they were even a thousand years ago, and compare their present barren, desolate condition, that the full meaning of mountain forests becomes clear. Where once there were thriving, prosperous cities with enormous populations, now the goats graze, or a few miserable peasants carefully husband the water of a few miserable streams. The same thing has happened in Mauritius, in the Cape Verde and Canary Islands, and in many other places. But men are now beginning to see how dangerous the destruction of forests may be, and in many countries, and especially in Britain, new forests are being planted. Perhaps in time we may grow in Britain so much timber that we shall gain something like 32 million pounds a year, which is what we spend on imported woods. At present, plover, whops, snipe and grouse, or useless red deer, inhabit what was once the Caledonian forest, and every thousand acres of such land nowadays supports perhaps one shepherd and half a gamekeeper. But when it is planted again with woodlands, it will afford a living to at least ten foresters, and surely a whole gamekeeper as well. In the lowlands of Scotland and in England, one often discovers, in walking over the hills, remains of cottages and farmhouses which have now vanished. The people have gone into the towns, and the healthy yeomen and farmers' boys have become weak-chested factory hands and hooligans. Such sites of old farms can often be recognized by a patch of nettles, and especially by eight or nine ash trees. These were always planted near the houses to give a ready supply of wood for spears. The ash, quote, for nothing ill, unquote, as Spencer puts it, would be available also for repairing the handles of tools, carts, etc. Some authorities say that it was the law of Scotland that these eight or nine ash trees should be planted at every farm tune. So also, when forests began to vanish in England, laws were made to the effect that yew trees should be planted in every village churchyard. Probably this was to ensure a good supply of bows for the English archers, who, like the Scottish spears, were the best soldiers of their kind in Europe so that if we try to compare the conditions of man and of the forests in Great Britain from the earliest days, it would be something like this. 1. When the earliest inhabitants lived on shellfish, seabirds' eggs, nuts, and fruits, almost the whole country was covered by oak, scotch fir, or birch forests. 2. When man was a hunter of reindeer and other deer, horses, cattle and birds, he used much wood for fires and for building his lake dwellings. 3. When man kept herds of swine to eat acorns, black cattle, goats and ponies, there would be many clearings and a great deal of open wood in which the cattle roamed about. 4. When man grew corn and other plants, the forest vanished altogether. Dr. Johnson said he scarcely saw a tree between Carlisle and Edinburgh. Yet first the king, then the barons, had their parks and woodlands for preserving game. Moreover, the yews in the churchyards of England and the ash trees by the Scotch farm tunes and peel towers were carefully looked after. 5. When great towns arose, and men became factory hands and steel workers, rich men began to make plantations in the lowlands and to use the depopulated highlands for grouse moors and deer forests. 6. When men become wiser than they are now, it will be seen that great forests are necessary on all wasteland and barren places, both to keep a healthy country population and because it will pay. End of chapter 4 Recording by Linda Johnson Chapter 5 of The Romance of Plant Life 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Elliot. Chapter 5 Flowers. Man's Ideas of the Use of Flowers. Sprengel's Great Discovery. Insects Not Man Consulted. Pollen Carried to Set Seed. Flowers and Insects of the Windstone Age. Coal Age Flowers. Monkey Puzzle Times. Chalk Flowers. Windblown Pollen. Extravagant Expenditure of Pollen in Them. Flower of the Pine. Exploding Flowers. Brilliant Alpines. Intense Life in Flowers. Color Contrasts. Lost Bees. Evening Flowers. Hummingbirds and Sunbirds. Kangaroo. Floral Clocks. Ages of Flowers. How to Get Flowers All the Year Round. Ingenious Contrivances. Yucca and Fig. Horrible Smelling Flowers. Artistic Tastes of Birds, Insects, and Man. For many centuries, flowers were considered as pleasing and attractive decorations stuck about the world in the same way as they are put in a drawing room, in order to give people pleasure. Very soon they were found to be extremely useful in poetry, sometimes to point a moral or disguise a sermon like the primrose in Peter Bell, but more generally to produce a good impression on the beloved object. Burns puts the usual view of flowers very nicely in the following. But I will down yon river rove among the woods say green, and out to put a posy to my own dear May. Possibly this is the meaning also in the exquisite lines of Shakespeare about the pansy. Yet marked I where the bolt of Cupid fell, it fell upon a little western flower, before milk white, now purple with love's wound, and maidens call it love and idleness. Even if there is no particular meaning, the little western flower gives point and beauty to the lines. People only began to understand flowers about the year 1793, when Christian Conrad Sprengel, rector of Spandau near Berlin, published a very interesting work. He had discovered that the beauty of flowers and their color and shape were by no means intended solely to please human eyes, but that they were designed to attract and allure the eyes of insects. Before his time there had been many guesses. Indeed, Theophrastus, born 371 B.C. and often mentioned in this work, seems to have quite well understood why flowers produce pollen, and that the fruit would not set and form seed unless pollen was carried to the female part of the flower. He mentions that the pistachio has both male and female plants, and that palms only form dates when the pollen is carried to the female tree. This experiment with the date palm was tried in 1592 by an Italian, Alpino, in an Egyptian tour, and the Englishman Jacob Bobart, the Pole, Adam Zaluzianski, the latter in the same year, confirmed the general idea. Then, in the year 1694, Rudolf Jacob Camerarius, a German, carried on a few more experiments, but no real definite advance was made until 1793, in the very midst of the French Revolution. The great point of Sprengel's discovery was in its being an intelligible explanation of the reason why flowers have bright colors, scent, and honey. At his time, and indeed for many years afterwards, botanists looked on the stamens, petals, and other parts of the flower exactly in the way that a stamp collector looks at punctures and postmarks, that is, without thinking about their meaning. Now we find that they are always designed to fulfill a perfectly definite purpose and that all their details are contrived accordingly. This purpose is to carry the pollen from the stamens of one flower to the stigma of another. The pollen can usually be recognized as a yellowish or reddish dust formed in the stamens. This dust is generally rubbed off on an insect's proboscis or on another part of its body. When the insect reaches another flower, the pollen is scraped off by a sticky or gummy stigmatic surface. When the pollen has been placed on this surface, it grows, germinates, and part of it unites with the egg cell of the young seed. The latter is then, and not till then, able to become ripe and mature. It may be compared to crossbreeding in animals, though the process does not exactly correspond. But all flowers do not require insects to carry their pollen. In early geological periods, we do not find any flowers like those that now exist, nor in those early times were there any flies, bees, or butterflies. 
The cockroach seems to have existed in Silurian, windstone times, and many gigantic and extraordinary insects lived in those damp forests of ferns, club moss, and horsetails, of which the remains now form our British coal fields. Mayflies, plant bugs, and especially dragonflies, some of them with wings two feet across, existed, but none of these insects were of much use as pollen carriers. Even much later, when screw pines, monkey puzzle trees, ginkgos, and bamboos formed the forests and woods of Europe, crickets and earwigs existed. But it is not until that geological period in which the chalk was formed, the Cretaceous Age, that fossil plants like most of those now familiar to us occur. These had flowers intended for insects, and with the fossil plants we find the fossils of the insects that visited them. Bees, butterflies, and ordinary flies appeared upon the scene just as soon as there were flowers ready for them. Mr. Scudder has even found the fossils of certain plants, and with them the fossils of butterflies closely allied to the present butterflies which now live on present trees allied to those fossils. How, then, was the pollen of the first flowers carried? It was, in all probability, blown by the wind or carried in water. Even now, poplars, alders, birches, and oaks rely chiefly upon the wind to carry their pollen. These plants were among the first of our modern flora to appear upon the earth. Some of them possess very neat contrivances suited to the wind. The catkins of the alder, for example, hang downwards, so that each little male flower is protected from rain by a little scale or bract above it. The pollen is very light, dusty, or powdery, so as to fly a long distance. The Scotch fir, Pinus sylvestris, has male flowers and little cones. These are upright, and the pollen of each stamen drops onto a small hollow on top of the stamen below. It is then blown away by the wind on a fine dry day, but it is not allowed to get out in wet weather. It is said that vast clouds of pine pollen occur in America, and that the water of certain lakes becomes quite yellow and discolored by it at certain seasons. Each little particle of pollen has two minute caps, or air balloons which give it buoyancy, so that it can float easily immense distances. A curious little herb, the wall pellitory, and another foreign species, the artillery plant, produces small explosions of pollen. When it is touched, there is a little puff or cloud of dusty pollen. Even the common nettle does the same on fine dry days when it is in full flower. But of course, this carrying of pollen by the wind is a very expensive arrangement. It is so much a matter of pure chance that a grain arrives at its right destination. Suppose that a flower is giving out clouds of pollen, then the chance of a pollen grain reaching a female flower only five feet away is very small, even if the stigma of the female flower is a quarter of an inch in diameter. The chance of pollen reaching it will only be about 1 to 1440. 1439 pollen grains will be wasted for every one that reaches the stigma. But even this is not quite a fair calculation, for if the female flower is not downwind, none will reach it at all. Footnote. The pollen from the great pine forests of the Italian Alps, blown up to the snow, becomes used in nourishing the pink or red snow algae, which colors it a delicate rose pink. In lower grounds, all such pollen becomes, like leaf mold, a manure for other plants. There is no waste, strictly speaking. End of footnote. But if an insect goes to the catkin of an alder or any other male flower, it will see the red points of the stigma and will very likely go there at once. This shows how much more reasonable and efficient insects will be. The immense majority of flowers are, in fact, purple, blue, red, yellow, or white, so that they are conspicuous and stand clearly out against the green of their leaves. It is well known to all who have arranged flowers for the table that the green of the leaves of different plants varies greatly in its shade and tint. Many greens do not match special flowers at all, but it is the fact that the green of any one plant is always quite harmonious and agrees well with its own flowers. Besides varied and beautiful colors, sweet or strong scents and supplies of honey or nectar are provided for insects. How did flowers manage to produce all these attractions? No one has answered that question. We know in a general sort of way that the parts of flowers are modified leaves, and that petals and stamens become yellowish or pure white because they do not form green coloring matter, like ordinary leaves. It is also known that on the Alps or on any high mountain, where the air is pure and the sun strong, flowers become rich, brilliant, and vivid. 
In such places as the Jardin near Mont Blanc, the pure, deep, rich blue of gentians, the crimsons, reds, and purples of other flowers impress the most casual and unobservant traveller. White and red, yellow and blue, brown and green stand side by side on a hand's breadth of space. In that strong mountain air, also, perfumes are stronger, purer, and of finer quality than in the lowlands. There is a more intense, active, and vigorous life going on in flowers than is required by the more prosaic industries in other parts of a plant. Flowers also often live at a higher temperature than the surrounding air. Kerner has described how the little flowers of soldanella penetrate the snow by actually melting a passage for themselves through it. This high temperature and vigorous life, shown also by the rapid transpiration of flowers, seems to hint that colors and perfumes appear in consequence of rapid chemical transformations. It was, of course, by degrees that the extraordinary variation in color which exists in nature came about. No doubt bees, bumblebees, wasps, and the more intelligent flies were improved and developed aesthetically. We can almost tell by looking at a flower what sort of insect probably visits it. Not only so, but there are the neatest imaginable contrasts and blends of colors. The common bluebeard salvia, e.g., has the uppermost leaves, three-quarters to an inch long, of a deep, rich, blue-purple, which the roving bumblebee will see from a long way off. The bumblebee flies to this great splash of her favorite hue, and for a second buzzes angrily. Then she notes the small, bright blue patches on the upper lips of the small flowers, below the leaves which are set off by white hairs of the upper and yellow hairs of the lower lip. That bees really do understand and are guided by color may be gathered from the following unfortunate accident. A certain hive of bees, which had been brought up in a blue-striped skep, became accidentally scattered. They tried to find their way back to their old home, but many strayed, and it was noticed that they had tried to enter the doors of every blue hive, which were strewn with the bodies of the unfortunate intruders. The rich blue-purple of aconite, the dark, strong red of the woundwort, Stachys sylvatica, are specially beloved by bumblebees and hive bees. Butterflies like any bright color. Those flies which have a long sucking proboscis resemble the bees in their tastes, but all these insects are quite capable of finding out where they can get honey most easily, and visit flowers whatever color they may be. A very strange and wonderful fact is that quite a number of plants prefer the dark, or rather the dim, mysterious light of the gloaming. Then the honeysuckle, the evening campion, the night-scented stock, tobacco, and schizopetalon give out their strongest scent and open out their white flowers as widely as possible. That is because they wish to attract the owlet moth and others which come out at this time, when there are fewer enemies and more security. If you look at any of these moth flowers at midday, they are for the most part closed up. They are not particularly attractive, and they are giving out very little scent. The contrast to their condition in the evening is most striking. Not only insects, but birds are used to carry pollen. The gorgeous little hummingbirds, with their brilliant metallic crimson, bronze green, and purple, are of the greatest importance in the New World. In the Old World, they are replaced by the tiny nectarinidae or sunbirds, with breastplates almost as exquisitely jeweled. They prefer the most gorgeous reds and scarlets, such as that of Salvia horminum, Lobelia cardinalis, and the like. Fuchsias are regularly visited by them in Tierra del Fuego, where sometimes they may be seen busily at work during a shower of snow. In South Africa, they seize the stem of a red-hot poker, Tritoma, Nifophia macawani, and twisting their little heads round, they suck the honey from every blossom in succession. Still more interesting it is to see them perched on the edge of one of those great tumbler-like heads of Protea, e.g. P. incompta, and dipping their slender curved beaks repeatedly into the flowers. Then the little male bird will alight on a branch and make the most elaborate preparation for a song of triumph. Although helped out by fluttering of wings and much display of feathers and tail, the song is a very faint cheep of the feeblest description and very difficult to hear. Not only birds, but even animals are sometimes called into the service. There is a group of small mammals which live on the honey of flowers. Even the kangaroo is said to occasionally take a draft of nectar from some of the cup-like flowers of the Australian dryanda, Pertaceae. But one of the most interesting and extraordinary facts is the manner in which flowers fit in. They begin early in the morning, one blossom opens out and then another, all endeavoring to catch the attention of some passing insect. 
Alionia violacea opens at 3 or 4 a.m. and closes about 11 or 12. Some wild roses open about 4 or 5 in the morning, as well as the chicory, romaria, etc. Virginian spiderwort, dandelion, and nightshade are ready at 6 in the morning. A great many, buttercups, whitewater lily, etc., are open by 7 a.m. Most of these early flowers are shut at noon. Others begin to close about 3 or 4 in the afternoon. The regular evening moth flowers open about 6 p.m., though Cactus grandiflorus does not open till 9 or 10 p.m. and closes at midnight. Extraordinary as these variations seem, they are easily explained. Some open early because there are then few competitors. By far, the greater numbers are open from 9 a.m. till 1 or 2 p.m., because those hours are the favorite working time of most insects. Flowers live for very different periods. That of the wheat only lasts for 15 or 20 minutes. Its pollen is carried by wind, and is then over. There are others, hibiscus and calendrinia, which only remain open for three or four hours, but a foxglove will last six days, a cyclamen ten days, whilst orchids may last for from 30 to 80 days, cypripedium velosum 70 days, odontoglossum rossi 80 days. Thus the sun every day through the summer, as he calls into life new swarms of insects, sees at every hour of the day new flowers opening their petals to his genial warmth and ready for the new bees and flies. The development of the flower and that of its insect are probably simultaneous and equally regulated by the sun's warmth. Moreover, the opening periods do not merely fit in during the day, but each flower has its own special month. And even in Scotland, there is no month in which some flower may not be found in bloom. Any stray wandering insect can get its draft of honey at any season of the year. This is a matter of some importance for those who keep bees, and the following list may be of some use. February. Crocus vernus, snowdrop, black hellebore, and hazel. March. The preceding. Arabis alpina, bulbocodium, cornus mascula, helleborus fetidus, giant coltsfoot, gooseberry, various species of prunus and pyrus, willow. April. The preceding, as well as Adonis vernalis, Barbaria vulgaris, Brassica napis. It is not worthwhile noting those that bloom from May to September, for there are hundreds of good bee flowers in these months. In October, Borage, Echium, Sunflowers, Lyceum europaeum, Malope grandiflora, Catmint, Tobacco, Ossimum, Oreganum, Vachilia tanacetifolia, and others. Most of these last into November. In December and January, very few plants are in bloom. The following have been noted at Edinburgh Botanical Gardens. Dondia epipactis, Tussilago fragrans, Snowdrop, Gaeum aureum, Hepatica, Primula acaulis, P. veris, Albrietia deltoidea, Crocus imperati, C. suaveolens, Erica herbacea alba, Helleborus, three species, Polygala chamiboxis, Andromeda floribunda. Also, Sir H. Maxwell mentions Azara integrifolia, Hamamelis arborea, and Chimonanthus fragrance. Of wild plants, chickweed, whin or furs, Lamium purpureum, and dandelion can generally be found in the depth of winter. The contrivances which can be found in flowers, and by which the insect is forced to enter exactly along the proper path, are endless. Each flower has some little peculiarity of its own which can only be understood by thoroughly examining the plant itself. It is not therefore possible to do justice to the ingenuity of flowers in a work of this sort. There are orchids which throw their insect visitors into a bath of water, so that they have to crawl with wet wings up a certain path where they touch the pollen masses and stigma, others which hurl their pollen masses at the visitor. In the Asclepiads, a groove is provided into which the leg of the insect slips, so that it has to struggle to get its foot out and must carry off the pollen masses, though it often fails and leaves its leg behind. Some arums and aristolochias have large traps in which they imprison the insects and only let them go when they are sure to be pollen dusted. In one of these flowers, there are transparent spots on the large petal prison, which so attract the insects that they remain opposite them instead of flying out, just as flies do on a window pane. Salvia has a stamen, which is like a seesaw on a support. The bee has to lift up one end, which brings the other with its pollen flat down onto its back. 
The barbary has a sensitive spot on its stamen. When the insect touches the spot, the stamen springs up suddenly and showers pollen upon it. In mimulus, the two flaps of the stigma close up as soon as they are touched, which will be when they have scraped off any pollen. Then, when the creature withdraws, covered with the flower's own pollen, none of this can be left on its own stigma, as this is shut up. But instead of reading, one should watch a bumblebee visiting the foxglove flowers. The sight of her busily thrusting her great hairy body into the bell, which almost exactly fits her shape, while she gurgles with satisfaction, will teach the reader far more about the romance of flowers than many pages of description. If he then carefully examines the flower, he will see how the honey, the arched converging stamens, and the style are placed exactly in the right place and where they will have the most effect. One orchid, and Gracum sesquipedilae, has a spur 18 inches long, and the great Darwin suggested that there must be an insect somewhere with a tube long enough to reach the honey. Such an insect, a large moth, was actually brought home from Madagascar, the place where this orchid occurs, after a lapse of many years. Perhaps more remarkable than anything else are such cases as the yucca and the yucca moth, or the fig wasp and the fig. The yucca is a fine, lily-like plant resembling the aloes in general appearance. A particular sort of moth lives entirely upon the yucca. When the flowers open, the mother moth kneads up a ball of pollen and places an egg inside. This ball she thrusts down the style into the ovary of the flower. There, a grub develops from the egg and eats the pollen. Yet some of this pollen fertilizes the young seeds. If yuccas died out, the moth would be exterminated. If the moths were destroyed, no yuccas would ever set their seed. The fig has two sorts of flower. The one, capra fig, produces only male or pollen-yielding flowers. The other is the true edible fig. Inside the capra fig are the grubs of the fig wasp, which rejoice in the name of Blastophagia grossorum. When grown up, these force their way out of the capra fig, and flying to the true fig, the mother wasp lays her eggs in certain flowers, which have been apparently specially modified for the purpose. At the same time, she covers the ordinary flowers with pollen from the capra fig. Her progeny return to the capra fig. Here again, the future of a valuable fruit tree is absolutely bound up with the fortunes of a tiny and in no way attractive wasp. Another very remarkable case is that of those flowers, stapelia, etc., which in color and general marking closely resemble decaying meat or other objectionable substances. Very often, the smell of such flowers is exceedingly strong and resembles the ordinary smell of putrid matter. In one case, an artist employed to paint the flower had to use a glass bell, which was put over it. He could only lift it for a second or two at intervals in order to see the exact color, before the horrible odor obliged him to cover it over again. Blowflies and others, which are in the habit of resorting to such substances, seek out these flowers in great numbers and lay their eggs upon them. In so doing, they carry the pollen. There are certain fungi which have quite as horrible a smell and some of them also resemble decaying animal matter. These are most eagerly sought out by the same blow and other flies, bright green lucilias, yellow-brown scatophagas, blue bottles, etc. But in the case of these fungi, it is the spores, not pollen, which is carried by the insect. The effect of this flowery sort of life is abundantly evident in the structure of the insects themselves. Their mouth has been most wonderfully modified into a complex sucking apparatus. Their legs have been transformed to act as pollen-carrying baskets, and the habits and tastes of the insects have been modified in the most extraordinary way. Perhaps also the association of bright colors with a very pleasant sensation, that of a full, satisfying meal, has raised the artistic sensibilities of butterflies, sunbirds, hummingbirds, etc. For certainly these flower-haunting birds and butterflies are remarkable for their brilliant coloring. This has probably been brought about by the preference of the females for the most brilliantly colored male butterflies and hummingbirds. At any rate, bright reds and blues are common to both bird or insect and to the flowers that they frequent. But the most curious point of this whole question lies in the fact that human beings of all grades, South Sea Islanders, the ancient Greeks, Peruvians, Japanese, Romans, as well as the Parisians and Londoners of today, appreciate the beauty of coloring and grace of form which are so obvious in the world of flowers. Yet man has had nothing whatever to do with the selection of either these colors or shapes. 
many of those which he considers most precious, such as the weird, spotted, and outlandish orchids of Madagascar and South America, have very likely scarcely ever been seen by man at all. It is to the artistic eye of the honeybee, bumblebee, butterfly, and of the hummingbird and sunbird that we owe these exquisite colors. The grace and beauty of outline probably depend upon their perfect symmetry and on the perfect suitability of every curve to its purpose. Therefore, it seems that the eyes of man, whether savage or civilized, are pleased and comforted by these same colors that delight the little brains of insects and birds. This is indeed a mysterious fact. End of chapter 5 Recording by Colleen McMahon Chapter 6 of The Romance of Plant Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Elliott Chapter 6 On Underground Life Mother Earth Quarries and Chalk Pits Wandering Atoms The Soil or Dirt Populations of worms, birds, germs. Fairy rings. Roots miles long. How roots find their way. How they do the right thing and seek only what is good for them. Root versus stones. Roots which haul bulbs about. Bishop's weed. Wild garlic. Dandelion. Plantain. Solomon's seal. Roots throwing down walls. Strength of a seedling root. The word atom means red earth. Poets and essayists still regularly write about Mother Earth, and in so doing, admit one of the most interesting and wonderful facts in nature. If you go to some quarry or cliff where a section has been cut, laying bare the original rock below, then, with Hugh Miller, you may reflect on the extraordinary value of those few inches of soil which support the growth of all our trees and all of our cultivated plants. It is probable that plant roots never go deeper than about 30 feet. All our food, our energy, and activity depend, therefore, on this thinnest surface layer of an earth which is 8,000 miles in diameter. But in most places, the depth of true soil is far less than 30 feet. Generally, it is not more than 30 inches, and by far the most valuable part of it is a very thin layer, 5 or 6 inches thick. It is in this true soil that the roots gain their nourishment. And not only roots, for whole populations of worms, of germs, of insects, even of birds and the higher animals, live upon it. To it return the dead leaves, the bodies of dead insects, and waste products of all kinds. Within it, they are broken to pieces and worked up again by the roots of other plants in order to form new leaves, new insects, and food for bird and beast. Just as an engine works, you may see old engines, wheels, and scrap iron being smashed into pieces. They are melted down and again worked up into engines of some improved design. On a chalk cliff, which dates from the long-distant Cretaceous period, the entire thickness formed by the yearly work of plants for millions and millions of years is often less than a foot in depth, and probably only four to five inches are true soil. But this is an exceptionally thin stratum, although it is capable of producing rich turf, fat snails, and excellent mutton. In peat mosses and in those buried forests which form the coal fields, vegetable matter may accumulate in deposits of 30 feet of coal. Yet these stores of carbonaceous matter seem to be at first sight miserly and selfish, at least from a vegetable point of view. They resemble the gold and silver withdrawn from circulation in the world by some Hindu miser and buried deep within the earth. Yet somebody is pretty certain to find out and make use of such stores eventually. In the case of the peat and coal fields, an animal of sufficient intelligence to utilize them has already been produced, and now they are used by man as fuel. It is very important to remember that the soil is a sort of last home to which the particles of carbon, of nitrate, and minerals always return after their wanderings in the bodies of plants, of insects, or of other animals. They probably rest but a short time before they again set off on new adventures. One might say the same of the water and of the carbonic acid gas and oxygen of the atmosphere, for the water falling as rain upon the earth trickles down to the underground water level. Then it immediately begins to rise up between the particles of earth and is promptly caught and sucked in by the roots, only to be again given out by their leaves. 
The carbonic acid gas and oxygen also are always entering and leaving the foliage. Even the nitrogen of the air is not left alone in the atmosphere. There are small germs in the soil which are able to get hold of it and make it into valuable nitrates. More curious still is the fact that electric charges can be used to change the comparatively useless air nitrogen into useful manures. Probably the farmer will someday make his own nitrates by electricity. The structure of the soil or earth is a most interesting and romantic part of botany. It is true that a radical disposition is necessary if one is to go to the root of the matter, but unless we do this, it is impossible to realize the romance of roots. Down below is the unaltered rock, sand, or clay. Next above it comes the subsoil, which consists of fragments of the rock below, or of sand, clay, etc., more or less altered by deep-going roots. Even in this subsoil, bacteria or germs may be at work, and the burrows of worms and insects often extend to it. Next above the subsoil comes the true soil. There is plenty of the stones, soil, sand, or whatever it may be that constitutes the subsoil, but its richness consists in its contents of valuable minerals and especially of broken up leaves, corpses of insects, and manure. Above this true soil, our first leaf mold of two years ago, then that of the year before last, and on the top is the leaf mold and other decayed products of last winter. All these upper layers are full of life and activity, which probably goes on vigorously all the year round. The population of worms is especially important. The worm is a voracious and gluttonous creature. It is forever swallowing bits of leaves and rich soil. Inside its body there are lime glands which act upon the vegetable food and improve its quality as manure. The worm comes up to the surface at night or early morning and leaves the worm casts upon it. The rain then washes the rich, finely divided matter of the cast down into the soil again. It is said that there are about 160,000 worms at work in an acre of good soil. Yet their life is full of danger. A keen-eyed population of blackbirds, thrushes, starlings, peewits, plover, and partridges are always watching for and preying upon the poor worm. Even in his burrows, which may be six feet deep, he is not safe, for the mole, moody warp, is also both very hungry and very active, and delights in eating him. In the soil also, and even deeper in the subsoil, are many insects. Some hibernate in the winter, and at other times actively gnaw the roots of plants or devour dead leaves and twigs. Thus, there are many burrows and holes, so that there is no want of air in the soil, which is indeed necessary both for these creatures and also for the roots of the plants. Rain comes down through the soil, carrying with it carbonic acid, mineral salts, and also germs or bacteria which form perhaps the most important population of all. No work could be carried on without their help. It is bacteria which, at every stage of decay, assist in breaking up leaves, twigs, insects' bodies, worm casts, and other manures. The way in which they work is too difficult to explain here, but to get an idea of the romance of the underground world, one must try to picture to oneself these swarms and myriads of germs and bacteria, all incessantly and busily engaged at their several duties. In the uppermost layers, there are probably, in a single cubic inch of good soil, from 54 million to 400 million of these microbes. Many are absolutely necessary to the harvest. A few may be of little importance, but there are sure to be some of those dangerous sorts, which might devastate a continent with disease in a single summer. There are also quantities of other fungi. The fairy rings, which one sees year after year in widening circles of bright, fresh green, are the work, not of fairy footsteps, but of an underground fungus, Marasmius oreades and others. Its threads are thin, white, and delicate. They attack the roots of grasses, etc., on the outer side of the ring. It is therefore on this outer side yellow, dry, and more or less withered. On the inner side, however, the grass is luxuriant and of a rich, bright green. Here the fungus has died off, and its remains, as well as those of the plants which it destroyed, form a rich manure for the new grass following on its track. Every year the ring widens. At a certain time in summer, one sees the irregular line of mushroom-like fungi which are formed by the destructive underground absorbing threads. This, however, is but one of the underground fungi. There are many kinds, some are useful, others are very destructive. 
Upon the upper surface of the soil there falls not only rain, but another sort of rain consisting of seeds, dead leaves, insects bodies, fungus spores, bacteria, and dust. Every year when the plowman turns the sod, there is a revolution in the whole of these populations. So far nothing has been said about the roots themselves, which penetrate, explore, and exploit all these layers of dead leaves, soil, and subsoil. The length of roots produced is very much greater than anyone would suppose. A one-year-old Scotch fir seedling, when grown in sand, produces in a season a total length, branches, etc., of no less than 36 feet of root. The total surface of this root system was estimated to be about 23 square inches. This little Scotch fir, after six months' growth, was laying under contribution a cone of earth 20 to 30 inches deep and with a surface of 222 square inches. In certain kinds of corn, the same author estimated the total length of the roots as from 1,500 to 1,800 feet. S. Clark estimated the length of the roots for a large cucumber plant as amounting to 25,000 yards, 15 miles, and made out that it was occupying a whole cubic yard of ground. Clover roots are said to go down to depths of six or nine feet, but many weeds go deeper still. Coltsfoot, for instance, may be found, according to a friend of mine, living at a depth of 20 spades. In Egypt and other places, the roots of acacias go down to 20 feet or even further so that they can tap the water supplies which are at a great depth. But a still more extraordinary fact is the manner in which the root branches arrange to grow in such a way that they search every part of the soil. The main root in many plants grows straight down, or as nearly as it can do so. Its branches are inclined downwards at a quite definite angle, which is often 30 to 45 degrees to the surface. Moreover, these branches come off in quite a regular way. Each keeps growing in its own special direction, to the east, southeast, or west, or whatever it may be of its parent root. Have they some extraordinary sense of the direction of the points of the compass? It is said that if a side root, which is growing, say, for instance, downwards and westwards, is turned in some other direction, it will, after a time, resume its original westerly voyage. This fact is a most extraordinary one, if true, but it can scarcely be said that it has been proved, and as will be shown later, there are other curious facts in the behavior of roots which might explain the experiment without assuming that roots know the points of the compass. If one cuts a branch of willow and plants it upside down in the earth, it will very likely take root and grow. Its appearance will be most extraordinary, for the roots will grow downwards, whilst the branches, instead of growing in the direction of the old branches, turn round and grow upwards. Why do roots generally grow downwards? The fact is so familiar that the difficulty of answering does not, at first sight, seem so great as it really is. Pfeffer, the great physiologist, has the following interesting comparison. Suppose a man is trying to find his way in the dark, then a single lingering ray of light gives him an impulse to walk towards it. So our root, also in the dark, feels the pull of gravity and endeavors to grow downwards. Others have compared the direction of gravity to the sailor's compass and suppose that the root is guided in the same sort of way. But a young, vigorous root, making or forcing its way in darkness through stones and heavy earth, is a most interesting and fascinating study. There are the most extraordinary coincidences in its behavior. It has the property of always doing exactly the right thing in any emergency. It is, of course, intended to keep below the ground and in the dark. So we find that if roots are uncovered, they will turn away from the light and burrow into the earth again. They avoid light just as a worm would do. Roots are, of course, intended to absorb or suck in water. If there is a drain in the soil or a place where water collects, the roots will grow towards that place. Very often they form a dense, spongy mass of fibers, which may almost choke the drain. Along a riverside, one can often find great fibrous masses of tree roots near the water. But how does the root learn that the water is there and turn away from its original track to find it? It certainly does so. Then again, Herr Lilienfeld has recently shown that roots seem able to turn away from poisonous materials in the soil and to seek out and grow towards valuable and nutritious substances. He found that peas, beans, sunflower, and other roots were very sensitive to different substances in the soil and were directly attracted by what was good for them and turned aside from what was unwholesome. This property and the power of growing towards water 
probably explain the mysterious sense of direction alluded to above, for roots will take a line which has not been exhausted by their neighbors. But of all these wonderful properties, the most remarkable is the way in which roots find their way past stones and other obstacles in the soil. They insinuate themselves into winding cracks and crawl round stones with an ingenuity that makes one wonder if they can possibly be without some sort of intelligence. It is the very tip or end of the young root that seems to be responsible, for if, in the course of its journeyings underground, it should strike a stone or something hard, the root does not grow on and flatten itself. But some sort of message is sent back from the tip to the growing part which is a short distance behind it. After this message has been received, the growing part begins to curve sideways, so that the tip is brought clear of the obstacle and can probably proceed triumphantly upon its way. The inexplicable part is that the growing part which curves has never been touched at all, but simply answers to the message from the tip. Footnote. If the growing part itself touches a stone, it curves round the stone, not away from it, the reverse of the reaction at the tip. End of footnote. This is perhaps the most reasonable and intelligent behavior found in the whole vegetable world, and it is not surprising that Darwin compared the root tip to a brain. These extraordinary responses fill one with astonishment, but there are others still more interesting and remarkable. It will be remembered that we have already shown how different the soil is at different levels. The subsoil, soil, and uppermost layers are all quite different from one another. This may explain why it is that many plants seem to prefer to develop their roots at one particular depth below the surface. Not only so, but they find their own favorite level in the most persevering way. If, for instance, you sow a barley corn at too great a depth, the seed germinates and forms a few roots, but it immediately sends out a stem which grows upward toward the light. As soon as the stem has reached the proper place, which is just below the surface, there is an enormous development of roots which begin to search and explore their favorite stratum of soil. In some few cases, one can see in a dim sort of way the reason for the level which certain plants prefer. Thus, the underground stems of the common thistle, which are very long and fleshy, are found just a few inches below the level usually reached by plow or spade. This makes it very difficult to tear them out. Even if grubbers with long spikes which reach as deep as those buried stems are driven through the ground, it generally happens that the stems are only cut in pieces and not dragged up. These hardy weeds are not much injured by little accidents of this kind, for each separate bit will form upright thistle stems next year. In fact, if one cuts this fleshy subterranean runner of the thistle into pieces a quarter of an inch long, each piece will probably become a thistle. Sometimes, indeed, these weeds are carried from one field to another by pieces of them sticking in the very machines which are used to eradicate them. The bishop's weed is one of the hardest cases. The writer was once ambitious enough to try to dig up an entire plant of this horrid weed. The first foot or so revealed no sign of the end of the branching runners, and it was not until a hole about four feet deep and five feet across had been excavated that there was any sign of an end to the plant. When it was at last removed, the original deeply buried stem was found to give off branches, which again branched in a most complicated manner, until almost every green shoot of bishop's weed within a space six feet in diameter was seen to be really a branch of this one original plant. So to eradicate the plant, it would have been necessary to dig over the whole garden to a depth of at least five or six feet. Footnote. This weed is a cure for gout and seems to have been called bishop's weed because it was supposed that gout was a common ailment of bishops. End of footnote. How did the stem get down to such a depth below the surface? This is one of the most curious stories in plant life, and the process which we shall now try to describe has only been explained within the last few years. The seed of the wild garlic, Allium ursinum, lies at first upon the surface of the ground, but it is soon buried by a growth of the stalk of the seed leaf, which pushes the germ down below the earth. As soon as it is buried, roots are formed and pass obliquely downwards, where they become fixed by forming root hairs all round themselves. These root hairs round every root hold its tip firmly in the earth. Then these same roots contract or shorten, which of course hauls down the root a little deeper in the earth. One might compare it to a few men hauling down a balloon by ropes attached to the car. 
About September to November, roots of quite a different character are formed. These explore the surrounding soil and gather in food and moisture. Then the roots rest during the winter, when the buds and young leaves are being formed. In April, the buds begin to push out their leaves and a new ring of roots appear. These April roots are quite different from the September ones. They again fix themselves firmly and then contract, becoming fully a third shorter than they were originally. The bulb is dragged down still deeper below the surface. It flowers in May and fruits in June and July. Then, in September, the same series of operations begins again. The process goes on until the plant is three to five inches below the ground. It follows from all this that every year the roots find new ground to explore and utilize. Nor is the wild garlic at all exceptional in this respect. A great many plants have roots which contract and drag the bulb or stem after them deeper into the earth. Something of the same sort happens, for example, to bramble bushes. They arch or droop over when growing so that the end touches the earth. On the underside of the tip, as soon as it begins to rest on the ground, roots are formed. These roots make their way into the ground, and then when fixed, they shorten or contract so that the end of the branch is dragged down to a depth of several inches. After this has happened, the old branch generally dies away, and a young, vigorous bramble develops from its buried tip. Raspberry branches also are often buried. Their roots become coiled or rolled in a very curious manner. The end of the root becomes firmly attached in the soil, and then the rest of it revolves like a tendril so as to draw the stem deeper into the earth. On any ordinary roadside in the country, one is sure to find the rosettes of the common dandelion and of the rat's tail plantain, Plantago major. These are two of the most interesting plants in the world, though they are vulgarly common. How is it that their leaves are always at the level of the ground? The stem is always growing upwards. Every year, fresh circles of leaves are formed above the older ones. Yet the crown of the stem is never so much raised above the ground that the toe of a boot would be likely to knock it off. It is always kept so deep in the earth that it is by no means easy to kick or hulk the crown out of the ground. The dandelion root contracts very strongly at the end of the season and by this shortening or contraction keeps its leaves just at the soil level. The plantain sends out about 40 to 60 oblique downward growing roots, which fix themselves in the soil by throwing out branch roots. These 40 to 60 roots are at first about 10 inches long, but as soon as they are firmly attached they contract and pull the stem with its crown of leaves about one third of an inch deeper. This is just enough to keep the leaves flat on the ground and to prevent any possible injury from passers-by. So that in finding their favorite level in the soil, plants are often pulled or hauled about by the roots. But they are not always moved by the roots. Even though buried in darkness, they seem able in some way to tell when they are in the most favorable position. Every gardener knows that autumn crocus and other bulbs do not remain in the same position. They wander below the ground in a curious and inexplicable fashion. The Solomon seal has an underground fleshy stem, which prefers to grow at a definite depth. If it is planted close to the surface, then the point of the next year's little fleshy bud turns downward. Next year it again turns downward, and so on every year until the stem has reached its proper depth. Then it grows horizontally. Similarly, if it is planted too deep, it grows upwards. Thus, if one wishes to realize the underground life of plants, one must picture to oneself, one, the usual descending roots whose system of branching may be compared to the ordinary branching above ground. It is often not unlike the reflection in water of the tree itself, such as one might see on a fine winter's day along the shore of some still lake. Two, the bold, exploring, horizontal runners of couch grass, thistle, bishop's weed, etc., vigorously pushing their way at a depth too great for the gardener's spade. Three, all sorts of bulbs, runners, and roots being slowly hauled or dragged about till they get into exactly the right position, but never remaining for two years in exactly the same place. All have their favorite depth. Air Paris, two thirds to one and three quarters inches deep. Solomon seal, one and one third to two and one third inches deep. Cuckoo pint, arum maculatum, two to four inches deep. Colchicum, autumn crocus, three and a third to five and a third inches deep. Asparagus, six and three eighth to thirteen and one eighth inches deep. 
The water evaporating on the surface of the soil must, as it rises from the permanent water level below, pass the gauntlet of all these thirsty rootlets and their hairs. Tree roots will be ready to intercept it at ten feet depth. Many herbaceous plants will suck it up at depths of five to six feet, and in the upper layers of soil it will have to pass root system after root system from asparagus to paris, so that very little will be lost. Perhaps of more importance are the bacteria germs and dissolved mineral salts in the rainwater as it trickles down from the surface. The soil particle acts as a filter. At every inch of the descent, some of the bacteria and salts will be left, so that by the time the level of asparagus has been reached, there will be exceedingly few, and the water is comparatively speaking pure. The effect of this vigorous underground life is often visible on the surface. Roots, and particularly tree roots, are often extraordinarily strong. Kerner, in his invaluable Natural History of Plants, has a beautiful picture of a young larch tree, which had grown in a fissure of a huge boulder. In attempting to grow, the root had forced up part of this stone. It was estimated that it had lifted a weight of 3,000 pounds, though it was only some 10 inches in diameter. Along a dry stone wall, or even near houses, the growth of tree roots very often damages the entire wall, which may be entirely overthrown if the tree is too near. The force of the growth of the roots is so great that even a six-foot stone wall cannot keep them down. Quite a young seedling root, in forcing itself through the soil, may exercise a pressure of two-thirds to four-fifths of a pound. This is, of course, necessary if one remembers that it has to drive itself through the earth, pushing aside and compressing the earth particles along its course. End of chapter 6. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 7 of The Romance of Plant Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Eliot. Chapter 7. High Mountains, Arctic Snows. The Life of a Cherry Tree. Cherries in March. Flowering of Gorse. Chickweed's Descendants. Forest Fires in Africa. Spring passing from Italy to the frozen north. Life in the Arctic. Dwarfs. Snow-melting soldanellas. Highland Arctic alpine plants. Their history. Arctic Britain. Edelweiss. An alpine garden. It is impossible to understand, and very difficult to explain, the sort of life and consciousness which is enjoyed by plants. That they do live is obvious. We know instinctively that they enjoy fine weather in summer and gentle showers in spring, but we cannot prove it. Much of a plant's life is concealed and hidden from us. Even the few explanations which have been given by certain observers are by no means generally accepted. This is true even as regards the case of the cherry tree, which has been experimented with and fought over and argued about by botanists, and yet we only know a very little about its inner life. When the leaves fall in autumn, next season's buds are already formed and are then about one-eighth of their full size. At this time, the tree contains enormous quantities of food stores, for the whole season's work of the leaves has been accumulating until this moment. During the long winter's sleep, the tree is by no means at rest. It is arranging and packing up those stores in the safest place and in the most convenient form. Just as a bear, before it retires to sleep during the winter, takes care to get as fat as possible, so the cherry turns its starch to fat and stores it away in the innermost and least exposed parts of the tree that is in the central wood. As soon as the winter ends, and indeed before it has ended, preparations are beginning for the great moment of the year. For weeks there is a slow, gradual, almost imperceptible growth of the buds. Then they develop with a rush, and in six to ten days 
double or treble their weight. Then comes the supreme moment, for the flower buds suddenly burst open, and the cherry is in active and vigorous bloom, and covered all over with exquisite blossoms. All last year's fats and starches are rapidly used up. Very soon the young leaves are beginning to make sugar and other food, which give some help during the ripening of the fruit. The flowers are actively at work. One of our usual misconceptions as to the nature of a flower is that it is an emblem of peace, of restful enjoyment, of serene contemplation of its own beauty. That is very far from being the truth. The petals are actively, vigorously working. If one could take the pulse of a petal, which shows the rapidity of its breathing, one would find that it is twice as fast as that of the leaf. The work of changing water into vapor and pouring it out goes on three times as quickly in the petals as compared with the leaves. Moreover, their temperature is higher and often distinctly above that of the atmosphere. This feverish activity of the flowers themselves is matched by the hurrying crowds of excited and exhilarated insects which are searching every blossom. No wonder that the Japanese Prime Minister, in the midst of their great and famous war, invited the whole cabinet to spend an afternoon watching the cherry trees in bloom. From the blossom of the springtime all through summer and autumn follows one continuous spell of hard work. Day after day, an endless stream of food is entering the stem. Night after night, it is condensed and arranged and repacked, until, when the leaves fall, the period of slow and quiet preparation begins again. Under certain conditions, it is possible for gardeners to modify the life of a cherry and to make it bloom much earlier, but this is only possible within well-defined limits. It is no use trying to force it to bloom before January. It must have a quiet time after summer. But by beginning in January, and by very carefully managing the temperature, it can be made to produce fruit quite early in the year. The following account is given to show how very carefully gardeners have to work when they upset the ordinary course of nature's events. The plant is taken into a greenhouse, and the temperature kept as follows. First week, day temperature 48 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, night temperature 41 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Second week, day temperature 50 to 53 degrees Fahrenheit, night temperature 45 to 48 degrees Fahrenheit. Third week, day temperature 53 to 59 degrees Fahrenheit, night temperature 48 to 51 degrees Fahrenheit. Till flowering, day temperature 59 to 64 degrees Fahrenheit, night temperature 51 to 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Flowering period, day temperature 46 to 53 degrees Fahrenheit, night temperature 43 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. After flowering, day temperature 59 to 64 degrees Fahrenheit, night temperature 51 to 57 degrees Fahrenheit. During development of stone, day temperature 53 to 59 degrees Fahrenheit, night temperature 48 to 51 degrees Fahrenheit. After development of stone, day temperature 61 to 66 degrees Fahrenheit, night temperature 53 to 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Ripening of fruit, day temperature 68 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, night temperature 59 to 63 degrees Fahrenheit. Not merely strong forcing heat, but a little judicious cold is necessary to get out the flowers and to ripen the fruit. Most flowers have very much the same general history as the cherry, but it must not be supposed that they are all alike. The differences are very interesting and curious. Thus, for example, plants of our common gorse, firs, or whin may be found in bloom at almost every season of the year. 
there are at least four seasons when there is that tremendous display of golden blossom which made the great Linnaeus fall on his knees and burst into tears. These are about the 22nd March, 24th May, 15th August, and 21st November. Yet there are enough odd flowers blooming in almost every month to give some cause for the saying, the gorse is out of bloom when kissing is out of favor. The last practice, though uncleanly and dangerous, not only on general grounds, but on account of bacterial germs which may be transferred, has been authoritatively condemned in the United States, but it is still more or less popular in other countries at all seasons. The chickweed and some other of our annual weeds show a hardy disregard of climate. Its seeds germinate and grow at any time, so that flowers and seeds can be formed whenever there is a spell of favorable weather. Now one chickweed can produce 3,000 seeds. Suppose that there are only five generations in the year, which is a very low estimate. Then one seed of chickweed might produce 3,000 times 3,000 times 3,000 times 3,000 individuals in one season. Other plants show much the same tendency. In fine warm autumns, a great many annuals bloom a second time. It is on record that 44 spring species bloomed in one warm November. At the Cape and in other warm climates, many of our annuals do not die at the end of autumn, but go on growing. They become perennial. It is even possible to make a tree mignonette by pinching off the flower buds, though this plant is usually an annual. In fact, plants are not absolutely confined to one rigid scheme, but they can alter and modify their blooming time if they find it convenient to do so. In the Mediterranean, some blossom in early spring and others in late autumn, whilst in the dry, hot, and dusty summer very few flower. In Central Africa, during the dry season, forest fires are by no means rare. The trees are scattered, and the ground is only covered by dried and withered grasses and sedges. One sees in the distance a rolling cloud of smoke, and soon one comes to a line of flame. It is not dangerous, not even very impressive, for a jump of three feet carries you over the flame and on to a desolate wilderness of black cinders, out of which stand up the scorched trunks and half-burnt branches of gaunt, naked trees. A day or two afterwards, bright blue and white and yellow flowers break out of those scorched branches and also from the ground. It is difficult to understand why this happens, but certainly it is good for the flowers, which can be seen by insects from a long distance. But these are unusual cases. Generally, the warm breath of spring wakes up the bulbs and buds, and one after another has its moment of flowering. Spring travels towards the North Pole at an average rate of four miles a day. A pedestrian visiting Italy in the end of January might follow the spring northwards, and if he wished to accompany it all the way, it would be quite possible to do so without exceeding an ordinary day's march. He would have to reach North Germany by the end of March, Sweden in May, and by the end of June and July would find spring beginning in the desolate Arctic regions. Of course, the presence of mountains would make this tour a little difficult and devious, but still it is quite a possible undertaking. It would be very interesting, for he would be able to watch the cold and frost and chilliness of winter disappearing as the sun's rays thaw out a greater and greater extent of the cold and frozen north. The life of an arctic plant is truly set in the midst of many and great dangers. For 250 days, the ground is hard frozen and the temperature never above the freezing point. About the end of May, it begins to rise a little, but the plant has to crowd the whole of its life, its flowers, fruits, and seeds, into the space of two months. About the 23rd to the 29th June, the first flower appears. 
then follows strong active growth in uninterrupted sunshine during july and august the flowers are brilliant in color and richly produced the tiny dwarf arctic plants are covered all over with blue or golden yellow or white blossoms all is in full activity and luxuriance then suddenly in a night the icy grasp of winter falls upon them hard frozen flowers buds and ripening fruits remain chilled and incapable of life from the thirtieth august until the end of may of course under such conditions these hardy and vigorous little plants cannot become trees or shrubs to show the effect of the climate upon them a few british plants which are also arctic may be compared matweed matricaria inodora in great britain six inches to one foot high in the arctic regions two inches goldenrod solidago virgoria in great britain one to two feet in the arctic regions three to four inches red rattle pedicularis palustris in great britain six inches to one foot in the arctic regions two to three inches mugwort artemisia vulgaris in great britain two to four feet in the arctic regions four to five inches willow herb epilobium palustris in great britain one to two feet in the arctic regions two inches grass of parnassus parnassia palustris in great britain six inches to one foot in the arctic regions one inch these wretched little dwarfs seem however to have pretty long lives and as we have said deck themselves in the most gaudy colors every summer in the alps of switzerland and other temperate countries the flowering season is also a very short one and soon over it is often not more than six weeks yet in that short time the rich blue of the gentian the alpine roses soldanellas campanulas and many others make some of these grass slopes high up in the mountains a perfect garden of loveliness sometimes in passing over the snowfields of switzerland just before spring one notices the pretty violet flowers of the soldanella swaying to and fro in the wind above the unmelted snow one does occasionally see in this country the snowdrop in the midst of snow but then it has fallen after the snowdrop had blossomed the alpine soldanella flowers whilst the earth is still covered it begins as soon as the ground below the snow is thawed each little developing flower stalk melts out a grotto in the snow above itself and so bores thawing its way up into the air above it has already been mentioned that inside a flower the temperature is often higher than the surrounding air it is this higher temperature of the flower which thaws a little dome or grotto in the snow above the head of the flower when a flock of sheep are covered by a snowdrift a similar hollow is formed above them by their breath and the high temperature of their bodies they often seem indeed to be little or none the worse for being buried the soldanella melts its way in just the same manner in this country we have no such magnificent chain of mountains as the alps and yet we find on the scotch and welsh mountains quite a number of real alpines there are for instance such flowers as sea pink armeria sea plantain plantago maritima scurvy grass and others which can be found on windy desolate gullies and quarries high up on the highland hills and which also occur on the seacoast but never between the seashore and the tops of the mountains you might search every field every moor and every riverside throughout the country but you would not discover those three plants anywhere between the seashore and the summits at first sight it seems quite impossible to explain why this should be the case 
but all those three plants are found in the Arctic regions, and the explanation is, in reality, quite simple. At one time, the shores of England and Scotland formed part of the Arctic regions. Ice and snow covered the hills and mountains. Huge glaciers occupied the valleys and flowed over the lowlands, plastering the low grounds with clay, which they dragged underneath them, and polishing and scratching any exposed rocks. When the ice began to melt away and left free berg-battered beaches and boulder-hatched hills, Lincolnshire and Yorkshire must have been like the Antarctic regions in those days. This is how Dr. Louis Bernacci describes the Antarctic continent. The scene before us looked inexpressibly desolate. No token of vitality anywhere, nothing to be seen on the steep slopes of the mountains but rock and ice. Gravel and pebbles were heaped up in mounds and ridges. In some places these ridges coalesced so as to form basin-shaped hollows. Bleached remains of thousands of penguins were scattered all over the platform, mostly young birds that had succumbed to the severity of the climate. Great Britain must have been just as savage and desolate when these hardy little arctic plants colonized the shingles and rooted themselves amongst the rocks. They covered not only the seashore, but they probably made a settlement wherever rock or land of any kind was exposed. These original settlers have had three bands of descendants. One band has remained ever since on the seashore of Great Britain. Another set gradually traveled northwards. As the ice melted away, leaving the land bare, first in Denmark, then in Norway, and finally in Greenland, this second set followed it, until now we find them far to the northward, populating the Arctic regions of today, just as they did those of Britain in the Great Ice Age. The third set of descendants would at first cover all the land and rocks of the lower hills and valleys near the sea. Then, as the ice and snow melted and exposed the higher mountain sides, they would climb the hills and eventually reach the exposed summits where they are now living. There they find themselves in an impossible, savage sort of climate, in which they alone are able to exist. Violent storms, drenching mist, scorching sunshine, when the rocks become so hot that it's almost impossible to touch them, rainstorms and months of snow and hard frost cannot kill scurvy grass, sea thrift, or plantain, but there are few other plants which can stand such conditions. Lower down on the flanks of the hills and in the valleys, they have long since been dispossessed of the rich and fertile lands by plants which can grow more rapidly and luxuriantly. The little alpine creeping and least willows, for instance, some of which get up to 3,980 feet in Bredalbane, are mere dwarfs only a few inches high and totally different from their allies in the fertile lowlands, which are trees 80 to 90 feet high. Some of the alpine plants, which also occur in the Arctic regions, have not even been able to survive by the seaside in Great Britain. Their nearest allies are in the Norwegian mountains. It would be impossible, even for shrubs, to stand the violent winds and snowstorms of these summits. Alpine plants are generally low-growing mats. They are also often clothed all over in cotton wool, such as the edelweiss, this probably keeps them from losing too much water during the dry season, when the rocks on which they grow are strongly heated by the sunlight. Yet, like the Arctic plants, they have rich, deep, and brilliant colors. A queer point is that they have got so accustomed to this stormy and perilous existence that it is extremely difficult to grow them in a garden. Like mountaineers, they dwindle and pine away in the richer soil and softer air of the low grounds. To make an alpine garden, rocks and stones must be arranged with pockets and hollows, like natural crevices and basins between them. Rich leaf mold must be placed in these hollows. There must be good drainage and as much sunlight as one can possibly get.
End of chapter 7. Recording by Linda Johnson. Chapter 8 of The Romance of Plant Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Eliot. Chapter 8 Scrub. Famous countries which were covered by it. Trees which are colonizing the desert. Acacia scrub in East Africa, game and lions. Battle between acacia and camels, etc. Australian half deserts. Explorer's fate. Queen Hatasu and the first geographical expedition recorded. Frankincense, mirror, gums, and odorous resins. Manna. Ladinum. Burning bush. Olives, oranges, and perfume farms. Story of roses. Bulgarian attar of roses. How pomade is made. Cutting down of forests and Mohammed. A scrub, or half-desert, does not seem at first sight to be in the least interesting. But if one remembers such places as Cordoba, Seville, Florence, Genoa, Sicily, Athens, Constantinople, the great cities of Ephesus, Corinth, etc., of St. Paul's epistles, Persia, Arabia, Palestine, and Carthage, Surely the countries which have had such splendid histories deserve a chapter to themselves. What achievements in war, in art, in literature, and in romance are connected with these lands bordering the Mediterranean or fringing the great deserts of Sahara and Central Asia? The animals which belong to such country are also interesting. It is the home of the camel, ass, horse, donkey, not to speak of the giraffe, rhinoceros, gazelle, antelope, zebra, lion, and hyena. The plants are full of interest, too, and some of them are of great importance to man. The olive, orange, fig, roses, and many perfumes and spice trees are natives of scrub. In fact, it is the real center of all gums, frankincenses, and mirrors. As man depends upon plants and animals, and as animals also are dependent on the plant world, it is the climate which really is responsible for everything. The world of plants is entirely and exactly regulated by the character of the climate. What, then, is the climate of scrub? Those countries enjoy brilliant sunshine, cloudless skies, and yet there is sufficient rain to permit of irrigation and to prevent the unmitigated desolation of the desert. When, as has happened in many of these famous lands, the forests have been cut down and the aqueducts have been neglected, they become arid, dry, and almost useless. But when carefully and industriously worked, as they were in the days of Greece, Carthage, and Rome, they produce results which will forever live in the history of the world. The meaning of such half-desert climates and of the scrub which covers them has been already suggested. The scrub is trying to occupy the desert. If one takes the sternwheel steamer at the first cataract of the Nile and passes southwards, the desolation of black rock and honey-colored sand of the Libyan desert is at first unbroken. But here and there, the thorny trees of the Seyal Acacia show the beginnings of a scrub region. Much further to the south, those acacias and others become great forests which extend all along the south of the Sahara Desert and furnish the valuable gums of the Sudan. If one passes southward through this forest of acacias, it alters in character. The trees become taller, closer together, and climbing plants and undergrowth become more frequent. Still further south, one finds the regular tropical forest, which is characteristic of the tropics everywhere. 
the most interesting part, which is also the richest in big game, is the intermediate zone between the desert and the acacia forest or scrub. All sorts of transitions are found. Sometimes there are thickets of thorny bushes. Occasionally scattered clumps of woodland alternate with stretches of grass or what looks like grass. Near the desert, one finds pioneer acacias dotted singly here and there. These are the scouts or skirmishers of the army of trees which is trying to occupy and colonize the desert. This explains why this sort of scrub occurs in so many parts of the world. On the European side of the Mediterranean, the dry climate of Spain, the Riviera, and Greece must no doubt at one time have supported a scrub vegetation. At present, it is difficult to tell what this was. There is a sort of scrub called maki, which covers parts especially of Corsica and other Mediterranean countries. In Greece, also, thorny, woody little bushes are very common. But these are just what the goats, who are fiends from a vegetable point of view, have been unable to destroy. We cannot tell what sort of country revealed itself to the first Phoenicians when they landed in southern Spain to traffic with the savage inhabitants, or what met the eyes of Ulysses when he made his great voyage to unknown lands. But there are places in the world where man has never either kept domestic animals or cultivated the soil. Possibly Spain and Sicily in those early days were not unlike parts of British East Africa, such as the Taru Desert between Mombasa and Kibwezi. The following may give an idea of how this scrub or desert appeared to me. Gnarled and twisted acacias of all sorts and sizes, usually with bright white bark and a thin naked appearance, cover the whole country. Amongst these one finds the curious trees of Euphorbia. In Britain, Euphorbias are little green, uninteresting weeds, but here some of them are twenty to thirty feet high, with many slender whip-like branches, but no leaves. Others are exactly like cactus, and take on weird candelabra-like shapes. Nobody meddles with them, for if the slightest cut is made in the bark, out pours an acrid white milk which raises painful blisters and may even cause blindness if a drop touches the eyes. Almost all the plants are either covered with thorns or protected by resins, gums, or poisonous secretions. Between the scrubby trees, the soil is dotted over by little tufts of grass or sedge, but these are so far apart that the tint of the landscape is that of the soil. Game is abundant everywhere. Sometimes it is a small bustard or a persistent raucous guinea fowl that affords a chance for a good dinner. Occasionally a tiny gazelle, the pa, with large ears, springs out of the thorns and vanishes down the path. I saw footprints of giraffes, and came across ostriches more than once. I also made a persevering attempt to slay a Clark's gazelle, an animal with enormous ears and a long, thin neck. These long-necked creatures can see far above the usual short, thorny bush, and it is exceedingly difficult to get near them. Water probably exists under the stony grit soil, but at present one has to be contented with that found in the stagnant pools at Taru, Mongu, etc., which, if not occupied by the decaying remains of a dead antelope, are, as a rule, drinkable. These acacias are quite well fitted to live in this dry and arid region. Their roots go down to twenty feet or more, so as to reach the deep-seated water supplies. Their leaves are generally adapted to resist any injury from the strong glare of the sunshine. The gums already alluded to are also very important, for any crack or break in the tree is promptly gummed up, and there is no loss of precious water thereby. 
This gum will also prevent or discourage burrowing and boring insects from getting in. They would, if they tried to do so, become flies in amber, like those found in fossil resin. The trees are generally provided with strong spines, which guard them from the many grazing animals which try to devour the succulent leaflets. The fight between the grazing animal and the plant is, in these scrubs and half-deserts, very severe. In Egypt it is said that the whole flora has been entirely altered by the camel and the donkey. But in this case the battle is unfair. Man keeps those camels, donkeys, and goats. He provides them with water and protects them from lions, leopards, and snakes. In East Africa, man has not yet interfered, and the plants probably get the better of the animals. In such places, lions, leopards, and hyenas are common. It will be remembered that a lion not very long ago stormed and took charge of a railway station on the line to Uganda, and was only routed with very heavy loss. There is also some reason to suppose that the antelopes and other creatures do help the plants in their efforts to colonize the Sahara. Their droppings will very greatly improve the soil, and more vigorous thickets and undergrowth will spring up when the soil is improved in this way. Such a vigorous growth of plants will be better able to resist the long eight or nine months drought, and so help the wood to develop until perhaps it is too thick and the trees are too high for the antelopes to graze upon them. In this manner, the acacia scrub is slowly and painfully colonizing the desert. It is not only in Africa that one finds these half-deserts or scrub, there is the Brigolo scrub in Australia, which has a curious silver-gray shimmering appearance on account of the blue-gray, sickle-like leaves of the Brigolo acacia. The foliage casts no shade, for the leaves are flat and thin, and place themselves edgewise to the light, so that there is no danger of the strong light injuring them. Also in Australia is the Mallee scrub, covering thousands of square miles between the Murray River and the coast. It consists of bushy eucalyptus, six to twelve feet high. Its monotonous appearance, when seen from a small hill, is very striking. Quote, Below lies an endless sea of yellow-brown bushes. Perhaps far away one may observe the blue outline of some solitary hill or granite peak, but otherwise... Nothing breaks the monotonous dark brown horizon. Everything is silent and motionless, save, perhaps, where the scrub hen utters its complaining cry, or when the wind rustles the stiff eucalyptus twigs. End quote. There is a melancholy interest attaching to both the Mali and Brigolo, for in them lie the bones of many gallant and persevering explorers. Nor is the East African thorn tree desert without its victims. The missionary, Dr. Chalmers, was lost near Kibwezi in the Taru Desert. There are a certain number of valuable plants found in these half deserts or scrubs. Perhaps the earliest geographical expedition of which we have a good account with illustrations is that sent by the Egyptian queen. Hatasu from Thebes about 3,000 years ago. She built on the Red Sea a fleet of five ships, each able to carry from 50 to 70 people, and sent them to the land of Punt, which was probably Somaliland. The natives lived in round huts built on piles like the ancient lake dwellings. The object of the journey was to obtain incense. No less than 31 incense bushes were dug up with as much earth as possible about their roots and carried to the ships, where they were placed upright on the deck and covered with an awning to keep off the sun's rays. Whether they did really survive the journey and grow in Egypt is uncertain. Sacks of resin, ebony, cassia, apes, baboons, dogs, leopard skins and slaves, 
as well as gold and silver were also taken away. The Queen of Punt accompanied them. From her appearance it is not probable that the Queen of Sheba was any relation, although some writers have supposed that Sheba and Punt were the same place. The whole story is represented in colored base reliefs in the temple at Tel el Bahiri near Thebes. The incense here alluded to was a very valuable drug in Egypt on account of its use in embalming mummies. Quite a number of gums, resins, and the like are obtained from Somaliland and similar half-desert countries. The frankincense of the Bible, which may be the incense of Hatasu, is obtained from olibanum produced by various species of Boswellia. In February and March, Cuts are made by the incense gatherers in the bark of the trees. Tears of resin soon appear and become dried by the sun over the wound. The best kinds still come from Saba in Arabia, where the Romans obtained it in the time of Virgil. Besides olibanum, frankincense contains galbanum, ferula galbaniflua, and storax, storax officinale. Equal parts of these were mixed with the horny shield of a certain shellfish. When the last is burnt, it has a strong pungent odor. The galbanum is now found in Persia and storax in Asia Minor, both half-desert countries. The true mir, Comifora mira, is also found in East Africa and Southwest Arabia. The name is supposed to be derived from mirha, the daughter of Cinerus, king of Cyprus, who, in consequence of a great crime, was banished to Arabia and became the tree which bears her name. The mirror of the sacred oracles was used as incense at least 3,700 years ago and is mentioned by Moses. Genesis 37, 25. The sovereign of England used always to present gold frankincense and mirror in the Chapel Royal, London, on the Feast of the Epiphany. And, strange though it may appear, the symbolic offering is still made each year by our present king. Balm of Gilead, Balsamodendron Gileadense, belongs to scrub or half-desert regions. Cleopatra obtained plants from Jericho for her garden at Heliopolis. The Jews used to sell it regularly to the merchants of Tyre. It is still valuable, for the essence is worth from two to three pounds per pound. The Opoponax, described by Dioscorides, belongs to the Orient. It yields a valuable gum resin, which is much used in perfumery, Pastinaca Opoponax. It also is obtained by incisions in the bark of the tree. In fact, a very large proportion of these fragrant, sweet-smelling substances, myrrh, cassia, bdellium, etc., come from these sunny eastern lands, which are not exactly deserts, but very close to them. Manna, for example, is obtained from the flowering ash, Fraxinus ormus, in Sicily, by transverse incisions being made in the bark, so that the brownish or yellowish viscid juice exudes and hardens on the wound. Ladinum is a varnish or gluey coating found on the leaves of Cystus creticus, which grows in Crete. In old times, the glue was collected from the beards of the goats which had been browsing on the plant. Although this method no doubt increased the strength of the perfume, it has been abandoned and the ladinum is obtained by a kind of rake with a double row of long leathern straps. The straps take the glue from the leaves. It is used as a perfume in Turkey. Another very interesting eastern plant sometimes seen in old-fashioned country gardens in Britain is the burning bush, Dictamnus fraxinella. Like a great many of these half-desert plants, it is full of an acrid, ethereal, odorous substance. On a calm, hot summer's day, this material exudes from the leaves and surrounds the plant with an invisible, vaporous atmosphere. 
Such an atmosphere probably assists in preventing the water from evaporating or being transpired from the leaves. Now, if one places a lighted match a little below the leaves or flowers, this vapor catches fire, and there is a display of flames and smoke with little explosions, followed by a strong smell. The plant may be injured if it is set on fire too frequently, but generally does not seem to be any the worse for the experiment. The Mediterranean is the home of the myrtle and olive, of oranges and lemons, of figs and vines, of almonds and raisins, as well as of many other important and interesting plants. The olive crop in Italy yields about 90 millions of gallons of olive oil every year. The olives are collected as soon as they become ripe and are crushed in circular stone troughs with a perpendicular millstone. The paste is then pressed in bags and afterwards clarified by passing through cotton wool. To the eye of a foreigner, the white gnarled stems and silver-green foliage of the olive groves are not particularly attractive. Near Buriana, in Spain, one may walk for miles through the plantations of oranges. The dark green glossy leaves and golden fruit of the orange make a most beautiful contrast, but the dry thirsty soil and the careful way in which the water is regulated and supplied by small gutters, most jealously watched over, make the tourist realize the difficulty of agriculture in so dry and arid a country. The myrtle is not a very important plant nowadays, though its berries are still eaten, and myrtle wreaths used to be worn by the bride at every wedding. In classical times, it was sacred to Venus, but the victors in the Olympian Games were also crowned with myrtle, and the magistrates at Athens had the same privilege. It is no longer used as a medicine and for making wine. It is really a native of Persia, but has been introduced to the Levant, Italy, France, and Spain. It is along the Riviera that one finds a very curious and interesting industry. This is the manufacture of perfumes and essences from the petals of flowers. A great many different flowers are used, such as the garden violet, mignonette, a native of Egypt imported in 1752, lily of the valley, tube rose, the sweetest flower for scent that grows, jonquil, Narcissus jonquilla, heliotrope, imported from Peru in 1757, Spanish jasmine, J. grandiflorum, which is a native of Nepal, and was brought to Europe in 1629, and various roses. These roses have had a long, interesting, and honorable history. No one knows when they were first cultivated. Solomon had his rose gardens at Jericho. Queen Cleopatra spent some 400 pounds on roses in one day, and Nero is said to have beaten this record by wasting 4 million sesterces, 30,000 pounds in roses for a single banquet. Rose water is said to have been first produced by an Arab physician called Razes in the 10th century. When Sultan Saladin recovered Jerusalem from the Crusaders in 1187, the pavement and walls of the Mosque of Omar were washed and purified with rose water. That stout warrior Thibault IV, Count de Brie et de Champagne, brought back roses from Damascus on his return to his native land. That was the origin of the valuable Provence roses. The Lancastrians chose a Provence rose as their badge at the beginning of the civil wars of the roses in England. Otto of roses, or the essential oil, was discovered by Princess Nur Jahan at the court of the great Mogul, and she received as her reward a pearl necklace, were 30,000 rupees. The price of Otto of Roses seems to have been about 320 pounds per pound in Persia and India when the traveler Tavernier visited those countries in 1616. 
in the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries peers of france had to present bouquets and crowns of roses to the assembled parliament at present there are very important rose plantations in france bulgaria and in the fayum in egypt in france about ten or twelve thousand roses are grown on two and a half acres the season is from april to may women gather from twenty to twenty five pounds daily and obtain from two pence to three pence for two and a half pounds each tree will give about a quarter of a pound of roses the petals are distilled to make rose water some twelve thousand people on the slopes of the balkans at kurzanlik and other places entirely depend upon their rose plantations these are on light soil fully exposed to the sun at over twelve hundred feet above the sea it is interesting to find that the pure mountain air strengthens the perfume for these balkan roses are fifty per cent richer in essences than those of lowland plants another interesting plant much cultivated in the riviera is the cassier acacia farnesiana it is really a native of india but was introduced from the west indies to europe in sixteen fifty six can gras antibes and nice are the places where it is most cultivated its flowers appear from july to november an old tree may yield as much as twelve to twenty pounds of flowers worth about five to six francs but one hundred sixteen pounds of flowers only yield about a pound of essence so that it is not surprising that this last is worth sixty pounds the pound the cultivation is a little uncertain for a temperature of three or four degrees below the freezing point kills the trees the pomades made from many of these flowers are produced as follows a series of trays are covered with fat or grease the petals are placed on the grease and are replaced by fresh petals every twenty-four hours or so in the end the grease is so saturated with scent that it forms pomade or pomatum thus these half-desert countries are by no means without interest from a botanical point of view the conditions of life are no doubt hard both for plants and animals the scent so richly produced depends upon the strong sunlight and pure air it is very useful partly because it attracts those useful insects which carry the pollen but also because such odors are distasteful to grazing animals the gums incenses thorns and spines are all of great use to the plant in its dangerous struggle for existence with hungry camels and thirsty soil when men understood how to irrigate the soil and before they were foolish enough to cut down the forests which once guarded the mountain springs these half deserts were exceedingly prosperous they were full of vigorous intellectual life and of strong hardy and industrious peoples asia minor turkey greece and the northern coast of africa from morocco to egypt were rich and wonderful countries but it was not only the destruction of the forests that has ruined them the curse of mohammed the fatalism produced by his religion and the slavery which is a necessary part thereof have destroyed the people in mind body and spirit even in greece algiers and cyprus there has been as yet but small recovery in the future not merely these countries but northern nigeria british east africa and southwest cape colony may have as rich a history as greece if british brain and energy are helped by the strong muscles of the african end of chapter eight recording by linda johnson chapter nine of the romance of plant life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
Recording by Betty B. The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Elliott. Chapter 9 On Tea, Coffee, Chocolate, and Tobacco. On every day throughout the year, English people drink about 600,000 pounds of tea. That is about 270 tons, which would form, when made into the beverage, a lake quite large enough to float a man of war. No other civilized nation takes its tea in the reckless way that we do, yet our fellow subjects in Australia drink even more than ourselves. Almost the whole of this tea is grown in British colonies or possessions manufactured by British subjects and imported in British ships. The coolies who work in the tea gardens of Assam and Ceylon, the Englishman who manages them, the engineers in Glasgow and Newcastle who made the machinery, the shipbuilders, shipowners, and crews are all fellow countrymen of those who drink the cup that cheers. Every sixpence in the eight million pounds, which is our yearly account for tea, finds its way into the pocket of our fellow subjects, either at home or abroad. Every one would suppose that a trade like this, which benefits everybody, would be very carefully fostered by government. Far from it, for this is one of those articles that are always being attacked by chancellors of the exchequer, who seem to have a special ill will against tea. Indeed, it is so heavily taxed that it is extremely difficult to make a profit on tea gardens. Elsewhere in this chapter, some other very curious facts will be found illustrating the extraordinary habits and methods of the British government. The author does not try to explain these facts, but only points them out. A nation that can manage to exist at all when such things are done by its government is a nation to which one is proud to belong. The tea plant is a native of China and Assam. It is a very handsome shrub resembling a camellia, with dark glossy green leaves and beautiful flowers. It is said to have been used in China about 2700 BC, and the first plantations in India were made with Chinese seed. But a Mr. Bruce reported the presence of an indigenous wild tea in Assam. Three botanists who were sent to investigate the question suggested that this Assam variety was only the Chinese plant run wild and advised the introduction of Chinese seedlings. This was a very unfortunate mistake for the wild Assam plant gives much better results. The jungle is first cut down and cleared away by the native tribes with the help of elephants. Then at the right season, i.e. after the rains begin, the Indian women and coolies go into the plantations. They carry on their backs a basket supported by a band across the forehead. These women nip off the first two leaves and a bud with their finger and thumb and throw them into the basket over their shoulders. When the basket is full, they take it back to the factory where their gatherings are weighed. The actual manufacture is, in India and Ceylon, all performed by machinery. The tea is first emptied onto trays in a shallow layer. A pound of tea, when so spread out, covers more than a square yard. These trays are then placed in a room which is heated to a high temperature for withering. After six hours, it is passed through a machine which rolls or gives a twist to the leaves. It is then fermented on cement floors where the tea is covered by strips of moist muslin. It is again rolled and afterwards dried or fired. The sifting out of the different sorts or blends and also the packing of the tea in chests are done by machinery. That is the Indian system of manufacture in which there is scarcely any hand labor. In China, the rolling and indeed every stage of the process appears to be done by hand. It is obvious that in the handling, paddings, and rollings of the tea by Chinese coolies, celestial moisture may be imparted to it. In spite of this, however, the export of Chinese tea is steadily diminishing. In the old days, the Liverpool tea clippers, fast and beautiful sailing ships, raced each other home from China in order to get the first tea upon the market. Tea is sometimes dangerous, and especially when it is allowed to stew on the fire 
for hours at a time besides theine which is the stimulating active part of it and which is a bracing tonic to the nerves tannin is also found therein when meat is taken with a large amount of tannin the latter acts on the meat exactly as it does on hides in a tanning factory it forms a substance resembling leather which taxes the powers of the strongest digestion once upon a time in those fertile mountains of abyssinia which have never yet been explored by the white man there was a very holy and pious hermit he used to live entirely on the milk of a few goats which he carefully tended with his own hands one morning he noticed that one of these goats showed signs of unusual excitement it was frisking about and obviously was exceedingly well pleased with itself that was not a usual experience with the holy recluse who watched the animal carefully he soon discovered that it was in the habit of grazing on the bright red berries of a very handsome shrub in the hills the anchorite tasted those fruits and discovered that he also became both pleased with himself and somewhat excited his disciples soon discovered a brightness and exhilaration an unusual snap in the good man's sermons and they watched him and also discovered coffee the author refuses to take the responsibility of more than the discovery of the above story coffee was however introduced into arabia by the sheik dabhani in 1470 it was taken to constantinople about 1554 and about a hundred years later coffee houses and cafes were regular and habitual daily resorts in london and paris as usual with stimulants of all kinds the watchful eye of a moral government discovered something objectionable in coffee and charles the second in sixteen seventy five imposed heavy taxes or rather forbade the use of it altogether there was in seventeen eighteen a coffee plant in the botanical gardens at amsterdam and in that year some of its seeds were sent to surinam in dutch guiana apparently the millions of shrubs in the enormous coffee plantations of the new world are all descended from this particular amsterdam plant this new world coffee is by far the most important supply brazil alone exports about nineteen million pounds worth of coffee and that from the new world forms about eighty two per cent of the total world's production the story of coffee in ceylon is a tragedy there happened to be in the jungle a particular fungus hemalia bastratrix which got its living on the leaves of wild plants belonging to the coffee order rubia cii and others when arabian coffee was introduced the fungus began to attack its leaves the result was the utter ruin of the industry it is said that about fifteen million pounds was lost by this hemalia disease in ceylon the plantations require a great deal of care the shrubs have to be carefully pruned and the preparation of the coffee bean is not a very easy matter it is really the seed of a bright red fleshy berry the pulp or flesh has to be removed and also both a horny skin the parchment and a thin delicate membrane the silver skin in which the seed is enclosed coffee is not nearly so much used in britain as in some other places and particularly in holland where the dutch drink about twenty one pounds per head in the year whilst we in great britain only use about three quarters of a pound it is in fact not very easy to make good coffee and it is absolutely necessary to grind and roast the beans just before using them very often also too little coffee is used tinned coffee is often adulterated with either chicory or endives but those are only the two most important impurities for burnt sugar biscuits locust beans date stones rye malt and other substances are ground up and mixed with coffee the use of chicory is however more or less recognized it is the roots which are ground up and mixed with it they contain no caffeine which is the active part of the coffee bean and are quite harmless at one time chicory was grown in essex and other english counties and was a distinctly profitable crop here again come in the mysterious ways of the british government the cultivation of chicory was absolutely forbidden 
by the Inland Revenue Department, but a considerable amount is still grown in Belgium and is imported to this country. Those who prefer chicory with their coffee have to pay a heavy duty, but the Belgian farmer is allowed and the British farmer is forbidden to take up a paying and profitable industry. The plant is allied to the dandelion. It occasionally occurs in this country as a weed and is a rather striking plant with bright blue flowers. Another of these useful productions, which also suffers from a heavy duty, is cocoa or chocolate. There are a great many different plants called cocoa or by some name very similar to it. The coconut palm furnishes not only the nuts, but the fiber or coir enclosing them, as well as a great many other useful substances. The cocaine used by dentists and which deadens or stupefies the nerves of the teeth is derived from the leaves of a Peruvian shrub, coco, erythroxylin, coca. These leaves are chewed in the mouth and have very extraordinary effects, especially on the Indian laborers. They are a strong nerve stimulus and take away any feeling of hunger or fatigue. It was by the use of coca leaves that the postmen of the Inca emperors in Peru were enabled to carry messages at the rate of 150 miles a day. Then again, the cocos of the West Indian islands is a sort of yam, Colocasia antiquorum. Coco de mer is the fruit of a palm common in the Seychelles Islands, Lodoisia seychellarum. The cocoa, which gives the ordinary chocolate and cocoa of the breakfast table, is the seed of a tree, Theobromo cacao. The name is derived from God and food. It may be translated that which the gods browse upon. This plant is one of those which were cultivated by that ancient, powerful, semi-civilized nation, the Aztecs of Mexico. They have almost entirely vanished. At any rate, their descendants, if they have any, exercise practically no influence in the world, but they have left us chocolate. They fully appreciated the plant, and even more than we do, for they worshipped it with grateful and superstitious awe. In their tombs, chocolate flavored with vanilla was placed, in order to provide the ghost with sufficient sustenance for his or her aerial flight to the land of the sun. Columbus brought home some cocoa on his return from his first voyage. The Jesuit fathers in Mexico greatly helped in developing the plantation of cocoa in the days of the Spaniards. At present, the largest amount comes from Ecuador, which produces about 50,000 pounds weight. It is a small tree, 20 to 30 feet high, growing in the warm, moist, and sheltered forests of Central and South America. It has a large fruit, within which are the numerous cocoa beans, nibs, or seeds. The tree does not bear until it is five years old. The fermentation and drying of the beans requires some care. Chocolate is made from the powdered cocoa mixed with sugar and other materials. Chocolate, like tea and coffee, depends for its effect on an extremely powerful drug, theine or caffeine, of which it contains minute proportions. There are very few other plants known which possess this powerful substance. Among these is the kola nut, which is everywhere regularly employed in West Africa. On the way up to the barracks at Freetown, Sierra Leone, natives were always to be seen seated by the roadside. They sold kola nuts to the soldiers, who were thereby enabled to walk steadily and uprightly past the sentry, and to return his challenge in a clearly articulate voice, although they might previously have been somewhat injudiciously convivial in the town. This cola is one of the very strongest nerve tonics. Under its influence, men can endure severe physical and mental strain. Like the others, however, a depressing reaction inevitably follows, accompanied by insomnia headache, and other evil effects. When one comes to ask, why do those few plants out of all the vast multitude of the vegetable world possess such extraordinary virtues? It is difficult to find an answer. Possibly some obscure insect or fungus enemy finds caffeine poisonous. Nor can one find any reason for the curious properties developed in the tobacco leaf by fermentation 
except a possible protection to the leaf from the attacks of insects. No doubt the leaf, even in its natural state, would be too strong for them. Tobacco is a native of Central America. The name Nicotiana tabacum is derived, the first, from a certain Jean Nico, ambassador to the King of Portugal, and the second from the Haitian name for a pipe. On Columbus's voyage in 1492, the use of tobacco was noted. The story of Sir Walter Raleigh's servant, who threw a bucket of water over his master when the latter was smoking a pipe, is not supported by much evidence, but it seems to be probable that Sir Walter did smoke his pipe on the way to the scaffold. At any rate, it was cultivated in Europe by the year 1570, and Spencer speaks of the sovereign weed, divine tobacco. From the first, it was detested by all governments and authorities. James I published a very intemperate counterblast against tobacco, it was prohibited by the Tsar of Russia in 1635 and by the King of France. The great Sultan Jahangir in India, Sultan Amurath II in Turkey, Shah Abbas the Great in Persia, and the Emperor Kang Ching in China all prohibited the use of tobacco in their respective dominions. Yet none of these great rulers were able to check its progress. The herb of amiability or the queen herb of the rude barbarian, as it is described in Chinese, prevails almost over the whole earth. There is scarcely a people or tribe in existence which does not use it. But almost everywhere it is either heavily taxed or a government monopoly. In the latter case, it is always exceedingly bad. We ourselves import tobacco worth about 4,500,000 pounds in the year and pay a heavy duty. The world probably smokes from 1,800,000,000 to 2 billion pounds of tobacco every year. The plant is a very pretty one, with large leaves and long pinky or white flowers, which are open and strongly scented at night. It is an annual and is not at all difficult to cultivate. There is an impression in this country that it is a tropical plant, but by far the greatest amount of our tobacco comes from temperate countries. Large quantities are grown in Germany, in Hungary, and in other parts of Europe. As a matter of fact, tobacco was once cultivated in both England and Scotland. There is evidence to show that in 1832, it was successfully grown in Roxburghshire, where 1,000 pounds an acre was obtained. The land was let at about 5 to 6 pounds per acre. Experiments of recent years have also proved very encouraging and in fact it is difficult to see how any reasonable doubt can exist as to the fact that it would be perfectly easy to grow plenty of that sort of tobacco which we now obtain from holland and germany a prominent irish statesman has admitted this there was no doubt but that tobacco could be grown in ireland but whether there are irishmen patriotic enough to smoke it is very doubtful of course everyone knows that the differences in tobacco depend chiefly on the preparation, but the constitutional objection to tobacco illustrated by the above remark is the real reason why it is not grown. Oliver Cromwell sent his troopers to ride down the growing crops. Charles II imposed a penalty of 1,600 pounds per acre. Modern statesmen are flippant and unfair. The reason, of course, is that a large income is chiefly obtained by taxing imported tobacco. If this were at all interfered with, new taxes, which would certainly be unpopular, would be required. There is a good deal of interest in the story of the tobacco plantations. Many prisoners of the Civil War in England were sold to Virginia and other places. Even nowadays, there is some romance in the history of a cigar. In the Dutch island of Sumatra, the jungle is cleared away by the natives under the orders of an English manager. Chinese coolies are then imported. The estate provides each coolie with tools, tea, a barber, and sufficient cash to buy rice, fish, or pork, as well as a little over for his opium, to spend in fireworks, and to propitiate his demons. The coolie grows the tobacco, which is bought from him and manufactured by the estate. Some of it goes to India, where it is used as the outer wrapper of cigars. 
for adulterating tobacco all sorts of leaves are occasionally employed such as those of the dock chicory burdock foxglove comfrey elm coltsfoot plantain beech cabbage lettuce steeped in tar oil etc etc the substance nicotine is a deadly and dangerous poison when young people smoke tobacco it has been quite conclusively proved that they will very probably not reach their full growth but be miserable weaklings stunted half developed and below the proper standard of a man this is not surprising if one reflects on the constitution of tobacco smoke this contains nicotine empyreumatic resin oil ammonia carbonic acid carbonic oxide hydrocyanic acid sulfuretted hydrogen carburetted hydrogen and paraffin end of chapter nine chapter ten of the romance of plant life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the romance of plant life by george francis scott elliot chapter ten on deserts what are deserts like camel riding afterglow darwin in south america big badlands plants which train themselves to endure thirst cactus and euphorbia curious shapes gray hairs ice plant esparto grass retama colocynth sudden flowering of the karoo short-lived flowers colorado desert date palms on the nile irrigation in egypt the creaking sakhi alexandria hills the nile and euphrates across the whole of africa at its very broadest part from the dominions of the emperor of the sahara at cape juby on the atlantic and to the very borders of british india stretches a desert of the most uncompromising character it is famous in history the strongest races of man the great religions of the world as well as most cultivated plants and domestic animals have originated in some part of this dreary waste one cannot really appreciate deserts unless one has really seen them but it is necessary to try to describe what they are like sometimes the desert is a wilderness of broken stony hills covered by angular pieces of shivered rock in other places the soil is hard and is everywhere covered by pebbles or shingle often it is a mere waste of sand blown into downs and hillocks which look sometimes like the sand dunes by the coast and elsewhere like the waves of the sea one finds valleys in the desert quite like ordinary ones in shape but instead of water there is only sand in sweeping curves and hollows like the snow wreaths and drifts in a highland glen rocks stand out of this but their projecting faces are polished smooth and glittering or deeply cut by the flinty particles scraping over them continually in storms and hurricanes the traveller on camelback where his waist has to act as a sort of universal joint giving to every unexpected jolt and wrench of his rough paced mount suffers from the heat for nowhere else in the world are there such high temperatures he suffers from thirst and still more from the dust which fills eyes mouth nostrils and ears yet the dry pure air is most exhilarating in the evening there is a feast for the eyes in the glorious afterglow when the sun has just set the light from below the horizon produces an ever-changing indescribable play of color from violet to salmon pink and through the most delicate shades of yellow blue and rose until everything fades and there reigns only the mysterious silence of the beautiful starlit night no wonder the air is dry and pure for rain only falls on perhaps eight days in the year in some places 
Gardiaia, yet plants manage to exist even where there is only about seven inches of rain annually. But this seems still more extraordinary if one remembers that sand may be almost glowing hot during the day, whilst in winter it may be, at night, cooled below the freezing point. Yet a desert absolutely bare of plants is an exceedingly rare phenomenon. Such do occur. Darwin speaks of an undulating country, a complete and utter desert. This is not very far from Iquique in South America. The road was strewed with the bones and dried skins of the many beasts of burden which had perished upon it from fatigue. Excepting the vultur aura, which preys on the carcasses, I saw neither bird, quadruped, reptile, nor insect. On the coast mountains, at the height of about 2,000 feet, where, during this season, the clouds generally hang, a very few cacti were growing in the clefts of rock, and the loose sand was strewed over with a lichen, which lies on the surface quite unattached. In some parts it was in sufficient quantity to tinge the sand, as seen from a distance of a pale yellowish color. Farther inland, during the whole ride of fourteen leagues, I saw only one other vegetable production, and that was a most minute yellow lichen growing on the bones of the dead mules. Rydberg, speaking of the big bad lands in South Dakota, says that there are, in some places, great stretches of land consisting of canyons separated by small ridges, in which not a speck of green is visible over several sections. A section is more than a square mile. But though Aden looks exactly like a barrack stove that no one's lit for years and years, plants grow there. Even in Egypt, when one has left the Nile inundation limit, a botanical eye very seldom fails to detect plants of one sort or another, even in a dangerous and thoroughgoing desert. Plants are almost as hardy as men. They can adapt themselves to almost any climate. In some curious and inexplicable way, the very dangers of the climate seem to produce automatically a means of resisting it. The chief peril, of course, is a loss of the precious water through the leaves. When the skin or epidermis of a plant is being formed, the walls of its cells are laid down, layer by layer, one inside the other, by the secretion of the living matter inside. In a dry desert, the loss of water by evaporation will be so rapid that these layers of cell wall are much thicker than in ordinary plants. The very fact that they are thicker and less penetrable tends to prevent any further loss of water. So that plants in a dry climate have the power of altering themselves to resist its dangers. Another author found that in Scandinavia, plants of the same species can acclimatize themselves if necessary. Sheep's sorrel, which had grown on dry, droughty gravel banks, only lost 10% of its water in the first two days when it was artificially dried. Other sheep's sorrels, which had been luxuriating in meadows where they had no lack of moisture, lost no less than one-third, 33%, of their water when dried in the same way. That is interesting, because very likely our readers might, in crossing a desert, be perishing of thirst when a Bedouin Arab would be perfectly happy. The plants have learnt to do without water, just in the same way as the Arab has done. Of the many interesting desert plants, the succulents, cacti, euphorbias, and others of the same extraordinary, fleshy, dropsical appearance come first. When a serious plant, one of the American giant cacti, was dried, it did not lose the whole of its water for 576 days. That is probably the longest time between drinks on record. A house leek, Semper vivum, which has to grow on dry rocks where it has no water for days together, remained quite fresh 
for 165 days. There are several reasons why these plants took so long to dry up. To begin with, they have inside their stems and leaves certain substances which hold water and delay its escape. Moreover, their extraordinary shapes are of very great assistance. They prefer globular, round, circular, pear-shaped, or cylindrical forms. Suppose you were to cut such a round mass into thin slices and lay them out flat, it is quite clear that they would cover a much greater surface. Thin leaves also, if squashed up into a round ball, would have a very much smaller surface. The water can only escape from the surface exposed, so that these condensed round balls and fleshy columns have far less water-losing surface than ordinary leaves. As a matter of fact, it was found by calculation that the surface of an echinocactus was 300 times less for the same amount of stuff as that of an aristolochia leaf. If the actual loss of water from the echinocactus, as found by experiment, was reckoned as one unit per square inch, then the amount of water lost from a square inch of the aristolochia was no less than 5,000 units. This shows that these odd, outrageous shapes of prickly pears, cacti, and other succulents are an extraordinary help to them. We have already pointed out in a previous chapter how necessary their spines and prickles are if they must resist rats, mice, camels, and other enemies. What we may call the hedgehog type of plant is also very common in desert countries. There are many woody, little, much-branched, twiggy shrublets which bristle all over with thorns and spines. They are not at all fleshy, but to do with the least conceivable amount of water. Another striking characteristic of the desert flora is noticed by everyone. Almost every plant is clothed either in white cotton wool, like the lammy's lug of our gardens, or else in gray hairs. The general tint of the landscape is not green, but it is rather the color of the soil, silvered over by these gray-haired plants. The reason of this is, of course, quite easy to understand. We put on a thick overcoat if we are going to walk in a scotch mist to keep out the moisture. These plants cover themselves with hairs or cotton wool to keep the moisture inside. It does not escape easily through the woolly hairs on the skin. One very strange plant should be noticed here. This is the ice plant, Mesembryanthemum crystallinum. Every part of it is covered with little glittering swellings which shine in the sun like minute ice crystals. The swellings contain a store of water, or rather of colorless sap, which makes it able to exist in dry places. Dr. Ludwig says that a torn-off branch remained quite fresh for months on his study table. It is probable that these peculiar pearl or ice-like swellings also focus the sunlight, acting like lenses, upon the inner part of the leaf, but that is not as yet fully understood. There are two grasses growing in the desert which are of some value. Both are called esparto, or halfa. They are very dry, woody, or rather wiry grasses, especially common in Algeria, Tripoli, and also found in Spain. One of them, Stipa tenacissima, grows in rocky soil in Morocco, Algeria, and Tripoli. The Arabs search for it in the hills and dig it up by the roots. They then load their camels with the grass and bring it to the ports whence it is sent to London or other places. A very good and durable paper is made from it, and ropes, mats, and even shoes are also produced from the fiber. Part of the esparto is, however, furnished by another grass, Ligeum spartium. The natives sometimes tie a knot in a halfa leaf, which, according to them, cures a strain of the back. The stipa is also used as fodder, but it is not nutritious and is indeed 
sometimes dangerous. In one year, Britain imported 187,000 tons of esparto, worth nearly 800,000 pounds. The yield is said to be about 10 tons per acre. Another very interesting plant at Tripoli and in the North African desert generally is a sort of broom, the retama, retama reatum. It is not very unlike the common broom, but has long, leafless, whip-like branches covered by bright pink and white flowers. It can often be seen half-submerged in waves of sand and struggling nevertheless to hold its own. As it has no leaves, its loss of water is very much kept down. This is the juniper of the Bible, and it is still used for making coals. The length of the roots is very great in most of the broom-like hedgehog and other plants. A quite small plant, not more than six or eight inches high, will have a root as thick as one's thumb. Even at a depth of four or five feet below the surface, its root will be as thick as the little finger, so that the root length is at least twenty times the height of the visible part above ground. These thirsty roots explore the ground in every direction and go very deep downwards in their search for water. Another very interesting plant in the Egyptian desert is Citrullus colocynth, from which the drug colocynth is prepared. The great round yellow-green fruit and finely divided bright green leaves may be seen lying on the sand. It remains green all the summer, but appears not to have any particular protection against loss of water. It is always supplied by its roots with underground water. If a stem is cut through, it withers away in a few minutes. This is found also in Asia Minor, Greece, and Spain. The pulp of the fruit contains a strong medicinal substance. It is a drastic purgative, and in overdoses is an irritant poison. This was probably the wild vine or gourd which the young prophet gathered and which produced death in the pot. He probably mistook it for a watermelon. It is still plentiful near Gilgal, 2 Kings 14, 38-41. Below the surface of the earth, of course, there is not nearly the same dryness or danger of losing water, so that there are often a great number of bulbs, tubers and the like, hidden in the soil. There they wait patiently, sometimes for a whole year or even for a longer period. So soon as a shower of rain falls, they start to life, push out their leaves, and live at a very high pressure for a few days. After a shower of rain, the Karoo in South Africa, for instance, is an extraordinarily beautiful country. There are bulbous pelargoniums, a very curious leafless cucurbitaceous plant, acanthosicios, hundreds and thousands of lilies, irids and amaryllids. A single scarlet flower of a Brunsvigia can be seen more than a mile away. These tender and delicate, exquisitely beautiful bulbs flourish amongst the succulent euphorbias and mesembryanthemums, between the hedgehog-like thorny plants and the woody little densely branched mats of the permanent flora. The rain stimulates even these last to put out green leaves and flowers, but their time comes later on, when, by the return of the usual drought, every leaf and flower and the fruit of every bulb has been shriveled up, turned into powder, and scattered in dust by the wind. Then the karoo becomes unlovely, desolate, and barren-looking, with only its inconspicuous permanent plants visible. The above description applies to bulbs and perennial plants with underground stores of food. Yet, these are by no means the only plants which manage to exist in the Egyptian and Arabian desert. After a shower of rain, a whole crowd of tiny annuals suddenly develop from seed. 
they come into full flower and have set their seed before they are killed off by a return of the desert conditions when the effects of the rain have died away these plants are not really desert plants at all for they only grow during the short time that it is not a desert they are like the ephemerid insects which live for a summer day only nor is it only in egypt that we find such ephemerals mr coville found them in the colorado desert in north america the plants are quite different but similar conditions have brought about an entirely similar mode of life on the other side of the globe in colorado they seem to be much influenced by the quantity of rain mr orcutt after the great rain of february eighteen ninety one found plants of amaranthus allied to our love lies bleeding which were ten feet in height but in eighteen ninety two he found specimens of the same in the same place only nine inches high though they were perfect plants and in full flower in this last year there was only the usual very scanty rainfall it is however in deserts when man has set to work and supplies water and strenuous labor that the most wonderful results appear the whole of lower egypt babylon nineveh damascus baghdad palmyra and other historic cities show what the desert can be made to produce as one slowly steams up the nile from philae or shellal towards wadi halfa there are places where the brown regular layers of the nubian sandstone form cliffs which advance almost to the water's edge yet there is a narrow strip of green which fringes the water it is upon the actual bank itself which is a gentle slope of ten to fifteen feet that lupines lubia beans and other plants are regularly cultivated this narrow green ribbon remains almost always on each bank where the cliffs recede one notices a line of tall graceful date palms mixed occasionally with the branched dome palm the nut of which yields vegetable ivory tamarisks conspicuous for their confused silvery green foliage can be noticed here and there the acacias are common enough and sometimes one of them is used as a hedge it is a spreading intricately branched little shrub with very white branches and stout curved thorns if one lands and strolls along the banks below the palm trees or amongst plantations of barley wheat or lentils one sees the native women in their dark green robes gathering fruits or digging goats and donkeys are tethered here and there there are sure to be castor oil bushes small but neat pigeons with a chestnut colored breast and bluish banded tails are perching on the palms or acacias and utter their weak little coo the air is suffering from the horrible creaking and groaning of a saki water wheel this is made entirely of acacia wood and is watering the plantations sometimes it seems like a crying child then perhaps one is reminded of the bagpipes but its most marked peculiarity is the wearisome iteration it never stops one of them is said to supply about one and a half acres daily at a cost of seven shillings per diem exactly the same instrument can be seen pictured on the monuments of egypt four thousand to five thousand years ago the shadouf is of still older date this is a long pole bearing at one end a pot or paraffin tin and balanced by a mass of dried mud or a stone all day long a man can be seen scooping up the coffee-colored water of the nile and pouring it on the land for the magnificent sum of one piaster a day where not irrigated the soil is dry and parched and can only carry a few miserable little thorny bushes 
the entire absence of grass on the brick-like soil has a very strange effect to English eyes. The date palm, however, requires a little respectful consideration. If one enters a thick grove and looks upwards, the idea of Egyptian architecture, as distinguished from Gothic and others, is at once visible. It has quite the same effect as the great hall of columns near Luxor. The numerous stems, ending in the crown at the top, where the leaves spring off, was quite clearly in the minds of the architect at Karnak and other temples. It goes on bearing its fruits for some two hundred years, and begins to yield when only seven years old. It revels in a hot, dry climate, with its roots in water, and seems to require scarcely any care in cultivation. Yet, during the first few years of its life, it is necessary to water the seedling. A single tree may give eight to ten bunches of dates, worth about six shillings. Generally, it is reproduced by the suckers which spring out from the base of the tree. Dates make a very excellent food, not merely pleasant, but both wholesome and nutritious. Sometimes toddy is made by fermenting the sap, but this is a very wasteful process, as it is apt to kill the tree. The stones are often ground up to make food for camels. The feathery leaves are exceedingly graceful. When quite young, they are not divided, but they split down to the main stalk along the folds, so that a full-grown leaf affords but little hold to the wind. In some parts of Egypt, as for instance at Mariut, which is some fifteen miles from Alexandria, the wild flowers are probably more beautiful than anywhere else in the world. Amongst the corn and barley, which can be there grown without irrigation, masses of scarlet poppies and ranunculus are mingled with golden-yellow composites, bright purple asphodels, and hundreds of other eastern flowers. The result is a rich feast of color indescribable and satisfying to the soul. So that these deserts under the hand of man rejoice and blossom as the rose. Why is it that, as Disraeli has pointed out, civilization, culture, science, and religion had their origins in the desert? The answer is not difficult to see. For there is a dry, healthy climate. The severe strain of a long day's journey is varied by enforced leisure, when, resting at his tent door, the Arab is irresistibly compelled to study the stars and to contemplate the infinite beauty of the night. It seems also to have been in the desert of the old world that man first learnt to cultivate the soil. In fact, it was only by irrigation on great tracts of alluvium, such as were furnished by the Nile and Euphrates, that the enormous populations of Egypt, Babylon, Nineveh, and the other great monarchies could be maintained, so that city life on a big scale first developed there. End of chapter 10 Recording by Linda Johnson Chapter 11 of The Romance of Plant Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Eliot. Chapter 11. The Story of the Fields. What was ancient Britain? Marshes and bittern. Oak forest. Pines. Savage country. Cornfield. Fire. Ice. Forest. Worms. Paleolithic family. The first farmers. Alfred the Great's first government agricultural leaflet. Dr. Johnson. Prince Charlie's time. Misery of our forefathers. Oatmeal milk and cabbages. 
Patrick Miller, Tennyson's Northern Farmer, Flourishing Days of 1830 to 1870, Derelict Farmhouses and Abandoned Crofts, Where Have the People Gone? Will They Come Back? When the eyes of man first beheld Britain, what sort of country was this of ours? It is very interesting to try to imagine what it was like, but of course it is a very difficult task. Still, it is worth the attempt, for we ought to know something of what has been done by our forefathers. Where the great rivers Thames, Humber, Tyne, Forth, Clyde, Mersey, and Severn approached the seashore, they lost themselves in the wildernesses of desolate, dreary fenlands. Here, a small scrubby wood of willow, birch, and alder, there a miles-wide stretch of reeds and undrained marsh intersected by sluggish, lazy rivers, or varied by stagnant pools. The bittern boomed in those marshes. Herons, geese, swans, ducks, and aquatic birds of all sorts found what is now Chelsea a paradise only disturbed by the eagle, harrier-hawk, vulture, and the like. Neither at the mouth, nor even much higher up in its valley course, was a river a steady stream in a defined bed. Such beds, as it had, were probably four or five times their present width. They would be quite irregular, meandering about, changing at every flood, full of islands, loops, backwaters, and continually interrupted by snags of trees. The rolling hills of the lowlands would be an almost unbroken forest of oak, except where perhaps level land and the absence of drainage produced a marsh or horrible peat moss. But when we say forest, we do not mean a glorified Richmond Park. In good soil, there might indeed be tall and magnificent trees, but it would be quite impossible to see them. The giants of the forest would be concealed in an inextricable tangle of young trees, brushwood, fallen logs, creepers, and undergrowth. Where the soil was sandy or stony, it might be a scrub rather than a forest, of gnarled, twisted, and stunted oaks, or possibly thickets of sloe birch, rowan, hawthorn, brambles, and briars. Every stream would be wild water, leaping down waterfalls and cutting out irregular little woody ravines. Here and there, boulders and escarpments of rock would break through the forest soil, which would be mossy, thick with undergrowth, and entangled with rotting fallen trunks and branches, crossing at every conceivable angle. The higher hills were covered by a dreary, somber pine forest. It was of a monotonous, desolate character. Greenish-gray tufts of old man's beard lichen hung from the branches. The ground, treacherous and broken by boulders, peaty hollows and dead logs, would be shrouded in a soft, thick cushion of feathery mosses with blaeberry, ferns, triantalis, linea, dwarf cornel, and other rare plants. Through it descended raging and destructive torrents, which here might be checked and foamed over dead logs, whilst in another place they cut out bare earth escarpments or started new waterfalls which ate back into the hills behind. At the summit of the higher hills, bare rock crags projected out of occasional alpine grassy slopes, or irregular terraces, ravines, and gullies. Below, these alpine ravines ended in a peat moss, which scattered, dwarfed, distorted, and miserable-looking scotch firs and birches painfully endeavored to colonize. Here and there, on very steep hillsides, wiry, tussocky grass might be growing instead of forest or peat. A horrible, forbidding, and desolate land where deer, Irish elk, bison, bear, wolf, boar, wolverine, 
Badger and Fox alone enjoyed themselves. Now consider our country today. Mark the trim little fields. That hedge there must have been clipped about eighty years. The lifting day showed the stucco villas on the green and the awful orderliness of England, line upon line, wall upon wall, solid stone dock and monolithic pier. The road, carefully macadamized, sweeps on correct and straight or gracefully curving from neat village to country town. In the heart of the country, the roadsides are scraped bare to produce that hideous tidiness which is dear to the soul of the county council roadman. That is, if an individual whose life is spent in stubbing up roses, briars, and every visible wild flower can possibly possess a soul, those fields without a rock, or even a projecting stone, have been drained, dug over, and leveled with the greatest possible care. The very rivers have been straightened and embanked. The rows of pollarded willows have been planted. They may, when in flood, overflow, but the results are very soon no longer visible. Even on the moors and in the depths of the highlands, black-faced sheep, draining, and the regular burning of the heather have quite transformed our country. The original woods have long since vanished. Those which now exist are mostly quite artificial plantations, and the very trees are often strangers to Britain. The story of the Herculean labor by which our country, once as wild and as savage as its early inhabitants, the Icinians and Catuchlanians, and probably with lineaments as barbarous as those of the Coritanian and Trinabant, has been changed to peaceful, fertile meadowlands, or tidy, arable, is one long romance. To tell it properly would require a book to itself. In this chapter we shall only try to sketch what may have happened on one particular cornfield which exists on the trap rocks of Kilbarchen near Glasgow. The reader must bear in mind that even this is a very ambitious attempt, it is an exceedingly difficult undertaking. The subsoil in this particular cornfield on Pennell Bray lies upon the trap rock formed by one of those gigantic lava flows which cover that part of Renfrewshire. The whole district at that time must have been exactly like Vesuvius during the late eruption. Its scenery in this early Miocene period consisted of glowing molten rock accompanied by flames of fire, electrical storms, clouds of gas, dust, ashes, and superheated steam. Every plant and every animal must have been exterminated. That was unfortunate, for at that time, pines, oaks, gelder rose, willows, as well as sequoias allied to the mammoth tree, and sassafras, may have lived in Scotland along with tapirs, opossums, marsupials, and other extraordinary beasts. When the lava cooled and became trap rock, it was at once attacked by frost, by wind, and by rain. Then, by a very slow process of colonization, vegetation slowly and gradually crept over the trap rock and rich mold and plant remains accumulated. At a much later date, there was another wholesale destruction. This time, it was the great ice sheet coming down from the highland hills. Probably it drove heavily over the top of Pennell Bray and worked up into fine mud and powder every vestige of the Miocene vegetation. The very rocks themselves would be scratched, polished, and rounded off. When the glaciers melted away, and left the surface free, it would consist of these rounded rocks alternating with clay-filled hollows. The trap rock below would be covered by a subsoil due to particles of trap, of highland and other mud, with remains of the Miocene vegetation. Upon this surface, frost, wind, sunshine, and rain would again begin to perform their work. 
but the subsoil thus wonderfully formed by fire in the miocene by frost in the glacial and by weather in our own geological period very soon felt the protecting and sheltering effect of a plant covering first a green herb rooted itself every here and there amidst the desolate boulder clay or perhaps in a crevice where good earth had accumulated then the scattered colonists began to form groups soon patches of green moss united them then a continuous green carpet could be traced over a few yards here and perhaps on a few feet somewhere else but when things had got as far as this progress became much more rapid and soon the whole site of the future cornfield was covered over by a continuous green carpet only every here and there hard stones and uncompromising trap rocks remained still protruding from the green covering in another chapter this first covering of the soil will be described at length so far it has been subsoil and underlying rock but now the roots begin to disintegrate and work up the subsoil the earthworm has his chance and forms true soil on this particular hillside the water would drain away and there would be no danger of mosses strangling and choking the blaeberry and the heather the worm flourished and multiplied and the soil became rich and black here and there a slow or a rowan or poplar or perhaps alder and birch began to appear in certain places whins and brooms brambles and briars diversified the hillside then a few scotch firs began to push their way up through the thickets at first they were very small and stunted but as each one formed a dense deep-going mass of hardy roots they were able to investigate the riches of the subsoil every year the amount of leaf mold above increased until the original moss covering was utterly destroyed and a pine forest occupied panel brae about this time a paleolithic family may have encamped on the side of the cliff near a little stream which can still be traced the camp was only a few sticks and branches with a skin or two for shelter from the north wind the women lopped down fir branches for firewood and cut up the young trees the children set fire to the shrubs on dry days and paths ran here and there through the forest this would be about 198,000 B.C. Every year meant a further, very gradual, slow destruction of the pine forest. About 60,000 B.C., our Paleolithic hunters, with chipped stone weapons, would be obliged to travel further to the north. New savages, with round heads and polished stone weapons, would make life in Renfrewshire too uncertain and too diversified by massacres. These last possessed seed corn, a few fruit trees, as well as goats, cattle, and perhaps a few hardy, shaggy ponies. At first, these settlers would be obliged to live in a lake dwelling, say in Linwood Moss, which is close at hand. They would then drive their cattle over the surrounding district and camp in slightly built villages. Near at hand, probably on the hill, they would build a round camp or fort where they could fly for safety in the continual fights and invasions of the period. Sooner or later, a village would be built near Pennell Bray. One summer day, the villagers attacked the wood that covered it. They cut down all the small brushwood and hacked through the bark of every big tree. After a few weeks, when the trees were dead, the wood was set on fire. Then a rough fold made of rude wattle and daub was formed, and every night the cattle and sheep were driven in. After three or four years, this fold would be plowed up by exceedingly rude instruments barley or certain kinds of wheat would be grown year after year 
until the crop was not worth gathering. When that happened, another fold would be ploughed up. Probably the whole of Panel Bray went through this rude sort of agricultural treatment at one time or another. At the same time, goats, cattle, and the demand for firewood, obtained in the most reckless and wasteful manner, would have very seriously interfered with the forest. Although, no doubt, great changes for the better were introduced, the spearmen of Wallace of Eldersley, close by, had their infield land, which was practically the sheepfold as above described, and their outfield or grazing commons. Even down to 1745 the above system was practiced. See below. But when men's minds were stirred up and invigorated by the great revolution of 1788 to 1820, all sorts of new agricultural discoveries were made. Yet the cornfield on Pennell Bray was probably not drained or enclosed by stone walls and hedges until 1830 to 1840. About 1870, it was more profitable to its owner than it has ever been since though even now it forms part of our British farmlands, which yield, on the whole, a larger amount of oats per acre than those of any other country in the world, except possibly Denmark. Let us, however, look a little closer into the long, long period during which the fire and stone axe methods of farming prevailed. Before the Romans landed, there seemed to have been no towns. There was but little cultivation, for the Britons wore skins and lived chiefly on milk and flesh. In the time of King Alfred, the increase of population made it necessary to take more trouble about farming, so we find a description of what the good farmer ought to do. We might call this the very first government leaflet and it has led to the agricultural leaflets published by the Board of Agriculture for Great Britain and Ireland. Seth wille wurkan wast bare land, atye hin of them acre avest, sona fern and thornas and figurzos swasame weods. He was to clear off fern, bracken, thorns, sloe, hawthorn, bramble, Win and weeds. The names of the months give some idea of Anglo Saxon methods of farming. May was Thrimilsi, because the cows might then be milked thrice a day. August was Weod Monath, weed month. November, Blot Monath, or blood month, because the cattle were then killed to supply salt beef for winter time. Very much later in history, after our English friends had laid waste and depopulated Scotland, so that woods sprang up again everywhere, and again long after that time when the gradual increase of population had again utterly destroyed those woods, a certain Dr. Johnson travelled from Carlisle to Edinburgh. This gentleman declared that he saw no tree between those places. This statement must not be taken too literally, for he had written a dictionary and considered himself not merely the Times, but an Encyclopedia Britannica as well. The Earl of Dundonald, in 1795, thus describes the agriculture of 1745, Prince Charlie's days. The outfield land never receives any manure, after taking from it two or three crops of grain, it is left in the state it was in at reaping the last crop, without sowing thereon grass seeds for the protection of any sort of herbage. During the first two or three years, a sufficiency of grass to maintain a couple of rabbits per acre is scarcely produced. In the course of some years, it acquires a sward, and after having been depastured for some years more, it is again submitted to the same barbarous system of husbandry that is used as a fold and then ploughed up. In the same year, 1745, in Meigle Parish, 
the land was never allowed to lie fallow. Neither peas, grass, turnips nor potatoes were raised. No cattle were fattened. A little grain, oats or barley, was exported. In 1754 or thereabouts, there was only one cart in the parish of Keith Hall. Everything was carried about on ponies' backs, as is the case nowadays in the most unsettled parts of Canada. The country in places was almost impassable. Bridges did not exist, and the roads were mere tracks. In Ranoch, the tenants had no beds, but lay on the ground on couches of heather or fern. These houses were built of wattle and daub, and so low that people had to crawl in on hands and feet and could not stand upright. In the best times that class of people seldom could indulge in animal food, and they were in use to support themselves in part with the blood taken from their cattle at different periods, made into puddings or bread with a mixture of oatmeal. Their common diet was either oatmeal, barley, or bear, cleared of the husks in a stone trough by a wooden mallet, and boiled with milk. Colworts or greens also contributed much to their subsistence, and cabbages when boiled and mashed with a little oatmeal. Potatoes were introduced in Dumfriesshire some time after 1750, and the use of lime as manure at about the same time. Even in 1775, the roads were such that no kind of loaded carriages could pass without the greatest difficulty. There is a most fascinating account in Dr. Singer's work of a strong man's difficulties in starting reasonable agriculture in Dumfriesshire about the year 1785. This was Patrick Miller of Dalswinton. It was on Dalswinton Loch that he tried the very first steamboat. When I went to view my purchase, I was so much disgusted for eight or ten days that I then meant never to return to this county. A trivial accident set me to work, and I have in a great manner resided here ever since. I have now gone over all of this estate, and this I have done without the aid of a tenant. I need not inform you that the first steps in improvement are draining when necessary, enclosing sufficiently, removing stones, roots, rubbish of every kind, and liming. These operations cost me, I reckon, about eleven pounds per acre upon an average, and I lay my account with being repaid all my expenses by the first three crops, but at any rate by the fourth. When the land which I make arable will give at least, if brought from a state of nature, twenty times the rent, when I began to improve it. Major General Durham of Mount Annan, writing from that place in 1811, says that all over Scotland for about thirty years, from 1780 to 1810, he has seen cultivation extending from the valleys to the hills, commons enclosed, wastes planted, and heaths everywhere giving way to corn extension of towns and villages by new lines of excellent roads, magnificent bridges and inland navigation, our rapidly increasing population by our now exporting great quantities of grain from parts of Scotland into which it was formerly imported, and by the superior comfort and abundance which appear in the domestic economy of the inhabitants. If you read any newspaper of today published in Canada or in the Argentine Republic, you find exactly the same process at work and the same enthusiasm about it. Even in 1840 to 1850, all these improvements were still vigorously going on. Look at Tennyson's Northern Farmer, Old Style. And I a stubbed Thornaby waste, do but look at the waste. There weren't no fade for a cow. Now to all but bracken and fuzz and look at it now. Weren't worth nout a harker. And now there's lots of fade. Four score yows upon it and some on it down, I said. 
even in his days the good farmer was following king alfred's directions about eighteen thirty to eighteen fifty most of the land was in good bearing and the roads were sufficiently good to admit of the stagecoach with four horses. But they, after all, lasted but a very short time before the railways again entirely altered the conditions of country life. As we have seen, rents were, in places, five times as large in 1820 to 1830 as they had ever been previously. Therefore it was that, about this time, the gentlemen's houses were, in many places, rebuilt on a more magnificent scale. Then also were begun those circles and strips, or belts of plantation, which are now conspicuous features of the Scotch lowlands. An enormous majority of these plantations are not more than eighty years old. I think avenues were planted in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries, the fashion about eighteen twenty was to destroy them as unnatural at least in england unfortunately no respect was paid to the economic practice of forestry with very unfortunate results for the proprietor the rest of this chapter is necessarily unpleasant and distressing reading but it is necessary if we are to understand the romance of the fields as one wanders over the grassy pastures of southern Scotland, where the black-faced sheep foolishly start away, and where one's ears are irritated by the scolding complaints of the curlew or whop, it is no rare accident to find a few broken-down walls, a clump of nettles, and badly grown ash trees. That was once a farmsteading, where a healthy troop of children used to play together after walking three or more miles barefoot to school. The ash trees were planted at every farm tune, for the Scottish spear was a very necessary weapon until recent times. Often also upon some monotonous grouse moor, one sees the ridges that betoken a little croft where a cottager lived. In one parish, Troqueer, over seventy country cottages have been abandoned during the lifetime of a middle-aged person. Many families, of which the laird was often the best farmer in the district and his own factor, have disappeared. The fine houses, with their parks and shootings, are let to strangers, who come for a few weeks or months and then leave it in charge of a caretaker. Before this recent development, the family lived all the year round upon the land. They spent their income chiefly in wages to the country people. Where once forty or fifty people were employed all the year, there are now but three or four. The big house, with shuttered windows and weed-grown walks, is a distressing and saddening spectacle. Of course, such changes must occur. The farmers and the cutters' children are now carrying out in Canada, Australia, or the United States what was done in Scotland from 1780 to 1830. India, South Africa, and China have been developed by the brains and hold the graves of many of the laird's sons. Yet this poor old country, abandoned of her children, shows signs of revival. Both the poor and the rich are beginning to find out that a country life is healthier, quite as interesting, and sometimes quite as profitable as the overcrowded city with its manufactories, mills, and offices. All new countries are beginning to fill up, and there is some hope that a new and vigorous development of farming may make the countryside once more vigorous, prosperous, and full of healthy children. End of chapter 11. Recording by Linda Johnson. Chapter 12 of the Romance of Plant Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Eliot. Chapter 12 On Plants Which Add to Continents. The way in which the savage, rugged, inhospitable Britain of the Ice Age changed into our familiar peaceful country formed the subject of the last chapter. But plants do far more than cover the earth and render it fertile, for some of them assist in winning new land from the sea or from freshwater lakes. The Sea of Aral, for instance, or Lake Chad, are rapidly becoming choked up by reeds and other vegetation. Blown sand from the deserts around is caught and intercepted by these reeds, so that fertile pastures are gradually forming in what used to be the open water of a deepish lake. By far the most extraordinary of all these plants which form new land are the mangroves. They are only found in the tropics or subtropical regions, and are always along the sea coast. It is where a river ends in a delta, dividing into intricate and confused irregular winding creeks, that the mangroves are especially luxuriant. Such a river will have probably flowed through hundreds of miles of the most exuberant tropical forest, where growth is never checked by the cold grasp of winter. Its waters are yellowish-brown or café au lait colored because they are full of mud and of decaying vegetation, with dead leaves and decaying branches floating on the surface. So full are such rivers of decaying material that they have a distinct and unmistakable smell which has been compared to crushed marigolds. So soon as the muddy water reaches the sea, most of its mud is deposited, and forms great banks and shoals of shifting odoriferous slime, which confuses and interferes with the discharging mouth of the river. It is upon these changing, horrible-smelling banks of bottomless slime that the mangrove is especially intended to develop. If one takes a canoe in such a delta and paddles inwards on the incoming tide, a dense forest of glossy green mangroves will be found to cover the whole coastline, and also to extend far inland by the winding creeks, lagoons, and river channels. The whole theory of the mangroves becomes clearly revealed as soon as the water begins to sink at low tide. First, one notices that the stem of every mangrove ends below, not in a single trunk, but in an enormous number of arched, stilt-like supporting roots, not only the stem, but the branches also give off descending roots, which branch into four or five grasping arched fingers as soon as they get near the water. When they reach the mud, these fingers grow down into it and form a new supporting root to the tree. It is very difficult to give any idea of the extraordinary appearance of these mangrove roots. Imagine an orchard of very old apple trees in winter, and suppose that one were to cut off every tree and plant it upside down in black mud, and also to crowd them so closely together that the branches were all mixed and confused. This might give an idea of the odd and strange appearance of the root system in a mangrove forest. Upon these arching roots, even on those which are not yet attached, Multitudes of oysters may be seen. There is also a little fish, a sort of perch, which climbs up onto the roots or out of the mud below, and gasps or squatters about in it. As to the mud itself, it is a horrible, greasy, oozy, black or blue-black slime of bottomless depth. It is full of organic putrefying, strongly smelling material, clearly full of bacteria. The water itself is sometimes covered by a dirty, oily scum, and air bubbles rising from the bottom spread out on the surface and let loose the microbes in the atmosphere. There are many crocodiles, which may be seen reposing on the mud above high tide. It is difficult to distinguish them from a rough log of wood, but it is still more difficult to kill them, for their scales turn any ordinary bullet. 
there is scarcely any experience more exasperating than when, after one has been taken a long, careful and accurate aim, one observes the sleeping brute suddenly wake and scurry down in the, to the water with a hideous leer on its face. Sea cows, or manatees, are said to live in these creeks. Little ducks of many kinds rise in hundreds and thousands, but the commonest bird is the curlew, either a wimbrel or closely allied to it. During the day they sift the mud with their long, curved beaks for insects, and at sunset fly down in vast numbers to the mud banks near the sea. A miserable little white crane called Poor Joe is common, and has the same habit. It is not worth shooting, and it is quite aware of the fact. Herons, cormorants, and other birds are often to be seen. Monkeys sometimes visit the mangroves, probably to eat oysters or crabs. There are several kinds of crab-like creatures which climb up the roots, and may be seen running about all over them. But during the three weeks spent by the writer in the Mahela Creeks of Sierra Leone, it was the insects that made the deepest impression upon him. As soon as the evening falls, the mosquitoes appear in myriads and in millions. Such creeks and mangrove swamps are always fever-stricken and dangerous, and probably enjoy the very worst climate in the whole world. Of course, nowadays, when Sir Patrick Manson and Dr. Ross have discovered that the mosquito carries the malaria germ, it is possible with great care to guard against malaria. One has also the satisfaction of knowing that the mosquito itself cannot be perfectly at ease with all these tiny parasites attacking its digestive organs. At first sight, such swamps appear to be useless, impossible and dangerous. But that is not the case. No one, of course, would ever willingly reside in mangrove swamps, and the mangroves themselves are of scarcely any use to man, although the bark does sometimes furnish a useful tanning material. But, indirectly, the mangroves are one of the most important of all nature's geographical agents. On those horrible, slimy, shifting mud banks, no other plants could manage to exist. If one looks carefully at the seaward side of the last of the mangrove swamps, then it's easy to see that they are colonizing and reclaiming the mud. Not only do the roots, depending from the branches, grasp and colonize new mud, but the seedlings are also specially adapted to fulfill the same office. They remain a long time attached to the parent fruit. They also grow to a considerable length before they fall off. When ready to fall, they have a distinct seedling stem, which swells out towards the base and ends in a pointed root. The seedling is, in fact, like a club hanging upside down and with a pointed end. When it does fall, it goes straight down deep into the mud. Then it promptly forms some anchoring roots, and the young mangrove is fixed in new mud and begins to develop, so that the forest continually grows towards the sea. Such mud banks soon become pierced by roots in every direction. Then the leaves of the mangroves themselves, as well as silt, soil, and rubbish floating in the water, gradually accumulate about and round these roots. This must raise the level of the ground. Eventually, the soil becomes hardened and is above the level of the water. When this happens, the mangrove, which likes salt water about its roots, becomes unhealthy and the ordinary jungle trees kill it and take its place. Thus, in course of time, when the jungle is cleared, fertile rice fields may be thriving, on what was once a pure, or rather impure, mud bank. In this way, by the continual development of the mangroves, enormous stretches of land are being added to the continents, and the process continues so long as the character of the coastline favors it. The shoreline covered by these mangrove swamps is enormous. In fact, within the tropics, one finds them almost everywhere along the seashore. But coral, rock, or an exceedingly dry climate, such as that of Arabia or northern Peru, prevents their growth. 
Central and South America, West and East Africa, India, Polynesia, Australia, and much of the Asiatic coastline is covered by mangroves. Theophrastus speaks of those in the Persian Gulf, and that exceedingly shrewd botanist has some valuable notes about them, worth reading even today. In temperate countries, such as our own, the districts where great rivers enter the sea are for the most part aguish and rheumatic, but of course there is nothing so startling and extraordinary as the mangrove swamps. Yet, even in temperate countries, the work of winning or gaining new land plods steadily onward, and it is performed by humble, inconspicuous little plants. Where the Rhone enters the Mediterranean, there are some 14,000 acres of sandy and clayey land called the Camargue. The bare sand near the sea is often flooded and swept by violent storms in winter. Anything which tries to grow there is usually carried off and destroyed. But, after a time, one finds here and there a solitary plant of a kind of saltwort, Salicornia macrostachia, which has withstood the strain. Its branches gather a little sand and hold it together, and its roots gradually explore and tie down the soil around it. Next winter it can stand the sweep and score of the stormy water. Next summer other plants begin to grow on this tiny sand heap, and the torodon, as it is called, is now fairly well established. It goes on growing until it may be, after a few years, six feet in diameter. Eventually the salt gets washed out of the soil, and these little heaps become united by a continuous covering of green plants, in which shrubs and then trees begin to grow. By this time, of course, the sand has accumulated farther out to the sea, and the same process is going on there. In Britain, we have the sea meadows of sea grass, which covers the submerged sand and mud banks near the mouth of great rivers. The waving green grass-like leaves from a rich submarine meadow. They are used for stuffing pillows and cushions, especially in Venice, but their real importance in the world depends upon their being able to tie down and fix permanently those unseen shifting banks which form a real danger to all navigation. These plants are very remarkable. They lived, no doubt, at one time on the land, like most of the flowering plants. But like the whale and the seal, they have been driven to take refuge below the ocean. They are not easily seen, and indeed, one may wander for years along the sea coast and never suspect that great meadows of Zostra, the eel rack, grass rack, or sea grass, are flourishing under water. But, one might ask, how is the pollen of its flowers carried? Obviously, neither insects nor the wind can be of any service. The pollen of Zostera is, however, of the same weight exactly as the water, so that it neither rises to the surface nor sinks to the bottom, but floats to and fro until it reaches the outspread styles of another plant. This is perhaps the most remarkable arrangement known for the carrying of pollen. Sometimes along the seashore, or especially on the muddy foreshore of an estuary or tidal river, one can watch those plants which are trying to form new land. One finds generally that there is a broad stretch of marshy meadow, interrupted and intersected by small ditches and little winding streams. As one gets towards the shore, seeping, scurvy grass and aster, and other plants, not to be found elsewhere, become common. Then stretching out into the mud, there are rows of curious reeds and sedges. Try to pull up one of these reeds, and you will find a strong, buried, stringy stem with hundreds of anchoring roots. These are the pioneers which first fix the sand. Over the surface of the sand between these upright stems, one often comes upon a most beautiful, glossy, dark green, velvety cushion. It is composed of a seaweed called washeria, whose twined and interlaced threads form a thick, silky cushion. 
but it is only beautiful to look at from above. If you pull up a piece of this cushion, you will find that it is growing on black and loathly mud, with many wriggling worms and horrible animacula. First, these pioneer reeds, then this soft, silky carpet of washiria, and then the seepings and other estuarine marsh flowers gradually creep forward and extend over the bare muddy sand, so winning it from the sea for the use of cattle. In the worst winter storms, when the waves are thundering heavily over these sands, it seems as if nothing could resist them. Yet, if you go down when the storm is over, no harm has been done. There is the silky green cushion of Washeria, and there are the lines of pioneer sedges and reeds, quite undisturbed. The reeds bend and sway, yielding to the water. The seaweed is a slimy and oily, and the water cannot endure it. But yet, the strength of these seaweeds is extraordinary, and indeed almost incredible. More remarkable still, perhaps, are those seaweeds which grow upon rocks, often where the full strength of the waves beats upon them. After a heavy storm, when perhaps the great timbers of groins and the heavy concrete blocks of an esplanade have been shattered to pieces and tossed all over the shore, one may go down to the shore and there will be no visible difference in the kelps and tangles of the rocks. Scarcely any seem to have been broken away. Indeed, if one looks in the rubbish left by the last high tide, one finds that when one of these alarias has been broken away, it is often because the stone itself has been torn out of the rock. One finds broken off stones with the seaweed still attached to them. The reason is that the outside of the seaweed is oily, slimy or slippery, so that the water gets no hold of it. The stem and substance is also elastic and surprisingly strong, so that the daily tossing and wrenching when the tides come in and go out has no effect in tearing it away. But if you go down to a dry dock, and look at the hull of a ship which has come in to be cleaned and scraped, you will see that it is entirely covered by seaweeds and shells. That ship has been driven through the water perhaps at ten miles an hour or more, and yet those delicate-looking seaweeds have held on. It is more surprising still, if you can get some of them and examine them with a microscope. For amongst them are tiny, delicate, graceful little fronds and sprays, which one would think consisted of nothing but jelly, yet they have been able to thrive and grow on the ship's hull while it has been hurrying day and night through the sea, in calm or in tempest, and in currents of hot or cold water. Those seaweeds were called by Horace algae inutils, or useless seaweeds. But are they useless? Go down to a little pool and watch them waving in the water. Could anything be more beautiful than these little graceful red, yellow or brown sprays? All sorts of sea slugs, shrimps, and minute animals of weird and wonderful design are clearly living on them. Fishes live upon these animals, and fishes are an extremely useful and excellent food for man. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of The Romance of Plant Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Stays The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Elliot Chapter 13 Rocks, Stones, and Scenery An old wall Beautiful colors Insects Nature's chief aim Hard times of lichens Age of lichens Crusts Mosses Lava flows of great eruptions Colonizing plants Krakatoa Greenland volcanoes Sumatra, 
shale heaps, foreigners on railway lines, plants keep to their own grounds, precipices and rocks, plants which change the scenery, canyons in America. At first sight, and when one is striding along at some four miles an hour, there seems to be nothing at all interesting in an old wall. But if one stops and carefully examines the stones, there is a great deal that is interesting. Rocks and walls possess a fascination of their own. Probably at least two thousand British plants are only found upon them, and yet of these the vast majority are so small and inconspicuous that an ordinary person never perceives a single one of them. It is perhaps on rocks or old walls near the sea that this stone flora is most richly developed. The near circular orange yellow patches of the lichen Physica parentina are quite distinct and conspicuous. But any old wall, provided as well out in the country, is pretty sure to be interesting. At first it seems to have only a dull gray or neutral tint. But if one goes four or five feet distance, one discovers that many shades of browns, red, white, and black go to make this gray. But the extraordinary beauty of such a wall is only visible when one peers and scrutinizes the surface very slowly and carefully, with the eyes six or seven inches away from it. In doing this, one is often troubled by rude and ribald boys. A botanical friend in need complained that he had been four months avoided and shunned as a dangerous wandering lunatic on account of his botanical enthusiasm. But true botanists get accustomed to disagreeable incidents like that, and pay no attention to the vulgar crowd. The change in an old wall, when one looks at it from a few inches distance, is most remarkable. The entire surface is spotted or dusted, sprinkled, or entirely covered by thick lichen stains and crusts. The original color of the stone is nowhere visible. The lichens show the most delicate shades and contrasts in colors, all pleasing and all blending together in harmonious general tones. The fruit of these lichens is like a minute saucer or platter, generally with a thin rim or border, but it is exceedingly small, probably only one sixteenth of an inch in diameter, or even less. The smallest of these crust lichens form continuous, very thin coatings, covering the stone, and against this background the little saucer-like fruits show up quite distinctly. The coating itself varies from bright yellow, pale ochre, citron, chestnut color, to mouse color, different shades of gray and green, cream color, lead color, blue-black or pure black, tawny brown, rusty red, or pure white. The cups of one kind, Lacedia, are black, while those of Lacanora are generally reddish brown, but they may be a ghostly pale hue which stands out plainly against the gray green background of the frond. Sometimes they are of the richest deep crimson or lake, set against a pure snow white crust. Those of Lacanora, Vitalina, are, though tiny, a brilliant yellow and quite startling when first one notices them. Many of these contrasts and shades are never used by artists, and even from the mere artistic point of view they have great interest. But if, after spending a few minutes in carefully looking over the rocks at a distance of six or seven inches, one stands up and goes back to four or five feet away, the whole of this color scheme fades away, and there is only the monotonous indeterminate gray or neutral tint of the wall. Now, why is this? Why should these delicate and exquisite shades be wasted on such a minute and scarcely distinguishable forms? There are always two sides from which one can look at any subject, namely the inside and the outside. From the inside, that is, from the point of view of the little lichen itself, these colors are decidedly useful. Small insects crawl about on such walls or hover a few inches in front of them, and to those insects these cups will be as conspicuous and attractive as a scarlet geranium is to ourselves. Just as we habitually go to look at a geranium, so those insects fly towards the cups and crawl about on them. 
then when the spores and dust of the lichen begin to stick in their hairs and feet they go to a bare place and clean or brush them off thus the spores and dust are carried to a new part of the rock where they will grow if they can find an unoccupied space the taste and color of these insects moreover is apparently not very different from that of man but perhaps a still more interesting point of view is that from the outside why are those lichens there what are they doing and are they of any use the general scheme of nature is to cover the whole world with green so that every ray of sunlight may find a working leaf or a green frond ready to welcome it and use it nature abhors bare rock barren sand and empty water and never ceases to try to bring it under that beautiful covering of green plants and active vegetable life which supports both man and animals we all know that there is a romance in the story of man's colonies first the explorers search out the country then the pioneer frontiersman settles and builds his log hut or rough shanty next come the frontier village which may perhaps in many years time become a crowded city where active valuable work is carried on the story of the colonizing of rocks and stones by plants is just as vividly interesting these tiny lichens are most the first pioneers and prepare the ground for those that follow upon that bare rock life is terribly severe the frost shatters it sunshine heats it until it almost burns the hand in the summer floods of rain or of sleet beat against it and it may be frozen over for weeks what plants can stand such conditions only these minute tiny scarcely visible lichen films gradually new lichen crusts develop upon it they cover over the first pioneers first they suffocate them and afterwards devour their remains nature is very business-like and severe in her working the lichen crust may be now about one sixteenth of an inch thick it is a very slow process there is a story of a boy who noticed a patch of lichen near his father's door he went away to kamishakta or somewhere and came back to a very old man of eighty-five years but he found that the lichen patch was just the same size as when he went away that however is just a story at any rate one of these little crust-like lichens called variolaria has been known to increase half a millimeter in size about a sixteenth part of an inch between the end of february and that of september now if one tries to realize what the life of such a lichen crust or crottle must be it is obvious that the stone below it must be a little corroded or weathered and remains of the first choked pioneers bacteria and possibly tiny insects or animacula will be under the crust which may now be one sixteenth of an inch thick it is the turn now of other lichens to colonize it these may be the little trumpet or horn and comp lichens clendonias or perhaps the larger gray kind parmelias and physicas which have leaf-like fronds and form circles of perhaps eight to ten inches in diameter the crust lichen is overgrown broken up disorganized and devoured by the parmelias and the clandonias who are helped by bacteria insects and macula which shelter below them these leafy lichens grow much more rapidly they may increase two-thirds of an inch in one year but very soon after this one notices a very inconspicuous green mosses at first in the crevices between the stones or in the hollows and not remarkable they soon increase and form trailing sprays or branches which grow very quickly branches of moss four or five inches long extend over the leafy lichens in a season the parmelias and clendonias struggle on but they cannot keep pace with the rapid life of the moss and soon our wall is covered by beautiful moss turfs underneath such a turf there may be an inch or so of good soil dead moss and dust with lichens and insect bodies worms insects etc shelter and flourish and multiply in the soil but the turn of the moss is coming here a few grass blades there a tiny plant of sandwort possibly a rock bed straw began to root themselves in the moss if people would only let the wall alone it would soon be festooned with hanging plants and producing quantities of grass but somebody is sure to find that it looks very untidy and everything is torn off the wall which again looks new and raw and clean then of course the pioneer lichens begin again 
Some very interesting and remarkable facts have been discovered about the ways in which lavas and basalts have been occupied by the plant world. In the great volcanic eruption of 1883, the whole island of Krakatoa was covered by hot lava and glowing ashes. In 1884 and 1885, the sunsets were remarkable for a curious fiery red or orange glow, which was popularly supposed to be due to the volcanic dust of that explosion. It is said that the dust traveled three times round the earth, though I do not know on what authority. However, on Krakatoa Island there was left a clean slate. There was neither bacteria nor leaf mold nor living plants of any kind, nor spores or seeds could have endured the fiery furnace of their interruption. Three years afterwards, the botanist Cherub visited the island. He found that the rocks had been first covered by thin layers of minute freshwater algae, but that ferns were then occupying and inhabiting the lavas, eleven kinds of ferns, and, but very few other plants, were discovered. People were interested in this, and Dr. A. F. W. Schimper then visited another volcano which had been pouring out huge streams of lava in 1843. He found that there were still plenty of ferns, but also a number of shrubs and other plants. Yet even then there were no trees and there was no continuous mantle of green plants such as we are accustomed to in this country. He also found many plants growing on the lava which are generally found on the branches of trees, that is, which can do without a thick layer of soil. He also found quantities of a pitcher plant, Nepenthes, which live mainly on insects caught in its pitchers. This does not at first seem to agree at all with what has been given for the walls. This does not, at first sight, seem to agree at all with what has been given for the walls. It is true that sometimes in the highlands or lowlands and lakeland hills one may come across quantities of bladder fern and other growing on the screes. These last may be described as streams of broken angular stones filling small gullies and spreading out at a base over a considerable space. Often these ferns seem to be all that can thrive in it amongst the stones, but in a mild and temperate country like our own, one would expect things to proceed differently, and in fact they do so. Every one must have noticed a green stain which covers wet walls, stones, stucco, even marble statues, and especially tree bark in wet or damp situations. This is a minute green seaweed rejoicing in the name of Pleurococcus. It is a pretty object for the microscope. This, of course, is the first stage of colonization. It is followed by mosses of sorts. But there is a more interesting series still in a climate resembling our own. The lava flows from Mount Vesuvius have been investigated by several observers. There it was found that the first inhabitants were lichens and small green seaweeds, then different mosses occupied the lava over which a certain quantity of vegetable dust had been scattered. After this, scattered ferns and even small shrubs could be seen even on flows which were red-hot only twenty years before, whilst on old lava fields, herbs, shrubs, bushes, trees, and even true woods had developed. Yet in Greenland, lava flows dating from 1724 to 29 are still only covered by crust lichens and a very few of the stone mosses. In Sumatra, on the other hand, the volcano Tamburo, which in 1850 had entirely destroyed its vegetation, was covered with a fine young wood in 1874. The strong heat and abundant moisture of Sumatra favors, whilst the horrible climate of Greenland prevents the rapid growth of good soil. Just as cities of 20,000 inhabitants can spring up in a few months in western United States, whilst the Eskimo of Greenland have not managed as yet even to live in villages. The full beauty of this gradual colonization and occupation of bare rock and stone only impresses one properly if one tries to trace the stages, but it is an interesting history. Near Glasgow, one sees great heaps of shale or bays, generally black band, which are often mistaken for natural hills. This is, or was, virgin soil, never occupied by plants, and entirely destitute of leaf mold, or any sort of organic plant food. If one scrambles to the top of these heaps, it is easy to see all the details of the occupation, 
long underground runners of colt's foot and of horsetail are climbing up the sides fringes of creeping buttercup couch grass and other hardy weeds occupy every year a little more of the flanks but on the top one very soon finds that the dust of the atmosphere aided by weathering has afforded a chance to mosses to hawkweeds and other rock plants these in time cover the top and soon hardy grasses and weeds form a regular turf on the top of the shale it is interesting to scramble to the top of one of these heaps especially in summer one then begins to realize how every plant attends strictly to its own business all over the sides of the heap there will be hundreds of a rare ground sole seneca viscous which is not really a name and never occurs except on such places and in grass field close by hundreds of thousands of ragwort seneca jacobia make a glorious golden carpet in the marshy parts of the meadow the water ragwort seneca aquitus may be found in the cottage gardens and here and there along the roadside the groundsel cynical vulgaris is flourishing abundantly these plants never interfere with or encroach upon one another grounds every year thousands of ragweed and groundsel seeds must be blown on to the shale heap but they never manage to grow there it is only the foreigner species viscous accustomed to a very hot and dry climate with sticky leaves which catch atmospheric dust and probably insects, can exist on the bare shaly sides. These slopes of shale are easily heated by the sun, and at the same time radiate the heat rapidly away, so that the viscid ground sill must have a very hard time of it. When its roots have worked up the shale a little, and its dead leaves have covered the surface with the mold and organic matter, then possibly others, true British plants, can get a footing and suppress it. Along railway tracks also, the ballast forms a very hot, a very dry, and a very barren soil. Many of the regular railway track plants are foreigners from the far south, even from the sunny shores of the Mediterranean. They are mostly annuals, such as the little toad flax, Linaria minor, which can just manage to exist under those conditions. Of course, the sides of the banks and the cuttings on the railways are generally formed of good earth or soil and support a rich and flourishing flora of true Britons. Besides these slow, laborious lichens, mosses, and others which have attacked rock, there are other plants which are generally called rock plants, though they behave quite differently. These are those fine, hardy hawkweeds, rose roots, semper viviums, mew, and others which establish their roots in cracks or crevices of the rocks. Such cracks are soon full of good soil, for the wind blows decayed leaves and dust into them, and the roots are always burrowing into, eating into, and shattering the rocks. Most of them have a circle of leaves which are pressed flat into the ground, thus they escape the violent winds and storms always common on such crags and precipices. The flowers, however, supported on tough, strong, and flexible stalks, sway freely to and fro in the wind, and can be seen by insects a long way off. These rocks are of some importance as stone breakers and pioneers in a very interesting process. Wherever a cliff or precipice of stone is exposed, it is weathered. Water gets into cracks and freezes in the winter, but when water is frozen, it expands or widens. And as this happens to the water in the crevices and cracks of rocks, pieces of rocks are shivered and broken off. Besides frost and wind and rain, these rock plants help to attack the cliff. Their roots get into the crevices, and they are widened and expand, tearing off great slabs and splinters of rock which fall down to the foot of the cliff. Down below, plants are every year growing over and covering up or happing up with green these bare fragments and splinters a considerable amount falls down every year so that the ground is always being raised up below the precipice and the brow or the edge above the precipice there is also always a loss of rock and stone every year so that every year the bare rock exposed becomes smaller and smaller until eventually a steep green grass-covered slope covers over the entire site of that precipice Moreover, that is not by any means all the plants do in the way of changing the scenery of the country. Look at the outlines of the hills in any part of Great Britain, except in the broken, jagged, rocky mountain ranges of Scotland and Wales. 
also Cumberland, Westmoreland, parts of Derbyshire, and Dartmoor Tors. Everywhere there are smooth, flowing, and gently undulating rises and falls. No sharp, abrupt descents break these graceful, sweeping curves. If you compare the scenery of a canyon in the rainless deserts of West America, the contrast is very striking. There the sides of the valleys are steep cliffs. It is all harsh, precipitous, horrible country, which is obviously very unpleasant and very attractive to civilized people. It is this green covering of plants which make the difference. The rain that falls is not allowed to cut out the ragged ravines. It is intercepted and soaks into the grasses, which so keep a smooth, gentle outline over hill and valley. If you notice the effect of a heavy shower of rain on a road or bare earth, you will see how soon tiny valleys and canyons and beds of streamlets are cut out. But on the green fields beside the road, there is no change in the surface at all. It seems to be quite unaffected by the heaviest of storms of rain. End of chapter 13、Chapter、fourteen of the Romance of Plant Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Eliot. Chapter fourteen on Vegetable Demons. Animals and Grass. Travelers in the Elephant Grass. Enemies in Britain. Cactus versus Rats and Wild Asses. Angora Kids versus Acacia. The Wait a Bit Thorn. Palm Roots and Snails. Wild Yam versus Pig. Larch versus Goat. Portuguese and English Gorse. Hawthorn versus Rabbits. Briars, Brambles, and Barberry. The Bramble Loop and Sick Children or Ailing Cows. Briars of the Wilderness. Theophrastus and Phrygian Goats. Carleen near the Pyramids. Calthrops. Tragacanth. Hollies and their ingenious contrivances. How thorns and spines are formed. Tastes of animals. By far the greater number of wild animals live by eating vegetables. If one thinks of the elephant's trunk, the teeth of a hippopotamus, or even of the jaws and lips of mice, rats, and voles, The thoroughly practical character and efficiency of their weapons become the more astonishing the more one reflects upon them. Yet the defenses adopted by plants are just as wonderful and are often most ingenious. It seems at first remarkable that the most usual food of animals, grass, should be apparently unprotected. It is upon grass that the great herds of bison, of buffalo, of antelope, and guanaco are or were supported. Yet grass is so wonderfully reproductive, produces such enormous quantities of buds and foliage, and grows in such luxuriance that there is no fear of its being killed out. There are many places in the world where vegetation defies the attacks of the animal world. Neither man nor elephant can live comfortably in the thick jungles of West Africa and the great forests of Brazil, nor can man or elephant utilize great tracts of country in Central Africa which are covered by the elephant grass. For perhaps four or five hours, the weary caravan plods on through a sort of burrow two feet wide made in this gigantic grass. The stems are ten feet or more in height and nearly meet overhead. There is nothing whatever to be seen except the narrow path. The atmosphere is stifling and hot. To cut a new road a few hundred yards long through it involves hours of labor. It is only when there has been a long drought that it is possible to set fire to the elephant grass, and then for a very short time the young growing shoots can be grazed, but no cattle can break through when it is fully grown. The very exuberance of vegetation in such cases prevents any harm. Perhaps it is best to show how, even in Great Britain, all plants have many dangerous foes. The roots of trees are nibbled by mice, voles, and sometimes by swine. The bark is injured by cattle, roe deer, red deer, fallow deer, who tear the bark with their horns, and especially by rabbits and hares. The leaves are eaten by the same animals, and also by horses, goats, sheep, etc. The young buds are attacked by squirrels, who also break off the leading shoots of certain firs when they happen to be in a playful mood. 
but it is in cultivated lands and in open, rather dry and arid country that one finds the most interesting weapons in the fights between plant and animal. It is in such places that some of the most beautiful and useful creatures have their home. The horse, ass, camel, goat, and sheep probably belong to those wonderful lands which border the great deserts of Africa and Asia. These animals have been obliged to travel far and fast, and to perfect their bodily strength in order to pick up a living. They have been taught, perhaps we should say learnt, by the thorns and briars of the wilderness. The cactus, prickly pears, or other succulent plants which belong to true deserts are covered over with most curious and interesting spines. A row of little projections runs down each edge of the round fleshy stem. On each projection there is a rosette of spines. Sometimes these are long, slender, and diverging. In other cases they are short, stout, and curving over. Now, imagine a guanaco in South America, or even a rat or mouse, which is perishing of thirst in the arid desert where such things are found. It will be seen that it is by no means easy for it to taste the water in the juicy stem, for even the thin muzzle of a rat could scarcely get between the thorns. Kerner describes how the wild asses in South America root up or try to split the cacti with their hooves to get at the juicy tissue of the unarmed lower parts. Yet they often receive dangerous wounds in doing so from the frightful spines of melocactus and others. It is very interesting to see a flock of angora goats in South Africa attacking an acacia. The kid is a pretty, white, fluffy little creature with the most meek, mild, and innocent expression. Yet it is a quarrelsome little brute. In a few minutes an acacia will be despoiled, broken, and robbed of its foliage by a flock of them although it bristles all over with long spines, of which there are a pair at the base of each leaf. Even the camildorn, camelthorn acacia, or the wait -a bit in South Africa, cannot defend itself. The wait -a bit vacht and becha, is so called from the ingenious nature of its spines. There are two together, of which one is straight and the other curved round like a hook. Both are very sharp and strong so that an incautious traveler is sure to injure himself and his clothes. The straight one runs into his tender flesh, whilst the curved one fixes itself in his clothes. It is by thorns, spines, and prickles that plants often protect themselves against the attacks of grazing animals. But it must be remembered that these are by no means the only safeguard. Plants produce poisonous, bitter, or strong-smelling substances which keep off their enemies, and these indeed often afford a more efficient protection. See Chapter 3. These thorns, etc., can be produced in the most unexpected places. There is one rule, however, namely that they are invariably found in the exact spot where they can be the most useful. Thus, there are certain palms which possess green, juicy leaves much relished by snails. These are protected by a sort of spine entanglement formed upon certain roots, which grow at the base of the leaves. Nor is this the only case in which spines are found on roots. There are certain South African bulbs, morea, which are protected from the wild pigs by a dense mass of spiny roots. On my march to Uganda from Mombasa, I was very much astonished to see an extraordinary wild yam. It had a huge underground tuberous part full of starchy matter but it was quite impossible for any marauding wild boar to get at it, for it was entirely enclosed in a sort of arbor of long, arching roots densely covered by stout spines, which made a perfect protection. It is more usual to find thorns developed on the branches or stems. Generally, these are formed on the outside towards the end of the branches. In the Alps, larches have to suffer from the attacks of goats, which nibble off the ends of the young shoots. The part behind the scar dries up, but fresh twigs are put out from further back along the branch, until the tree becomes a closely branched, twiggy, bristling mass, which looks like the clipped yews in old gardens. But so soon as it has grown tall enough to be above the reach of the goats, an ordinary larch stem develops and may grow into quite a respectable tree. This fact is given by Kerner von Marillon and is very instructive as explaining why it is so often the ends of the branches become hard thorns. The green leaves and twigs are hidden and protected. One of the neatest examples of this is the Portuguese gorse or whin, which resembles a little cushion with every branch ending in strong thorns and every leaf terminated by a stout spine. 
The common whin, furs, or gorse is very nearly as perfect an example of thorniness and spininess. The South Down sheep do not seem to injure it on those beautiful Sussex downs so famous for succulent mutton. Yet, in the early spring or in a very wet season, one often finds in the grass at the foot of the bush, or even in the bush itself, small shoots which would be taken at first sight as belonging to some other plant. These little shoots are gray with hairs, and have soft trefoil leaves which are quite unprotected, for their spines are quite soft. They are probably seldom eaten, for most of them are in the shelter of the old spiny bushes. Yet even the old bushes can be used as fodder for sheep if they are crushed and ground up, so as to break the thorns and spines. The gorse is a very hardy plant, and is said to be only out of flower when kissing is out of fashion. There is some uncertainty as to the exact way in which animals set to work when they are eating thorny or spiny bushes. This makes the arrangement of the thorns sometimes a little difficult to follow. Moreover, it is often not so much the leaves as the juicy bark in winter and early spring that is required. Sometimes everything above ground is eaten down. Rabbits, for instance, do not as a rule touch the hawthorn. Yet Mr. Hamilton says, the second winter after planting was very severe, and this hedge was eaten down to the very ground by rabbits. For about 600 yards, I do not think that a single plant was missed. In frost and snow, almost every plant is attacked by rabbits, and indeed by any grazing animal. Remembering that it is very often the young, juicy shoots that are sought after, it is quite easy to see why the young rose suckers and shoots from the base of the stem fairly bristle with long and short prickles. These latter are generally straight, not curved, like those of the long arching branches which are supposed to hook themselves on the branches of the surrounding trees. The young, light-colored branches of the cultivated gooseberry are flexible, and hang over in such a way as to make it difficult for an animal to reach the bark. A cow or sheep, if it wished to eat these branches, would begin at the hanging tip and make a sort of upward-tearing jerk while its tongue gathered the branch into its mouth. If one copies this with the hand, it is easy to see how the length and arrangement of the prickles and the flexible nature of the spray would make such a proceeding on the cow's part most uncomfortable. So also in the barbary, the young, juicy, upright shoots which spring from the older branches have stout, three to seven branched prongs pointing downwards, of the most efficient character. Each is really a modified leaf and is found below each bud. Even the mere idea of an animal's tender lips or tongue tearing at these shoots from below gives one a momentary shudder. In the younger, wavy branches of the barbary, the spines are straighter or more diverging. The young leaves of the short bud above alluded to are also most efficiently protected by their spines. The hawthorn has a curious arrangement of very long, stout thorns behind which the leaves are sheltered. The younger, flexible branches have smaller spines, which become efficient in winter and tend to prevent animals from eating the bark. The cockspur thorns are four to five and a half inches long and extremely like the spur of a gamecock. Bramble prickles are generally curved back in order to hook or cling to the branches of other trees, but anyone who has tried to force his way through a clump of brambles knows the difficulty of doing so. The loops made by the branches fixing themselves in the ground were at one time given credit for healing various diseases. Children in Gloucestershire used to be dragged backwards and forwards under these loops. In Cornwall, also, people afflicted with boils were made to crawl under them. Even cows, when suffering from paralysis, supposed to be due to a shrew mouse walking over them, were dragged through the bramble loop, in which case Professor Buckman remarks, if the creature could wait the time of finding a loop large enough and suffer the dragging process at the end, we should say the case would not be so hopeless as that of our friend's fat pig, who when she was ailing had a mind to kill her to make sure on her. The brambles and briars of Gilead and Ezekiel were probably brambles of which Rubus discolor is common in Palestine, and the butcher's broom, Ruscus aculeatus. This last plant is really of the lily family, and its flat, leaf-like branches end in a sharp spine. The rabbit does not eat it. Amongst foreign, thorny, and spiny plants, it is very difficult to make a selection. Theophrastus, one of the very earliest botanists, describes a class of shrub very common in Phrygia, in which the leaves are produced at the base of the young shoots, 
which latter end at the top in branch thorns. These thorns, therefore, entirely cover the foliage and keep off that vegetable demon, the goat. Some of the crucifers, roses, composites, labiates, etc., take on this habit in goat-infested countries. In Egypt, near the pyramids, one often finds Carlina acaulis, a little thistle which has no stem, but is merely a flower seated in the middle of a rosette of leaves which lie flat on the sand. In the center there is a circle of sharp spines, each of which is from one to two inches in length. The nostril of a hungry camel or donkey is sure to be pierced if it tries to eat the leaves. The spines of this thistle, like those of our carline and the centaura calcitrapa, thistle of the Bible, spring from the bracts surrounding the flower. The ancient calthrops, or crawtes, first used by the Romans, were designed from the spines of the last-named plant, calyx, heel, and trappa, snare. It had four iron spines, so that however it was thrown down on the ground or in a ford, a spine was sure to stick up and to lame man or horse. The tragacanth plant has also very neat spines. They are the persistent spiny stalks or midribs of the older leaves from which the leaflets have dropped away. The fresh green leaflets are quite protected inside these withered spines. Several grasses have leaves which end in sharp or needle-like points. One of these, Festuca alpestris, actually produces bleeding at the nostrils of grazing cattle, and is detested by all the shepherds of the Alps. The holly is one of our most beautiful trees, as John Evelyn points out. This vulgar but incomparable tree, is there under heaven a more glorious and refreshing object of the kind than an impregnable hedge of nearly 300 feet in length, 9 foot high and 5 in diameter, which I can show in my poor gardens at any time in the year, glittering with its armed and varnished leaves, the taller standards at orderly distances blushing with their natural coral. This apparently was the identical hedge into which Peter the Great used to trundle his wheelbarrows. The barrows contained his courtiers. There was a nice run from the top of rising ground close at hand. It was at Sales Court, Deptford. The spiny leaves of the holly are unfortunately not nearly strong enough to save it from its enemies. The bark is apparently of a particularly delicious and toothsome nature, for sheep, cattle, and the ubiquitous rabbit are always delighted to destroy the trees. It has been noticed that wild hollies have at the base very spiny leaves, but that higher up on the tree, above the reach of cattle, the leaves have no spines at all. Sir Herbert Maxwell, in his Memories of the Months, takes up this question. It is best to give the description in his own words. I strolled out along the banks of Tay in that noble woodland which is continuous from Dunkeld to Mirthley. Here there are many fine hollies, some on the river banks and cliffs, others on level ground, planted by no hand of man. There was not one of these which did not confirm my observations first made many years ago, and hardly one which did not bear evidence of special growth not merely as a reaction against pruning or cropping, but as a precaution against any such contingency, so regular and deliberate as to suggest that these trees are something more than unconscious automata. Many of these hollies are 30 feet high, with foliage down to the ground. They carry spinous leaves up to a height of 3 or 4 feet. Above that level, all the foliage is absolutely smooth and spineless. One tree rose from the ground in two bare stems, and the lower branches did not reach below the browsing level. But from between the two old stems rose a young shoot about four feet long, clothed throughout its entire length with intensely prickly leaves. This tree was growing in an enclosed wood where cattle could not come. Still, roe deer might be about, and the holly armed its young growth at the low level, although the leaders of the old stems, not less vigorous in growth, bore leaves as smooth as a camellia's. I noted one particularly suggestive tree, an unhealthy one. The growth had died back along most of the branches, which stood out bare and dry. But a recuperative effort was in progress. Fresh and luxuriant growth was bursting along nearly the whole height of the stem, and the foliage of this was vigorously prickly up to about four feet, and smooth above that height. I noticed many instances of localized prickly growth where boughs originally above the browsing level and clothed with spineless leaves had been weighed down and cropped by cattle. But this is merely a vigorous reaction against external injury, 
such as makes a clipped holly hedge bear spinous foliage from base to summit. This quotation shows that there is no doubt as to the facts. It is true that one finds cultivated hollies showing many variations. Sometimes all the leaves are spiny both above and below. In other varieties, none of the leaves possess spines at all. Yet it must be admitted that these are facts and cannot be denied. Moreover, the osmanthus, with its holly-like leaves, the evergreen oak, and some junipers are found to show exactly the same curious difference. The perilously situated lower leaves are more spiny than those which are above the reach of grazing animals. Kerner von Marillon has also remarked a similar protective arrangement in Gladitia chinensis and in the wild pear. Trees of the latter, when they are young, bristle with the spines into which the ends of the woody branches are transformed, but tall trees 12 to 15 feet high are entirely without thorns. It is when one meets coincidences of this nature that the full meaning of plant life begins to dawn upon the mind. How is it that the plant knows the time to produce its spines and the time to refrain from doing so? There are certain queer facts that have been given on good authority as to the cause which tend to produce thorniness and spininess. Spinosae arbores cultura sapius deponent spinus in hortus. Lothelier found that barberries grown in a moist atmosphere had no spiny leaves and that the thorns were far less woody under those conditions whilst in a perfectly arid and dry atmosphere only spines were formed. A strong light also tended to produce spines. Professor Sickenberger grew a desert plant, Zilla myagroides, in the botanic garden at Cairo, and found that its spines were much weaker and more slender than the strong, rigid thorns which cover it in its natural desert. Professor Henslow found that the spiny form of the rest harrow when grown in a rich soil with an abundance of water, gradually loses its spines. All these experiments certainly show that a dry desert sort of life and possibly strong sunlight favor the development of spines and thorns. Of this there cannot be any reasonable doubt, for the extraordinary quantity of thorny, spiny things in deserts shows that there must be some connection between such a life and their production. In such places, animals are always abundant, but these hollies, pears, and other plants show exactly the opposite to what we would expect. It is when the head of the young holly reaches sunlight and feels the wind that its leaves become harmless. If one remembers the case of the young larch and its goat enemies, it is perhaps possible to think that the lower branches and twigs were for untold generations exposed to laceration and biting. Thus, suffering from the loss of water by these regular annual wounds, the leaves develop their spines in response. So far, belief is not more difficult than it is with regard to the origin of any variety. But whenever, by reversion to their ancestral type, the original not spiny leaves developed on the top of a tree, that tree would have an advantage, for every leaf on it would be more economically produced. A smooth leaf would not require to spend food in order to make spines. Such trees, spiny below and smooth above, would be best fitted to survive healthier and more vigorous, and in the end would leave more descendants. At the same time, such a case as this reveals again that mysterious and exquisite purposefulness which a reverent mind discovers in nature everywhere. At the same time as we have already pointed out, we are exceedingly ignorant of many of the very commonest facts. Leo Herrera, the great Belgian botanist, whose recent death has been a terrible loss to science, collected together some facts as to the taste of cattle for various spiny and thorny plants. He found that cattle wished to eat the following, buckthorn, whin or gorse, raspberry, brambles, the scotch thistle, the creeping thistle, as well as musk, welted and slender thistles, sow thistle, and saltwort. They avoided barberry, the petty and german whin, rest harrow, the carline, and the other thistles not given above, as well as the common juniper. They disdained or despised sea holly, common holly, milk thistle, lactuca, and urtica urens. So far as the holly is concerned, it is certainly not despised by sheep and rabbits in this country. But how few are the plants investigated? Several of the commonest British plants are omitted just because no one has taken the trouble to watch them. 
Here, then, is an opportunity of discovering something new, fresh, and interesting, which should be well within the reach of anyone who passes his life in the country. End of chapter 14 Recording by Colleen McMahon Chapter 15 of The Romance of Plant Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Eliot. Chapter 15 On Nettles, Sensitive Plants, Etc. Stinging Nettles at Home and Abroad the use of the nettle, sham nettles, sensitive plants, mechanism, plants alive, under chloroform and ether, telegraph plant, wood sorrel, have plants nerves, electricity in the polar regions, plants under electric shocks, currents of electricity in plants, the singing of trees to the electromagnetic ear, Experiments. Electrocution of Vegetables. The common nettle is one of our most interesting British plants. It is exposed to great danger. One sees it growing not only in pastures and parks, but in waste places, along roadsides, and near cultivated ground. Yet it is very seldom either eaten or even touched. Cattle do occasionally eat the young shoots, but this is exceptional, for even in fields where there are plenty of cattle, great clumps of nettle luxuriate and increase in size every year. The stinging hairs are hollow and shaped rather like a narrow bulb or flask. The tip is slightly bent over and rounded, not sharp. The hairs contain formic acid. If one grasps the nettle or strokes it in a particular way from below upwards, the hairs are pressed flat against the stem or broken so that no wound is made by them in the skin and consequently they do no harm. But if the point of the hair pierces the skin, the well-known irritation is set up. That is because formic acid is poured into the wound. Besides the stinging hairs which keep off all the larger animals, including man, there are others, shorter and thickly set, which do not sting at all, but are intended to keep off snails. The pain produced by our common nettle is, however, a very trifling matter compared with that produced by some of the foreign species. One of the Indian kinds was used to excite and irritate bulls when they were intended to fight with tigers in the games which used to be held at some Indian courts. Another, found in Timor, is called the devil's leaf. The effect of its sting may last for twelve months and may even produce death. But a still more dangerous stinging plant is a handsome tree, Laportia moroides, found in Australia. It is often 120 to 140 feet high, and has fine dark green leaves, often one foot in length. The sting is so powerful that even horses are killed by touching its leaves. The sting of Jatropha urens is so strong that people become unconscious. In Java also, the sting of Urtica stimulans continues to smart for 24 hours and may produce a fever which is very difficult to shake off. Yet our common nettle is the favorite food plant of the caterpillars of the small tortoise shell, red admiral, peacock, camberwell beauty, and other butterflies. These caterpillars are possibly more intelligent than many of our country folk who do not know that the nettle is a very useful plant, as the following statements most clearly prove. Its young leaves make an excellent spinach, and it was, according to Sir Walter Scott, formerly cultivated in Scotland as a pot herb. Pigs, turkeys, geese, and fowls like the leaves when they are chopped up. It is said that the dried leaves and seeds will make hens lay in wintertime. The seeds under pressure yield quite a good oil. 
a yellow dye can be obtained by boiling the roots with alum. An excellent string can also be made from the inner bark of the stems, which has in fact been used to make twine and even clothing. The nettle is also valuable as an external stimulant in cases of paralysis. A plant with so many wonderful properties would not be so common as it is, or so little disturbed if it were not for its powerful stings. There are one or two plants which are extremely like the nettle at first sight. Lord Avebury has an illustration in his excellent little book in which it is most difficult to tell which are white dead nettles and which are stinging nettles. No doubt the harmless dead nettle is helped to escape injury by this resemblance. The hemp dead nettle and some campanulas are also very like it when growing. These also are sham nettles and may escape in the same way. There are several common greenhouse primulas which also produce irritation of the skin. When handled by gardeners, a painful smart is set up which lasts for some time. Primula abconica is the worst of these, but P. sinensis, P. cortusoides, and P. siboldi sometimes have the same effect. In all these cases, it is due to a peculiar secretion of certain glandular hairs. The methods of protection against grazing animals so far described, such as stinging hairs, thorns, spines, etc., are obvious enough, but perhaps the most ingenious system of defense is that exhibited by the sensitive plant and a few others. When man or any heavy animal is approaching certain Indian plants, their leaves suddenly drop and the leaflets close together. The mere shaking of the ground or of the air produces these extraordinary movements in the sensitive wood sorrel, Oxalis sensitiva, in two leguminous plants, Smithia sensitiva and Eschenomene indica, and in several mimosas. When one leaf tip of Mimosa pudica, the sensitive plant par excellence, is touched or injured, a series of changes begin. All the little leaflets shut up, one after the other. Then the secondary stalks drop. After this, the main stalk of the leaf suddenly droops downwards. After a short interval, the next leaf above goes through identically the same movements. If the shaking or injury is severe, every leaf from below upwards moves in the same way. One probable advantage of these movements can be understood from the behavior of flies, which alight upon the leaves and make them drop. The flies are startled and go away. Grazing animals will consider such behavior in a vegetable as very uncanny, and will probably go to some other less ingeniously protected plant. Of course, such extraordinary behavior has been a challenge to the botanical world, and there is an overwhelming mass of speculation and observations about the sensitive plant. It has been proved that the movements are caused by the thickened part at the base of the main stalk of the leaf. This is swollen and full of water, and much thicker than the stalk itself. It is by this thickened portion that the leaf is kept at its proper angle. When the tip of the leaf is shaken or injured, the cells on the underside of this swollen part allow their water to exude into the spaces between them, and in consequence down comes the leaf stalk. This is not by any means a full or even a sufficient explanation. There is certainly some peculiar sending of messages from the tip of the leaf to the swollen part itself. It is not safe to say that it is a nerve message, but the process resembles the way in which messages are sent by the nerves in animals. Not only so, but the contraction of the underside and a corresponding expansion on the upper side resembles the muscular movements of contraction and expansion in animals. It must always be remembered that plants are alive. Their living matter is not in any way, so far as we know, essentially different from that of animals or of man. Their living matter, protoplasm, in leaf stalks and leaves, is cut up into boxes or cells, 
each enclosed in a case or wall of its own. Yet, these are not entirely independent and unconnected, for thin living threads run from cell to cell, so that there is an uninterrupted chain of protoplasm all along the leaf, leaf stalk, and stem. In this particular case of the sensitive plant, the leaves at night regularly take up the position which they adopt when injured or shaken during the daytime. The easiest way to produce the shrinking of the leaves is, as has been mentioned, to hold a lighted match a little below the leaf tip. Severe shaking, a strong electric shock, or a railway journey will also produce closing of the leaves. Under chloroform or ether, or if the atmospheric pressure is suddenly diminished, the leaves will also fall. In some respects they are very lifelike, for if too often stimulated, they become fatigued and will not react unless a sufficient interval of rest is allowed them. The reaction occurs very soon if the plant is in good condition. In less than one second it begins, and the leaf stalk may fall in two to five seconds, but the recovery is very slow. Vivisection is a cruel sort of proceeding, although it may sometimes be necessary. The most curious vivisections have been performed on mimosa. When the leaflets are cut off, it is possible, on a stimulus being applied, to see water oozing out of the cut surface of the stalk. This would go to show that it is the water being discharged from the leaf base that produces the movement. There are, however, many points in the behavior of the sensitive plant which have not yet been explained. Possibly, the curious semaphore or telegraph plants, whose leaflets suddenly and without any obvious reason move with a jerk through an angle of several degrees, may also be protected from animals by this uncanny and unusual behavior. But though the sensitive plant is certainly protected from grazing animals by these movements, other advantages may be derived. Heavy rain, for instance, such as occurs in the tropics, will not injure its delicate leaves. Dust storms will not damage it, and at night there will be no loss of heat by radiation. The shrunk or folded condition of the leaflets will decrease any chance of injury by raindrops, for the rain will not fall on the broad surface of the leaflets. A nearly vertical leaf also will not suffer the loss of heat, which a horizontal one would endure. Besides the plants mentioned above, there are several others in which, by a rather severe shaking, the leaves can be made to fold up. This is the case with the common wood sorrel, Oxalis acetosella, with the false acacia, Robinia, and a few others. The former has a peculiarly delicate leaf. In cold, wet weather, its leaflets hang limp and numb from the leaf stalk all day. In fine weather, they are spread out horizontally. On a fine, sunny afternoon, its leaflets may sometimes take a midday sleep, for they hang loosely down in the same way that they do in cold, wet weather or at night. But in the wood sorrel, these movements are not for protection against grazing animals. There are other examples amongst plants of a distinct, sudden movement which begins whenever part of the plant is touched. The movements of tendrils have been already referred to. The Venus flytrap and the sundew will be mentioned when we are discussing insectivorous plants. There are also several flowers in which the stamens suddenly spring up when they are touched by an insect, barberry, centauria, and sparmania, and in mimulus the style flaps close when touched. All these cases seem to involve some sort of mechanism which replaces the nervous system of animals. No very definite laws have yet been discovered as to the way in which plants are affected by electricity, but enough is known to show that there are many interesting discoveries in prospect. Professor Lemstrom has made some interesting experiments in the polar regions, which go to show 
that the rich development of plant life in that desolate region may be connected with the peculiar electrical conditions of the polar atmosphere. The aurora borealis, which is a common phenomenon there, being also produced by those conditions. Several writers have claimed that slight electric shocks given at frequent intervals help the growth of plants and especially quicken the germination of seeds, but it can scarcely be said that this has been proved. When a branch or leaf stalk is wounded or injured by being tightly clamped in a vice, then it will be found that a current of electricity passes from the injured spot to the part that is untouched and then in the reverse direction. Changes of current are also produced when a leaf is suddenly exposed to light for a short time and then shaded. One of the most interesting observations is that made by Major Squires near Lauren Station in America, where the California Gas and Electric Corporation of San Francisco has a long-distance transmission telegraph line. The power is transmitted at a voltage of 56,000 with a frequency of 60 cycles per second, three phase. Major Squires, from previous experiments, thought that a note corresponding to this frequency might be heard in a telephone receiver. The following was the result. Quote, Upon connecting the telephone between two nails driven in any growing tree along the route of the line and at a reasonable distance therefrom, the telephone responded to this note with great clearness, and when the distance was not more than 100 feet, the sound was very loud. For this experiment, no microphone need be used, nor any source of electromotive force other than that induced in the tree itself, the telephone being connected directly between two nails driven into the tree. Several kinds of trees of various sizes and forms were examined along this power transmission line, and all were found to be singing with a loud voice the fundamental note characteristic of the line current. Indeed, the strip of vegetation along this line has thus been singing continuously, day and night, for several years, since the operation of the line began. It needed only the electromagnetic ear to make the sound apparent. The general appearance of vegetation along this route is certainly vigorous. End quote. An interesting little experiment was carried out by the author in Glasgow with the kind help of Professor Blythe at the Glasgow and West of Scotland Technical College. By attaching one wire to the upper part of the stem of a young pot plant, whilst the other wire was inserted in the base of the stem, it was easy to show that an electric current was passing, at any rate, during the daytime. In the evening, however, this was not at all distinct. That such currents do occur in living trees seems to be admitted. A similar current was not found in a stick of dead wood. The mere passage of the water through the plant in transpiration might, however, cause such a current, for the water is evaporated at the leaves. A strong electric shock may, of course, electrocute a plant by killing the cells. It is possible to cause the mimosa leaves to close by means of an electric shock. End of chapter 15 Recording by Linda Johnson Chapter 16 of The Romance of Plant Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Eliot Chapter 16 On Flowers of the Water The First Plant Seaweeds in Hot Baths Breaking of the Mirrors Gory dew, plants driven back to the water, marsh plants, fleur de lis, reeds and rushes, floating islands, water lilies, Victoria regia, plants 180 feet deep, life in a pond as seen by an inhabitant, fish farming, the useful diatom, willows and alders, polluted streams, 
the hornwort, the Florida hyacinth, reeds and grass reeds, the richest lands in the world, papyrus of Egypt, birds and hippopotami, fever and ague. What was the first green plant? When was the surface of the earth first covered with flowers? Such questions are quite impossible to answer. We cannot even tell how plants ever came to exist on earth at all. Wonderful as are the stories of the hardihood of bacteria, of spores, and of seeds, it is not possible to imagine that they could have been whirled or drifted through infinite space to this particular planet. Yet it is at least probable that the first real plant on this world was a seaweed or alga. In Germany and Austria there are certain springs in which the water coming from immense depths is at an exceedingly high temperature. These hot springs are used as natural hot baths and have many interesting peculiarities. Amongst others, there is the fact that certain seaweeds or algae are found luxuriating in the hot water. Some can even live in springs with a temperature of 176 degrees Fahrenheit. Such algae may have remained living in exceedingly hot water ever since that long distant time, the very first of all the geological periods, when there was no distinct separation betwixt land and water, and when the waters which were below the firmament had not been separated from those which were above it. Then the world seems to have been all fog and mist at a very high temperature. But all theories on the origin of the world might be briefly summarized by the last nine words. At any rate, the first plant was almost certainly a seaweed or alga, not unlike those which produce the so-called breaking of the mirrors. At some seasons the water of certain lakes, usually quite clear and pure, becomes discolored, turbid, and everywhere crowded with multitudes of tiny, bright, verdigris green specks. The fish at once begin to sulk, refuse to take the fly, and live torpid at the bottom of the water. The minute green particles consist of a certain seaweed or alga. Mr. Phillips put the head of a common pin in the water so as to obtain a very small drop. When placed under a microscope, this minute amount of water was found to contain 300 individual algae. This was in Newton Mere, Shropshire. And as this lake extends over 115 acres, it is possible to imagine the millions upon millions of algae which must have existed in it. The names of these seaweeds are many thousand times longer than the algae themselves, and it is not really necessary to give them. One of them, however, Aphanizomenon flosaque, has been noticed, quote, tinging with its delicate green hue the margin of the smallest of the Lochs Mabin in Dumfrieshire. Yet it is not so big as the dot on the eye in its name. Many other cases have been recorded of lakes that were colored sometimes a, quote, pea green, or even brown or red by similar tiny little seaweeds. As we shall see, the water of such lakes generally contains a very large amount of suspended or floating vegetable life. Another curious appearance is the gory dew. Patches of a deep blood red or purple color are found on the ground or on walls. They have just the appearance of recently shed blood. This also is due to an alga, Porphyridium cruentum. Dr. Cook quotes from Drayton as follows, quote, In the past, near Hastings, where the Norman William, after his victory count King Harold slain, he built Battle Abbey, which at last, as diverse others' monasteries, grew to a town enough populous. Thereabout is a place which, after rain, always looks red, which some have attributed to a very bloody sweat of the earth, as crying to heaven for vengeance of so great a slaughter. The ordinary rain of blood, which appears on not too fresh meat, and looks like minute specks of red currant jelly, is due to one of the bacteria, Micrococcus prodigiosus. The original algae or seaweeds probably had descendants which migrated to the land and eventually, after many geological periods, became our flowering plants and ferns. 
But the earth has become so richly supplied with plants of all sorts and kinds that it is now by no means easy for any plant to find a root hold for its existence. So that a considerable number have been forced back to the water and have accustomed themselves to live in or even under water in company with their lowly cousins, the seaweeds, who remained below its surface. These water plants are very interesting. They are always competing with one another. There is a perpetual struggle going on round every pond and loch and by every riverside. If you look carefully round the edge of a loch or pond which lies in a grass field, certain series of plants are generally found to follow one another in quite a definitive way. The first sign of water in grass is generally the presence of moss or, quote, fog, end quote, between the grass stems and the appearance of what farmers call the, quote, blue carnation grass, end quote. It is not a grass, but a sedge, Carex glauca or Carex panacea, with leaves rather like those of a carnation. A little nearer the border of the pond, there may be a tall, coarse grass, Aera chiespitosa or Festuca elatior. Next, there is almost certain to be a fringe of rushes. Where the rushes begin to find the ground too wet for them, all sorts of marsh plants flourish, such as water plantain, cuckoo flower, the spearwort buttercup, woundwort, and the like. As soon as the actual water begins, one finds, whilst it is still shallow, the flag series of yellow or purple irises, bog beans, marsh sanquefoil, mare's tail, and sedges of various kinds. In this part, the water ranges from an inch or two to about 18 inches deep. The flag or iris is a very common and yet interesting plant. It has a stout, fleshy stem lying flat on the mud and anchored to it by hundreds of little roots. The flower is the original of the fleur de lis, or lily of France, which took the fancy of the king of France as he rode through the marshes toward Paris. It is true that there are some unromantic authors who hold that the emblem was really intended to represent a frog or toad. The flower consists of three upright petals and three hollow sepals, which make so many canals leading down to the honey, and roofed over by an arched and colored style. As the bee hurries down the canal to its nectar, its back is first brushed by a narrow lip-like stigma, and then dusted with pollen. The leaves overlap in a curious way, and, when they have withered, their stringy remains serve to protect the fleshy stem. Oris root, which is used in perfumery, is the stem of the Iris florentina. Most of the other plants in this flag series will be found to have prostrate main stems growing under the water, but giving off flowering and foliage stems which stand up above it, so that the leaves and flowers are above the surface. In the next part of the pond, where the water is from 18 inches to 9 feet deep, masses of reeds will be found, usually swaying, sighing, and whispering in the wind. There are many kinds, such as bulrushes, phragmites, horsetail, scirpus, etc. It seems to be the depth, the exposure to wind, the character of the soil, and other unknown factors that determine which of those will be present. All of them are tall, standing well above the water. Their main stem is usually flat on the bottom of the pond or floating horizontally in the water, but giving off many upright branches. Floating islands are often formed by some of these horizontal main stems breaking off and being carried away. Those Chinese who possess no land make floating islands of such reeds for themselves and grow crops on them. There are hundreds of such islands in the Canton River. Beyond the reeds, one sees the large, flat, floating leaves and beautiful cup-like white or yellow flowers of the water lilies. They grow in water which is not more than 15 feet deep. Their long stalks and leaf stalks are flexible and yield readily so as to keep the flowers and leaves floating. There are narrow, submerged leaves as well. The actual stem of the white water lily is about three inches in diameter and stout and fleshy. It is full of starchy material and lies upon the mud deep down at the bottom of the pool. 
there are many advantages in the position of the flowers, for bees, flies, and other useful insects can reach them easily, but slugs, snails, and other enemies cannot do so. The little seeds have a curious life belt like cup, which enables them to float on the surface. Of course, our own British water lilies cannot compare to the magnificent Victoria regia of the tropics. Its petals are white or pink on the inside, and its gigantic leaves, six feet or more in diameter, can support a retriever dog or a child. There used to be some of them at Kew Gardens. A curious point about these enormous floating leaves is that they are covered with little spiny points on the underside and at the margin. That is probably to keep some sort of fish from nibbling at the edges. But to return to our pond, beyond the water lily region, and so long as the water is from 12 to 24 feet deep, pond weeds are able to grow, and their leaves may be seen in the water, whilst their stalks stand up above the surface, so as to allow wind to scatter the pollen. This depth of 24 feet seems at first sight very great, but it is a mere nothing compared with the regions entirely below the water, where certain stoneworts, chara, and mosses have been found flourishing. The former has been dredged up from the depths of 90 feet, and a little moss was discovered in the Lake of Geneva growing quite comfortably at a depth of 180 feet below the surface. But it is quite impossible to appreciate the wonder and beauty of the life in a pond, unless by a strong effort of the imagination. Suppose yourself to be a fish, two or three inches long, and accustomed to the dim, mysterious light which filters down through the water from the sky above. Every here and there great olive-brown leaf stalks and stems cross, and branching intercept the light. Everything, the surface of the mud, the stems and branches of the submerged water plants, is covered by an exquisite golden-brown powder which consists of hundreds and thousands of diatoms. Here and there from the pondweed and other stems hang festoons or wreaths or threads of beautiful green algae. Little branching sprays of them, or perhaps of the brown kind, are attached here and there to the thick stems. Even the very water is full of small, floating, vivid green stars or crescents or three-cornered pieces which are free-floating algae or desmids. Other diatoms are also free or swim with a corkscrewing motion through the water. Great snails and slugs crawl upon the plants, and weird, large-eyed creatures, with a superfluity of legs and an entire absence of reserve as to what is going on inside their bodies, skirmish around. So that such a pond is full of vegetable activity. The free-swimming diatoms and desmids make up the food of the snails and crustaceans. These latter, in turn, are the food of fishes. It is even possible today, by carefully stocking an artificial pond with water plants, by then introducing mollusca and crustacea, and finally by the introduction of eyed ova, or fry of the trout, carp, and other fishes, to produce a regular population of fishes which can be made more or less profitable, and the process can be spoken of as fish farming. Unfortunately, there are a great many gaps in our knowledge as to what fish actually feed on, and we know even less about what the mollusca and crustacea require. There is, however, a distinct annual harvest of these minute seaweeds, of which different sorts appear to develop one after the other, just as flowering plants do. The two months, January and February, which are almost without flowers, are also those in which most of these minute vegetables take their repose in the form of cysts or spores. But these diatoms are too important and too interesting to be dismissed in such a cursory manner. Each consists of a tiny speck of living matter, with a drop or two of oil enclosed in a variously sculptured, flinty shell. They have, in fact, been compared to little protected cruisers which pass to and fro in the water and multiply with the most extraordinary rapidity. If you, one, use dynamite to blast a rock, 
two, if you employ a microscope or telescope, three, if you paint an oil picture, four, if you make a soundproof partition in a set of offices, the probability is that it has been necessary to use the substance diatomite in each case. This consists of the accumulated shells of myriads of diatoms. Nor does that represent by any means the whole of the usefulness of these tiny seaweeds. The oil shales, such as occur in Linlithgowshire and elsewhere, are supposed to be the muddy, oily deposits of such ponds as we have endeavored to describe. The oil found in the shales was probably worked up by these diatoms in long past geological ages. It may be used today either 1. to drive motors, 2. to light lamps, 3. to burn as so-called, quote, wax, end quote, candles, 4. to eat as an inferior sort of chocolate cream. Interesting as these diatoms are, it is not really possible to understand their structure without the use of a microscope, so that we must pass on to another side of the activity of water plants. Let us, for instance, notice some of the ordinary plants to be found along a riverside. Willows and alders are the ordinary trees because they are specially fitted to stand the danger of being regularly overflowed. They easily take root, so that branches broken off and floated down are enabled to form new trees without much difficulty. In the United States, it has become a custom to plant willows along the banks, because they are then not so liable to be broken down and worn away. Yet, when a big willow tree has become undermined, the weight of the trunk may cause it to fall over toward the water, so that a large section of the bank may be loosened, and serious damage may be done if it is torn away by a heavy flood. Amongst such willows should be mentioned the cricket bat kind, which has to be grown with the greatest care, and of which a single tree may be worth 28 pounds. Many of our rivers are, alas, sadly polluted by artificial and other impurities, which kill the fishes and destroy the natural vegetation. When this happens, a horrible-looking whitish fungus, Apodites lactea, coats the stones and banks under water, and the water swarms with bacteria. This fungus and the bacteria are really purifying the water, for they break up the decaying matter in it. The oily or slimy character of the outside skin of all submerged plants is of very great importance to them. It allows the water to glide or slip over them without any friction. Still keeping to our river bank, let us look for submerged plants. What is that dark green feathery plume? It is the hornwort, Ceratophyllum, gently wriggling or moving from side to side. It has probably never been still for a moment since it first began to grow. Take it out of the water and it collapses into a moist, unpleasant little body. But as soon as it is put back in its natural element again, it is seen to have a thin, flexible stem along which there are circles of curved, finely divided leaves. Watch it in the water, and one is filled with astonishment at the perfection of the shape, arrangement, and character of the leaves, which enables them to hold their place even when a flood may cover them with an extra twenty feet of water. The same sort of leaf, but with great difference in detail, is found in the submerged water crowfoot, water milfoil, potamogatons, and others which live under the same conditions. If it were the St. John's River, we might see that extraordinary Florida hyacinth which has swollen, gouty-looking leaf stalks and grows with such extraordinary rapidity that it covers the whole surface of rivers, choking the paddle wheels of steamers and destroying the trade in timber, for no logs can be floated down when it covers the water. Its rosettes float on the surface and are very interesting to examine. If you upset one or turn it upside down in the water, the buoys, or swollen stalks, act as a self-writing arrangement, and it slowly returns to its proper position. But in most rivers, one is certain to come across backwaters where it is impossible to force a boat through on account of the reeds and other marsh plants. 
There are places on the Danube where hundreds of square miles are occupied by waving masses of feathery-plumed phragmites, almost to the exclusion of any other sort of vegetation. Giant specimens of it 18 feet high have been observed. The same reed occurs in North and South America, and far up toward the Arctic regions. At first sight, it seems as if this was a mistake of nature. Why should so much of the surface be occupied by this useless vegetable? But it is necessary to say a little more about its habits and its object in life. The most interesting and curious point is the way in which it grows in dense thickets. The main stem is really horizontal and below the water, but it gives off a number of upright stalks. Now every flood will carry in amongst the stalks quantities of silt and rubbish. Those upright stems will sift the water. All sorts of floating material, sand, silt, dead leaves, fruit, etc., are left amongst them. So that such a marsh or bed of phragmites is gradually, flood by flood, collecting the deposits of mud, and the bed becomes every year more shallow. At the edge of the marsh, there is scarcely any water visible, and grasses and other plants are beginning to grow between the phragmite stems. Eventually, these latter are choked out, and a marshy alluvial flat occupies the side of the old reed bed. So that the work of phragmites is of the greatest possible importance. It has to form those fertile, alluvial flats which are found along the course of every great river, and which are by far the most valuable lands in the whole world. Look, for instance, at the populations of Belgium, Holland, and Lower Germany, and notice how dense it is upon the alluvial flats where the Meuse, Rhine, and other rivers approach the sea. It is just the same in Britain. London lies on the great alluvial flats of the Thames, Glasgow on the Clyde, Liverpool on the Mersey. In China, it is the yangtze Kiang Valley, especially near its mouth. In India, the Ganges, of Lower Bengal, and in the Argentine, the Lower Plata River, which show the greatest accumulations of humanity. In every case, it is the rich, flat alluvium, which is exceedingly fertile when drained and cultivated, that has originally attracted so many people. Lower Egypt is the gift of the Nile, but it is not so much the Nile as these neglected water plants which made the rich lucerne, cotton, and food crops of Lower Egypt possible. Amongst the Egyptian reeds, one especially is of great importance. The papyrus antiquorum, ten feet high, has much the same habit as our phragmites and other water plants. It forms dense, almost impassable thickets, sometimes completely occupying and choking a small valley, or leaving only a passage, often changing and half-choked through a larger one. This, with other plants, makes the sud of the Nile, which is one enormous accumulation of marsh plants and reeds floating on the water and covering a length of over 500 miles. It was from the papyrus that the ancient Egyptians made their paper. The stems are six to seven inches in diameter. Quote, the pith of the larger flowering stems cut into thin strips, united together by narrowly overlapping margins, and then crossed under pressure by a similar arrangement of strips at right angles, constitutes the papyrus of antiquity." End quote. These great marshes and reed beds are full of interest to naturalists. The fens of Lincolnshire and the Norfolk Broads show the way in which water plants keep hold of the worn and traveled rubbish of the hills, and prevent most of it from becoming useless, barren sea sands. These places, however, like the soot of the Nile and the Roman Campania, have an evil reputation so far as climate is concerned. This used to be the case even in Lower Chelsea in London, where snipe were shot not so very long ago. It is as if nature had desired to do her own work in peace and without being disturbed, for fever, ague, mosquitoes, and malaria are very common. Yet, a certain number of people always live in such places. In France, exempli gratia, the leeches in the great marshes near the Lande form a source of riches. 
Such reeds also are, or were, the home of the hippopotamus, crocodile, and other extraordinary animals. The extinct British hippopotamus, no doubt found in the Chelsea or other marshes, a home as congenial to its tastes as is the Sud of Egypt to its living descendants or allies. In other places, the enormous quantities of water birds, myriads of ducks, geese, swans, regiments of flamingos, snipe, and the like, have called into existence peculiar kinds of industry in fowling and netting that are not without importance. The decoys in the fens yield hundreds of birds for the London market, and the duck punts with their huge guns also bring in quantities of wild fowl. But all this industry is very trifling compared with that of Phragmites and its associates, who have strained from the water of the Thames most of the ground on which London now stands. End of chapter 16. Recording by Tom Geller. Rotterdam, the Netherlands, T-O-M-G-E-L-L-E-R dot com. Chapter 17 of The Romance of Plant Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scheib. The Romance of Plant Life by George Francis Scott Eliot. Chapter 17. On Grasslands. Where is peace? Troubles of the grass. Roadsides. Glaciers in Switzerland. Strength and gracefulness of grasses. Rainstorms. Dangers of drought and of swamping. Artificial fields. Farmers' abstruse calculations. Grass mixtures. Tennis lawns. The invasion of forest. Natural grass. Prairie of the United States. Red Indian cowboy. Pampas and gaucho. Thistles and tall stories, South Africa and Boers, hunting of the Tartars, an unfortunate Chinese princess, Australian shepherds. Where should one seek for peace on earth? The ideal chosen for one well-known picture is a grassy down, close-clipped by nibbling sheep, such as the fresh green turf of the South Downs. Others might prefer the Constable country, near perhaps the famous Valley Farm, of which the picture now hangs in the National Gallery, and especially in early spring. At any rate, once seen, one remembers forever afterwards those glossy-coated, well-fed, leisurely cows grazing hock-deep in rich meadows full of bright flowers and graceful grasses, through which there winds a very lazy river bordered on the trim pollard willows. The charm of the South Downs and of Constable's Meadow depends upon their peaceful quiet in the absence of any sign of the handiwork of disturbing man. But such meadows are entirely artificial. They could no more exist in nature than a coal mine if it were not for man's help. Moreover, they are in a state of perpetual war. No plant within them experiences the blessings of peace from the time that it germinates until the time that it dies. Each plant is fighting with its neighbors for light, for air, for water, and for salts in the soil, and it is also trying to protect itself against grazing animals, against the vole which gnaws its root, and against the insects and caterpillars which try to devour its buds. Besides its own private and individual troubles, it is but one of a whole company or army of plants which, like a cooperative society, occupy the field. Other societies, such as peat moss, thickets, and woods, try to drive out the grasses and cover that particular place in its stead. The grassland companions are also trying to take up new ground and to cover over any which is not strongly held by other plants. A road, for instance, is always being attacked by the grassland near it. It is sure to have a distinct border of rat's tail plantain, dandelion, creeping buttercup, and yellow clovers. These are the advanced guard of the grassland. However heavily you tread upon these plants, you will do them no injury whatever, for they are specially designed to resist heavy weights. But, if the road were only left alone, these bordering plants would be very soon choked out. The ordinary buttercup would replace the creeping species, and white or red clovers take the place of the little yellow ones, whilst grasses would very soon spring up all over it. But of course the roadman comes and scrapes off all the new growth of colonizing grasses, etc. Then the plantain, dandelions, and yellow clovers patiently begin their work again. In Switzerland, in those valleys in which the glaciers are melting away, leaving stretches of bare mud, scratched stone, and polished rocks, plants immediately begin to settle there. A Swiss botanist watched the process during five or six years, 
and described how the first yellow saxifrage, S. azoids, establishes itself. Next season, coltsfoot, willow herb, oxyria, and two grasses had planted themselves. During the third season, another grass came in. By the fourth season, fescues and yarrow had appeared, and by the fifth season, five grasses, clovers, and yarrow had formed a regular grassland upon the new untouched soil. In such cases, nature, who abhors bare ground, is endeavoring to clothe it with useful vegetation. The fights which are going on are of the most ruthless character. Many weeds are said to produce some 30,000 seeds in one year, and every plant which grows in a meadow is scattering thousands of seeds. But of course, the number of plants remains much the same, so that 29,999 seeds are wasted, or the seedlings choked out, for every one that grows up. It is probably because of this perpetual warfare that the growth of the grasses is so vigorous, and their whole structure so perfectly adapted. If you watch a flowering grass, you are sure to notice how narrow is its stem compared with the height. A factory chimney only 58 feet high requires to be at least 4 feet broad at the base. Yet a rye plant 1,500 millimeters high may be only 3 millimeters broad near the root. Man's handiwork, the chimney, is in height 17 times its diameter, but the height of the grass is 500 times its diameter. The neatness of design, the graceful curves, and perfect balance in the little flowering branches at the top of the home is always worth looking at and particularly in the early morning when it is beset with sparkling drops of dew. It is all wiry, bending and swaying to the wind so as to produce those waves which roll across a hayfield, and on which the shimmering light is reflected and changes color. The fight for light and air, the struggle to get their heads up above their competitors, produces all this exquisite mechanism. It is true that a heavy rainstorm may beat the stems flat down to the ground, but as soon as the weather becomes dry again, these same stems will raise themselves up and become upright. They have a special sensitiveness and a special kind of growth which enables them to do this. There are two special dangers which all such artificial meadows have to withstand. Let us see what will happen if such a meadow begins to dry up through a sinking of the level of the water below the soil. Each grass has its own special favorite amount of moisture. It likes to have its water at just one particular depth below the surface. Unfortunately, there are not nearly enough sympathetic and careful observations of the preferences of each individual grass. A Danish author has worked out the facts in certain localities. Geest. Suppose first that the water level of the wells, etc., is six and a half to nine and three quarters feet below the surface. This suits the meadow poa grass, poa pretensis, exactly. It will grow luxuriantly and flourish. Now suppose the weather is very wet so that the water rises in the wells till they are three to four feet deep. The roughish poa, P. trivialis, prefers this moister soil, and it will grow so vigorously that it will kill out the other kind. If it is a season of very heavy floods, or if the drains become choked so that the water rises to within 14 to 25 inches of the surface, then the tufted era, this Champsia K. spatosa, will kill out the other kinds and flourish abundantly. But if the water rises higher than this, the marsh series comes in. See chapter 16. So that the thirsty grasses of the meadow are helped or hindered in their fight for life by changes in the water away down in the soil below their roots. Even in Great Britain, one can see distinct differences in very dry and very wet summers. But all these pastures, meadowlands, and hayfields are, as we have already mentioned, as much due to man's forethought and industry as a factory or coal mine. It is very difficult to realize this. The best way is to go to the National or any other good picture gallery and look carefully at any landscape painted before the year 1805. You will scarcely believe that the country as painted can be the land we know. Where is the awful orderliness of England? Where are the trim hedges? Where are the tidy roadsides and beautifully embanked rivers that we see today? As a matter of fact, until the great Macadam made good roads and the great Telford and other engineers built stone bridges, it was impossible to rely on getting about with carts and carriages. Gentlemen's coaches and wagons used to be literally stuck in the mud. Horses were drowned at fords or died in their struggles to pull very light loads through mud which nearly reached the axles of the wheels. See chapter 11. Besides the change due to roads, fences, drains, and farm buildings, the very grasses themselves are growing unnaturally. The farmer has selected and sown what he thinks best. He is obliged to do so, because grasses vary so much. Some of them shoot up quickly and die after the first year. 
Others live for two years, whilst a great many bide their time, developing very slowly and not reaching their full growth until the fourth or fifth year. Some are tall and vigorous, others are short. Some flower early in the season, and others very late. Many send out quantities of suckers, or runners, at the base, so that they form a dense, intricate turf, a mass of stems and roots thickly covering the ground. A farmer wants his pasture to begin early and to continue late. He must have a good first year's crop, and it must remain good for years afterwards, so that his calculations as regards the proportions of the different grass seeds which he requires are of the most abstruse character. To sow such permanent pasture, prepared by blending together grasses and clovers with an eye to all the above necessities, there will be needed some seven million seeds for every acre. The art consists in coaxing the good, lasting, nutritious ones to make both tall hay, rich aftermath, and a close, thick turf below, and, until these are ready, to use the annual and biennial grasses. Such beautifully shaven, green, soft turf as one sees in the lawns of cathedrals, or the quads, at Oxford and Cambridge, has been most carefully and regularly watered, rolled, and mown for hundreds of years. It is not easy to keep even a tennis lawn in good condition. Little tufts of daisies appear. Their leaves lie so flat that they escape the teeth of the mower, and they are not so liable to be injured by tennis shoes as the tiny upright grass shoots that are trying to spring up everywhere. The plantain is even worse, for it is specially built to stand heavy weights, and it has several roots which divide and branch like the prongs which fix teeth in the jaw, so that it is very difficult to hawk it out. Thus our grasslands in Britain are unnatural and artificial productions. If the field drains are choked, moss or fog and rushes appear. Still more interesting, however, is what happens if the farmer is not careful to destroy the taller weeds, such as dock, ragweed, cow parsnip, thistles, and the like. If you walk over a grass field in the early spring, you are sure to see some of these pests. At this stage they have a very humble, weak, and innocent appearance. They are quite small rosettes or tufts. Yet they are crowded with leaves, which are hard at work, busily manufacturing food material. Soon they begin to shoot up. Their leaves overreach all the neighboring grasses. Their roots spread in every direction, taking what ought to go to the good green herb intended for the service of a man. They finally accomplish their wickedness by producing thousands of seeds, which are scattered broadcast over the fields. By this time the farmer sees what is going on, and endeavors to cut them down, but it is a long, slow, and laborious proceeding. One year seeding means seven years weeding. Yet these tall thistles and ragweeds are only the first stage of a very interesting invasion. Look around the field corners, on railway banks, or in old quarries, where man has left things alone. You will see these same tall herbs, the ragweed, etc., but you are sure to find a place where they are being suppressed by rasps, briars, and brambles. These are taller, stronger, and more vigorous than the herbs, and they also last longer, for their leaves are still at work in November. This is the second stage of the invasion, but if the place has been long neglected, hawthorns and rowans, birch and ash will be found growing up. These last show what is happening. A wood is trying to grow up on the grassland. If left alone, an oak or beech forest would, after many years, spread over all our grass pastures and hayfields. These tall herbs are the pioneers, and the briars and brambles are its advanced guard. As a matter of fact, by far the greatest part of our agricultural land was a forest, but it has been cut down, drained, dug, weeded, hedged, and huzzed and mazed, with agricultural implements, and more or less scientifically selected manures, until it is made to yield good beef, excellent mutton, and almost the largest crops per acre in the world. Natural grasslands exist, however, in every continent. The great steppes of southern Russia, and the pastures that extend far to the eastward, even to the very borders of China, the prairies of North America, the pampas of Argentina, the great sheep farms of Australia, and a large proportion of South Africa, consist of wide, treeless, grassy plains, where forests only occur along the banks of rivers, in narrow hill valleys, or upon mountains of considerable altitude. Upon these great plateaux, or undulating hills, the rainfall, though it is but small in amount, is equally distributed, so that there is no lengthy and arid dry season. Take the American prairie, for instance. These valuable lands, once the home of unnumbered bison and hordes of antelope, 
lie between the ancient forests of the eastern states and the half-deserts and true salt deserts of the extreme west. Rivers, accompanied in their windings by riverside forests, are found especially in the east. The real prairie has a blackish, loamy soil, covered sometimes by the rich buffalo or mesquite grass, which forms a short, velvety covering, not exactly a turf such as we find in England, but still true grassland. It is only green in early spring. From the first spring onward until the end of summer, there is an endless succession of flowers. The first spring blossoms appear in April. Great stretches are covered with penstemons, cerapediums, and many others in May and June. Then follow tall, herbaceous phloxes, lilies, and asclepiads. But perhaps the most characteristic flora blossoms still later on, when everyone wants to be in Kansas, when the sunflowers bloom. Over these prairies used to travel the great wagons, or prairie schooners. The cowboy, who almost lives on horseback, watches over great herds of cattle and troops of half-wild horses. Yet his life is, or used to be, almost as free, comfortless, and uncivilized as that of the buffalo-hunting Indian who preceded him. One must not forget to mention the prairie dog, able to utilize the abundant grass, and diving into a safe refuge underground when threatened by the wolves or other carnivorous creatures, which, of course, multiplied exceedingly, thanks to the jack hare, antelopes, and bison. The pampas in South America is a similar grassland. On the east it stops at the woodland along the Great Plate River, but on the west it becomes gradually more dry and arid, until long before the Andes are reached it is too dry even to carry sheep, and can only be described as half-desert. Quote, It is a boundless sea of grasses, fading into the distant horizon, which can only be distinguished when the sun is rising or setting. Unquote. Yet amongst the grasses are hundreds of flowers, and, a fact which is very remarkable, many of them, such as fennel, artichoke, milk thistle, burdock, rye grass, etc., are European plants which have dispossessed the natives over miles of country, exactly as the gaucho has driven away or exterminated the Indians who live there. It is covered by tufts of grass betwixt which appear the rich alluvial earth, yet in good years it may become almost a perfect grass floor. Quote, the color changes greatly. For in spring, when the old grass is burnt off, it is coal-black, which changes to a bright blue-green as soon as the young leaves appear. Later on it becomes brownish-green, which again changes when the silver-white flowers come out to the appearance of a rolling, waving sea of shining silver." Unquote. Here would be the place to mention how an army, encamped upon the pompous, finds itself next morning imprisoned and doomed to perish miserably in a forest of giant thistles, which has sprung up during the night. There is no doubt that thistles and other weeds are very tall in both South and North America. Fennels are 10 to 12 feet high, and even little chenopodiums, such as in England may reach 18 inches, become in South America 7 to 8 feet high. But the tallness of some of the stories is more remarkable even than that of the plants. Over the pampas used to roam thousands of guanacos, a creature of the most unlovely type, which resembles both a camel, a mule, a deer, and a horse. Here also were Darwin's ostriches, Rea Darwini, and other game, which were caught by the lasso and by the peculiar bolas of the Indian. They used to surround the herds and then massacre them by hundreds. The tuco tuco, also, which is a burrowing rodent with habits very like those of a prairie dog, finds plenty of sustenance in the abundant grasses. Upon them subsist pumas, foxes, and other carnivores. We have said that the pampas gradually changes from being very fertile on the east to being almost a desert on the west. Here is the place to mention a very interesting, if not romantic, fact. The guanaco does not travel hundreds of miles in order to die in one particular spot as soon as it feels ill, but it does resort especially to certain spots. There the grass is often a bright, fresh green, for it is plentifully manured, and consequently the guanaco helps to encourage the good grasses to occupy a half-desert. On the eastern side of the pampas, great changes are beginning to appear. The owners of the great camps, haciendas or cattle ranches, let off small parts of their land to Italian colonists. These people grow crops of Indian corn, and when that has been reaped, the valuable alfalfa or lucerne is sown down. This forms the most exquisite and valuable pasture, and consequently, far more shorthorn and durham cattle can be maintained. 
There are in South Africa enormous grassy plains where one springbok and other game used to exist in enormous herds. Wangman records having seen a herd of antelope four miles long. In spite of lions and other beasts of prey, and in spite also of the boer, who was as much a horseman as the gaucho, or red Indian, the great buck wagons of South Africa were almost as much the real homes of the boers as the two-roomed huts which make up his farms. The great steppes of Russia and Siberia are also grasslands. Quote, As seen from a distance, hills covered by the stippa grass resemble sand hills, but, when nearer at hand, the sand-gray color changes into a silvery white, and these ever-moving grasses remind one of the waves of the ocean, and, in spite of their monotony, leaves a pleasant impression. Unquote. Tulips, hyacinths, veronicas, periwinkles, scotch thistles, euphorbias, wormwoods, and other of our common plants, or their near cousins, make up most of the flora of the steppes. Yet there are hundreds of others, for it is vegetation very rich in species. If one reads in Gibbon's stately language of the mode of life of the Huns, the Scythians, and those other barbarians who, originating in these huge grasslands, occasionally overflowed and overwhelmed the civilization of declining Rome, the resemblance to Red Indians, Pampas Indians, Cowboys, Gauchos, and Boers is not a little striking. Read, for instance, the magnificent account of the great hunting matches of the Tartar princes. Quote, a circle is drawn of many miles in circumference to encompass the game of an extensive district, and the troops that form the circle regularly advance towards a common center, where the animals, surrounded on every side, are abandoned to the darts of the hunters. Unquote. Both the Red Indians of the prairie and the savages of the Pampas used to surround and destroy the game in exactly the same way. The unfortunate Chinese princess, given over for political advantages to a prince of the Huns, Quote, laments that she had been condemned by her parents to a distant exile, under a barbarian husband, and complains that sour milk was her only drink, raw flesh her only food, a tent her only palace. Unquote. This describes exactly the ordinary life and home of the Huns. Quote, the Scythians of every age have been celebrated as bold and skillful riders, and constant practice has seated them so firmly on horseback that they were supposed by strangers to perform the ordinary duties of civil life, to eat, to drink, and even to sleep, without dismounting from their steeds." Unquote. Red Indians of Pampas and Prairie, cowboys and gaucho, lived exactly in the same way. In those pages of Gibbon which treat of the Huns, Scythians and other hordes, one recognizes sometimes the wagon of the Boers, sometimes a migration of the East African Maasai, then perhaps it is a weapon that is really the lasso, or a disposition and character exactly paralleled by the crows and blackfeet. Even the great grass plains of Australia, where the kangaroo, the wallaby, and the dingo have been replaced by the sheep and the whaler horse, one finds in the shepherd and squatter traits that remind one of the gaucho or the cowboy. Nor is this in the least extraordinary, for when a scanty rainfall produces those great limitless rolling seas of grass, Nature provides first large herbivorous animals to eat it down, as well as carnivorous beasts to keep their numbers in control, until such time as a race of horsemen appears, whose domestic cattle replace the bisons, guanacos, kangaroos, and antelopes, and so assist in replenishing and subduing the earth. End of chapter 17 Recording by Scheibe